Why, hello there, everybody. This is episode 135 of the Warhammer 40,000 podcast that goes by the identity of Look Out, Sir. My name's Dan. It's that bit at the beginning of the show where I do this normal patter, and as is customary, I'm sure you know already, I go about saying, Hello, Phil. How art thou? Hello, Dan, and hello to the lookers listening at home. I hope you're doing well as well. Those beautiful lookers. We the losers, you the lookers. That's how this whole dynamic works from here on in. Uh, I think that was very well established in whatever the heck the last episode was. That was a uh, a mad dash to the finish. Yes, a bit of a mishmash, but I, I'm now back. I will be here for the whole episode and I won't have <laughs> some usurpers trying to steal my place on the podcast. That's it. That's it. Ben with his terrible audio, Joe with technical difficulties that meant that we weren't able to actually record the whole thing. Um, yeah, it was awful. Terrible project. I know I <laughs> wax lyrical about it um, in the uh, in the outro and during the Joe segment, but this new variant of this software, I'm giving it another chance for this episode, but if it angers me, I, I might I might throw my PC out the window. Not that that will resolve the issue with software that predominantly exists within the ether of the internet, but, um, you know, I might feel a little better about things. That's fair enough. I've also tried hard to try and see if I can resolve some of the microphone issues that people have been reporting. People have asked me whether I got a new microphone. I do have a new microphone, and clearly I hadn't learned how to use it, so hopefully the audio quality is notably improved uh, in this episode. I decided that I needed the same mic that Phil has so as me and Phil could sound similar. The only difference is, is that Phil naturally is seemingly able to create beautiful, crisp audio with consistent cadence and uh, volume control, whereas I seemingly move my head around like a crazy person and can't stand still or sit still well, and thus create yeah, an I, awful load of rubbish. I think it's also you're just much louder as well. It's probably... You know, the mic can't handle your loudness, Dan. I think that's what That is, is true. Well, I've adjusted the gain. I've taken steps to try and uh, make it as, you know, as, as as workable as possible, I suppose. So hopefully uh, hopefully that's on point. But uh, I'll tell you one thing that might not be on point, or by all accounts is pointy, the topic of today's episode. Did you like that transition? Ooh, it sort of worked. Yes, it is indeed going to be pointy because it's only taken probably two to three episodes, but we've we've finally done it. Cantor Blue, one of our favourite fans who will be listening along, will be glad that we're talking about his favourite two wound marines, the Chaos Space Marines. We are finally delving, braving the Codex. So that is the main topic. And because it's a Codex episode, there probably won't be much time to talk about anything else. We're squeezing an outro if we can. Um, oh, we'll definitely do an outro, mate. Um, but yeah, majoritively, I assume we're just going to talk about Codex Chaos Space Marines. It's pretty big, and I've still not read it. Um, so that's going to be interesting. I saw some people talking about it a while ago. Joe's mentioned some things. He likes it. Um, I hear Abaddon is good. Abaddon, mm. Abaddon, Abaddon. How do we pronounce Abaddon? It was that, isn't it? it, it yeah, it's, it's Abaddon or Abaddon. I think it's Abaddon. Abaddon. Yeah, yeah. Could be either. Potato, potato. Take your pick. Potato, potato. Five star review. Hang on a second. What is this? Turn. Some kind of review? Turn. A five star review? Turn. Well, let's get into the nitty-gritty of this Warhammer five-star review. What do you reckon then, Phil? Where has this five-star review come from this time? Uh, I think we're going to do an Apple podcast of America. I mean, you're very close, Phil. It is Apple Podcasts, but it is not of the Americas on this occasion. It is the Great Britons, the world in which we herald from, Phil. Exactly. I'm a born and bred Londoner, I'll have you know. A born and bred Londoner. My goodness. Bread bread and buttered, even. Bread and buttered. That's how how much of a Londoner I am. Smothered in jelly deals. (sighs) No. 
I just couldn't do that. I'm not that much of a Londoner. It only goes so far. My problem is, I suppose, is that I'm not a born and bred Londoner. Londoner. I just happen to be there. Um, you know, that's that's kind of so, how it's worked. So you've got to have the eels forced down your throat to make you more I do. Of a Londoner by by people exactly. like yourself. Phil. Yes, exactly. People like yourself will force feed me eels until I I don't know stay true to the old start, Cockney traditions. Exactly. Start talking Cockney. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Exactly. Apples and pears and various other fruits. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that was a reference, Phil, but uh, you didn't get it. But I know you did. That's me breaking the fourth wall and talking. Or is it third wall? Fourth. Fourth wall? Fourth, fourth wall and talking to the listener there. Do you like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what for, for those like myself that didn't understand what was for reference. It's the Cockney Hitchhiker from the Mighty Boosh. <gasps> I was talking about that this very day to my oh yeah to, were my, you? to my dear wife. She was uh, talking to, about the Cockney Hitchhiker. Of some I can't remember what it was now, but she, she mentioned okay. it, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I remember that character." And you, and you didn't remember the apples and pears and various other fruits? No, because I, I haven't literally watched Mighty Boosh for like oh, ten plus years since it first came. I out. I don't think I have either, Phil. This is what you know. I um, might actually be getting the quote wrong. That's probably where it's going. To <laughs> I, mean, it I might be. just be wrong. Yeah. Anyway, look. Before we get on that tangent, although I feel like we've kind of done that tangent as best as it possibly could be resolved, we're going to do a five-star review. This one comes from Apple Podcasts of Great Britain, and it comes from the Major 91. Uh, So either a uh, major happening that took place in the year 1991, or quite possibly, most likely, an individual born in the year 1991. Um, So happy 31st year of existence, the Major uh, assuming that is potentially the origins of the 91. Maybe you just like that number. Who could say for sure? Not Phil, seemingly. Right, fine. Five stars. I, I was I was just nodding along. You see, the problem is with this, Phil, is they can't see you nodding. I know. You do know this, right? I know, yeah. And I couldn't even see you nodding. You say you're nodding along, you just sort of smirk to me. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> you didn't gesture enough to even indicate a nod. Anyway, right, look, the five-star review reads five stars, exclamation mark, five stars. And as I've said... Surely surely that means 10 stars. Quite possibly. Or 25 stars, potentially. Add them all. Depending on how you multiply. The point is, is it's a five-star review. You you get the point. This segment is difficult enough without (laughs) us making it even worse. Um, Right, okay. I, I worry that some of these statements won't actually ring true based on what we've just basically put people through. But here they are. This podcast is entertaining, informative, and amusing. I worry that we have really, really fallen off uh, as it concerns those particular uh, those particular accolades. But hey, they said it, so I guess it's true. Um, or was anyway, true. Yeah. It could have been true once upon a time. Uh, having these two gentlemen talking about Warhammer and all things related in my ear for hours on end, makes my long day at work on a Sunday much more bearable. Um, I like the notion that potentially it's just this individual working on a Sunday that obviously I guess they get through the entire podcast on a Sunday, which would be logical. That's all they only work Sundays, which would be a lovely work schedule, although I imagine not the most lucrative of employment. Nonetheless... Good for you. Uh, I got back into Warhammer 40k in 8th edition. I'm now currently enjoying 9th edition very much. And having previously had issues with anxiety, I find Warhammer has given me an excellent way uh, to relieve stress and forget about my negatives of, uh, sorry, forget about any negatives of day-to-day life. I currently collect Cadians, Dark Angels, Imperial Knights, and Grey Knights. Closing in on, uh, on my collection there. Uh, and enjoy the lore, building, painting, list building, and gaming very much. But this podcast is the icing on the cake. Keep up the great work, chaps. The Major 91. So there you go, Phil. Look at that. We're having a positive impact on individuals dealing with anxiety. I myself, again, full transparency, had quite a bit of anxiety. Partly why this podcast exists is because of my ongoing issues with anxiety and or other you know, internal demons. Um, so it's a great thing to hear uh, that the hobby and or our contribution to it 
is being positively received by yourself, the Major 91. So thank you very much for your uh, incredible five-star review. We always like a long one. Uh, it definitely gives us more to unpack. Um, but to say thank you in more detail, Phil. Well, thank you, Major. We really appreciate it. Major 91, let's get your title correct. Um, the let, Major. Oh, the Major, yes. Let's hope that uh, if you are an actual Major, maybe in the Army, that they don't catch you listening to the podcast while you work because that's what you said because uh, that would be very naughty i'm sure um but also if you do happen to just work one day a week on the sunday good for you too um glad you're enjoying the hobby i think for a lot of people it uh, relieves a lot of stress uh, it's just a nice chilled out thing you can do painting building actually hanging out with people and playing the game for those people that want to be sociable don't know who those sorts of people are but that is an option. Um, so, yeah, you've got a mighty fine collection by the sounds of it, as Dan has alluded to, rivaling his almost, uh, but not quite because Dan's got far too much stuff. Um, but, thanks, do, yeah. but thanks very much. We really appreciate it and uh, glad you enjoy the show as part of your hobby experience. Beautiful stuff. And if you would like to be like the Major 91, all you need to do is leave us a five-star review anywhere that you can do so. That's Audible, our Facebook page, iTunes, other places are no doubt available, but if they are available, we don't know about them. So as we always say, if you're leaving us a five-star review somewhere where we can't immediately identify or locate it, please take the time to reach out to us. We love talking to people over the social medias. So by all means, reach out and say, hey, I left you a five-star review here. Go have a look. And we will uh, at some point. I mean, we have a bit of a backlog, it's fair to say. Uh, but don't let that, you know, not encourage you. Because Lord knows the algorithm loves a five-star review. Well, um, but, but also, like, there's there's a queue, right? So you, the quicker you get in it, the quicker you get to the end and have your review read out. Otherwise, you'll just it. be waiting even longer. That's true. That's true. Like an incredible fairground attraction, like the Oblivion at Alton Towers, uh, although that doesn't really attract a massive queue anymore, uh, given its relative age. Mm. doesn't matter the point is is you know leave us a review hey eh? why not and while you're at it maybe consider buying some merchandise because we have some also perhaps you might consider supporting us on patreon that way we don't advertise at you hey eh? hey eh? except eh? that eh? paid for sponsored alton towers plug you just did obviously but we won't mention well that. you know you know that's the best type of uh the advertising right the the hidden in plain sight variable um but there you go. That's that. That's the introduction. Sorry it took as long as it did. Hopefully the editing will make it less painful. Goodbye! Or rather... <laughs> transitional noise. Yeah, thank you. Wow! God, that's not even the transitional noise. All right, everyone. In this part of the podcast, myself and Phil are going to do the main event. The thing that we came here to do. The stuff that we enjoy, love, and or care about. Apparently, Codex Chaos Space Marines. They've got two wounds, Phil. Phil. Ba, 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 ba. Feels like an eternity uh, of one wound relegation. But now, yes. here they dwell in the land of two wounds. Doesn't matter, because by the time they've gotten it, everything in the game does two damage. So, uh, you know, it's all pretty moot. But, uh, but you got it now. Exactly. Just in time for it to be broadly worthless. I'm sure. I'm sure those chaos space Marine players will will care. They they, they will care. like it. Absolutely. On those rare instances that they're being shot at with assault cannons, they'll go. Oh, this is a a beautiful thing. Um, you know, a wonderful time to behold. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of hype, enthusiasm, excitement for chaos space marines, uh, and it's come out. And if I'm honest, it doesn't feel like many people really care all that much at all anymore. Uh, it felt like there was a lot of excitement and eagerness for this book. Um, but maybe my finger's off the pulse, but certainly from what I can see, people don't really care that much anymore. Uh, but I, I, That might be a testimony that it's like reasonably balanced because people yes. aren't decrying how broken it is. Although I have seen people talk about broken combos if you oh, of course. layer a ton of stratagems and a warlord trait and a relic oh, onto something. Um, but that's always going to be the case. It's not like, you know, the Tower Royal Gun, which, you know, no one talks about anymore. The good old days when everyone was losing their marbles about that. Do you think, though, it's that no one talks about it anymore, Phil, or that you and I have become relatively despondent to the to the talk that is there to be had? 
Are we just at that point now where we're sort of over it? We're like, we just accept that this game is a, you know, thing. I was going to say broken mess, but I figured I'd uh, try and be politically correct and resort to thing. But the point is, is do you think we're just at that point now where we're just beyond caring? It's like, yeah, this game's a disaster. Carry on. Uh, well, potentially. I, I I do still like to to keep, keep an eye on what, people are saying about it though oh, i mean i've uh, i occasionally used to check out the goonhammer articles about codexes i stopped doing that a long time ago um mm-hmm. purely because it felt like cheating on on my homework when i was doing these these episodes by seeing what people thought about it uh usually i i i hear what people are saying in the like warhammer competitive uh, Facebook group. Maybe the algorithm's just not serving me up any of their content because I certainly don't go looking for it. But when a when a post pop, pops up about something, I'll have a read of it. So yeah, it could just be a combination of factors, or it could just be Codex Space Means has come out and everyone's broadly happy with it, which is probably a good sign. Maybe I'm suffering, Phil, of the post Horus Heresy event influencer purge, uh, where I got so wound up by all of the social media posts that I decided to uh, abandon a great many of the usual talking heads uh, within the community. Maybe that's impacting my ability uh, to podcast in a fair and just way. So maybe I should have to resubscribe to various, uh, you know, outlets so as I can become more in tune with the uh, overarching competitive sentiment. I mean, you could do. That's that's certainly an option. Um, I still listen to Honest Wargamer. Rob always seems to know what he's on about. But then he mostly talks about Age of Sigma. Yes, that is the problem with uh, Honest War Graham. I do enjoy their 40k uh, chats when they love him, but they're very um, few few and far between. Um, But there isn't many talking heads that really talk about competitive stuff. No, not anymore. It's just clickbait now, isn't it? Um, Clickbait, and here I am hanging out with a friend who also does this. What a beautiful medley. Although on that topic, uh, you know, we'll have a guest later. No, we won't. I'm joking. I suppose I'm just doing that because we've done that, haven't we? We've uh, had the other influences on here in a, you know, obvious attempt to drive traffic well, to us. It wasn't really obvious. It, weirdly, I always found um, it, they never promote it, so it obviously doesn't drive any traffic. They never helps us at all, does to, it? To us, it just drives our audience to them. So maybe yeah. we need to go on other shows. If that's, that's probably it. That's we, probably it. We, we need to, to we need to utilize this thing. That's why I kept saying no to Siege Studios. The amount of times they've asked to come on this thing, and I'm just like, what would you actually bring? <laughs> it's like, I get to listen to James talk about how he made a small business. Woo! Can't wait to hear that. Anyway, let's talk about Codex Scale Space Marines, the cover. I like it. Upper echelon cover. Bloody yeah. good show. Yes, I agree. Let's move on. Yeah, I mean, things of note. It's got stuff that's probably not completely depicted within the book i mean it's got like crazy horned mad looking you know creatures screaming out as they fire guns and a dude with two axes or sorry an axe and a sword and some kind of crazy maul and big old horns i love it this is a fine addition to the cover collection not gsc or admec but certainly well, it's- upper upper tier after that it's, it's clearly by the same person that did those two. So Do you think so? A hundred percent. Do you suspect person. they're doing all of them? Would it would it hurt mm. you to know that he's done, or she's done, or they've done all of them? Who could say? And then Have they, just, or is that yeah. speculation? I don't know, I'm asking, I don't know, do we know? Oh, um, I mean, if they are, they're doing different styles, which is exactly. an impressive feat, but this, stylistically, is exactly the same as Admech and Gene Stealing Cult. Which is why it's their it's best work. So Keep doing them like that. Less Black Templar, more whatever you want to call this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We like this. This is this is our jam. Anyway, on the topic of jam, let's talk about Chaos Space Marines because um, they're made of jam, aren't they, Phil? Well, they are. There's four different types of jam. You've got the corn jam. You've got the uh, slanesh jam. You've got the zinc jam, and you've got the um, Death Guard jam. I imagine the slanesh well, jam would be very. Very exciting. Slavered all over you. Exactly. People can lick it up at will. Indeed. Corn jam would be a little bit itchy, I imagine. A bit rough on the old skin. It, probably bring prob- up in a few hives. Yeah, probably get you angry, basically. Probably would do. Probably do. Very mm. pheromony, you know, sort of getting you a bit kind of... Well, I suppose 
all of them will probably have yeah. pheromonal qu- quantities. Uh, Zinch would be quite trippy. It'd be having yeah. a hallucinogenic in it, and Nurgle would just smell and taste really bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Moldy. Yeah. I like. Yeah, I like the idea of Zench. Like maybe it would be like a, you know, some kind of way of growing, growing back a limb. Only obviously, tentacly or whatever. Yes, all very small, a bit like the scene in Deadpool. When he Could be uses, very small, yeah, right there, the no. little baby legs. Yeah, yeah. Look how you get the reference in, Phil. Well done, I, you. I try. I get, I get, I get special. You know, more of a Christmas bonus if I put more references in. Well, so, that's true. So my, that's true. So my boss get... tells me. <laughs> Do you have a boss these days, Phil? It's you. Oh, I'm your boss on I'm on the podcast. Your boss, you're my boss. No, I'm yes, not. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, you are. Yes, you oh, are. Oh no, no. The listeners are your boss, Phil. You are but a slave to their darkness, which is an attachment ability. I understand, alongside other abilities. Um, there's a picture here of what their combat patrol contains. I've not actually seen this before. It looks like a good combat patrol. Again. I've not looked at any of this before, as is the way with these uh, reviews, as we call them. We're reading it for the first time. And we've got a hard cutoff today at 11.30. So we're going to get as much as we can get done by then. So if anyone's uh, concerned that this isn't as uh, long of a one as we might otherwise do, um, it's because, you know, we've uh, unfortunately got too much other stuff going on. But, you know, two hours, two more minutes to go, Phil. Uh, before that's before us, so I reckon we should have a pretty good stab at it, don't you? Yeah, let's smash for it as quickly as we can. While also giving our friendly Chaos Space Marine fans all of the love and attention they so require. Uh, yes, it's like uh, they've waited only two years for this, and then we rush for it as quickly as humanly possible. Sorry, exactly. guys. Exactly. It's not like when we did the Craft World book, is it? You know, God, I had so much to say when it was the... That, well, see that? Eldari. See that was a two-parter. Two-parter codex reviews can be a thing. Yeah, but that's because it was two codexes in one, mate. That's essentially what led to that. Although I guess technically this is like eight or nine codexes in one, if you want. Oh uh, yes, it is massive. Uh, just to, talking about the legions themselves. Uh, each one gets obviously its own legion trait. They get their own secondary objective, which is kind of a mad concept. Uh, it's they also obviously moot now as well, though, isn't it? Because the, they can only use the secondary objectives in the secondary objective. Uh, only if you're playing the GT missions, obviously. If you're which is all just... anyone plays now, Phil. Haven't you got the memo? No, it's people like narrative and casual play. Casual play between. Yeah, but in casual you play, you're not going to use secondary missions, are you? You could do the the what people call casual match play, where casual you... match play. You're doing a form of match play, but not using the latest GT mission pack. Or, or you homebrew it and you just go, we're going to use these and not the the other stuff. You know how it is, Phil. You know how it is. This game is all about competitive, uh, so much so that, you know, it's uh, driven away players uh, over the span of time. Anyway, let, let me carry on and explain. So each Please, Legion yes. gets not just one Warlord trait, they oh. get six. They do oh, basically wow. get a whole Space Marines uh, They get cha- six Warlord well. traits each. Six Warlord traits per Legion. Oh my They God. get a page of stratagems, a page of relics. Um, so it's a loss, right? So we, we're really not going to... I didn't appreciate that that was as much as it is. That is insane. Yes, it is quite wow. bonkers. That, that's why... We can't really do it all. So we're going to... This is an amazing book, though, right? Again, I'm thumbing through it now. The fact that you're given this much stuff, it's pretty amazing. I mean, like, fair play. Well, it's um, basically, imagine the Space Marine Codex that didn't have supplements, and all of the supplement info was just in your codex. This is kind of what they've done. That Um, is amazing. So it's that's why it is a hefty tome. That is amazing. I mean, fair play to them. I mean, this is the thing. I'm, I'm surprised there's relative indifference to this book. I mean, it seems like they've really gone the extra mile to really kind of satisfy those, uh, those oh so poorly done by. Oh, sorry. Here coming. Those oh so poorly done by Chaos Space Marine players. Where's that thing? No, All right. Well, how are we going to do it? For you, we're about to explain. We're just going to say what the Legion trait is, and then leave it at that. 
Yeah, let, let's start off with the detachment abilities and the usual flip to the back and talk about all those abilities, and then we'll sure. go to the legions. But I just wanted to briefly explain how in-depth those uh, legions they are mad. Stuff, are, yeah. stuff is. There is no, from what I can gather, no um, independent, like, pick your own. So what it basically says is, if you want to create your own custom legion, you just pick one of the legion types to represent it. So you don't get any kind of freewheeling customization that you get in most but not all armies see that is my preference though right i think we need to move into a system where people can play anything as anything i just think that's a better place to be you know like get into a scenario where you can paint marnius calgar as a blood angel uh add him to a blood angel army and then when using him run it as an ultimate army with no no drama i think that would be fine i think that mm. would be a happier place for all of us well no, it's uh, Interesting that Abaddon is an agent of chaos, which is a bit like the agents of the mm. Imperium, so he can be running any army. Makes and, sense. And potentially, maybe going forwards, maybe Gilliman would be an uh, agent of the Imperium, so he's not ultramarine specific, but still gives specific buffs to ultramarines. That would be to, nice. To, to, to highlight the fact that he is effectively the, the leader of the Imperium, that he can actually... Go alongside other armies. Maybe that'll happen yeah. to him in the future. Maybe they won't. Yeah, I think, I think definitely. I think definitely Gilliman. We should extend that courtesy, but uh, maybe Calgar can stay ultramarine specific. But I oh, just yeah. mean of more just the general prevailing attitude towards, you know, painting, collecting armies. Just, mm. You know, lay off. Anyway. Go on then. Let's, Let's get on with it. Let's go detachment through these abilities. detachment abilities. Yep. So all Chaos Space Marines get the uh, Champions of Chaos, Mere Mortals, and Slave to Darkness. The Traitorous Astartes um, gain the Legion Traits abilities, which is the stuff that we talk about when we go through the actual traitors, um, the individual legions, um, and then troop units um, gain objective secured. So you've got Champions of Chaos. You can include a maximum of one Chaos Lord, one Demon Prince, and one Dark Commune unit in each Space Marine uh, Chaos Space Marine detachment. So that one's quite straightforward. So that caps the number of big guys that you can have. Uh, you've got me mere mortals. Uh, you cannot include more cultist units than Traitorus Astartes core infantry units in each Chaos Space Marine detachment. And a cultist character model cannot be your warlord if your army contains any heretic Astartes characters, which is really cool because you can then if you want to do a kind of cultist themed army, which is probably the most exciting thing about this book for me. I think more people should go heavy cultist. Like, that's always the thing. Like, chaos, to me, within the culture of the, you know, law, is that, you know, a legionnaire, super rare. A legionnaire and terminator armor, insanely rare. Some kind of chaos warlord that, you know, leads a warband of uh, actual chaos space marines. N you know, near infinitesimal, very small. Very small numbers, yeah. basically, right? So, like, yeah, I, I like the idea of just most armies just being, you know, one Chaos Space Marine leading a leading a bunch of uh, loopy cultists. That'd that would be great. Be cool. That'd be brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Way to go. Uh, and then lastly, we've got the Slaves to Darkness ability. So this is uh, all dependent on which uh, god you're basically going for. So uh, you can include Corn Berserker units in a Chaos Space Marine detachment. Um Using data sheets and points values that you find for them, such units, when included in Chaos Space Marine Detachment, gain basically the following abilities. They always have the elite battlefield role. Uh, you've got to replace uh, the keywords out. They gain the Let the Galaxy Burn ability and uh, must be upgraded to have a corn mark. So every um, some units and characters can specifically be upgraded to be given a Chaos mark, um, which is, you know, a chaos god um and they can never gain a legion trait uh so if you include uh rubric remains in the chaos space means attachment um basically you can find the points form in the codex thousand suns and when they go in a chaos space mean detachment they always have the elite battlefield role they swap out a bunch of keywords they gain the let the galaxy burn ability they must be upgraded to mark of zinch um, and the aspiring sorcerer knows smite and one psychic power from the dark reticus discipline instead of the usual ones on their uh, data sheet and they can never gain a legion trait you can see there's a bit of a pattern here so plague marines can be included from uh, codex death guard into chaos space marine detachment 
They've got to be elite. They swap out the keywords. They gain left galaxy burn. They must have the mark of Nurgle. They lose the bio, bubonic Astartes keyword and they can't gain a legion trait. And then lastly, noise marines can be added in using the data sheet found in this book. Um, they always have the troops battlefield role if every unit in the detachment, excluding Agents of Chaos and Unaligned, is from the Emperor's Children Legion. Uh, they never gain a Legion trait unless every unit in the detachment is from the Emperor's Children Legion. So that one's a little bit different from all the others. That makes sense though, right? I mean, obviously it is likely that they were hoping to have done all of the uh, the Chaos Gods in this edition, but it seems that that obviously isn't the case. Although I imagine... The Emperor's Children could not be that far away now. I imagine at some point in the next three to five years, we will finally have a Emperor's Children army. Yeah, it, it feels likely that they will be the ones after World Eaters, right? Well, they have to be, right? I mean, there's nothing left yeah. uh, at that point. It's 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 pretty much that. And then we'll get into the realm of, I suppose, expanding those legions that have demon Primarchs and so on and so forth. So maybe doing some specialist kind of iron warrior or uh world eater not world eater sorry word bearer uh variables but um yeah interesting i do like it though i do like the idea that they have essentially added in that flavor where they're like you can take rubric marines um but you'll find their data sheets and point values in codex thousand suns you could take plague marines but they're in death guard you can take berserkers they're in there however obviously a little bit of a bugbear is the fact that actually really to gain access to the full suite of options that this codex pretends to give you, you need to own, you know, three other books as well. And that's not supplement, right? That's not like one of those situations where it goes, I like Ultramarines. I will get Ultramarine supplement. And then that plus Space Marine make my army. Yeah. This is one of those things where it's like, well, actually you, you, you do need, if you want, you know, there's potential that someone out there, would need to turn up with this rather specifically large tome, followed by Death Guard, followed by Thousand Sons, followed by um, World Eaters, and then the Forge World Compendium even, potentially. And then who knows what else? Maybe they've got some special thing they're using from some other campaign book. It yeah. could become very, very if, Yeah, if, if you're going to be a bit mad and do a proper, like, um, Abaddon is le- leading all the legions, um which is, I think, exactly what Joe's doing, right? So he would be that that exact person where he needs to have all the books. You could argue that they should have just put those three extra or four, yeah, three extra units into this book uh, just for the sake of it. But Games Workshop hates having duplicate data sheets across different supplements or books, so they've got to update stuff in two places so I can see the logic of why they've done that. Oh, I can see the logic 100%. It's just one of those things where it feels to me that this would have been one of those things where it would have just been nice had they, I don't know, put these specific data sheets into the download section of, uh, you know, the Warhammer community site. Just been like, well, there you go. <laughs> just if you yeah, need those, it, you know. It would be more user friendly. I guess you, you could argue that if you're a Warhammer Plus subscriber, you can get access to the core stats and war gear yes, for those true. units for free. Um, well, not for free, say Phil. free, free in air quotes because you've still got to pay for the app. Um, but you don't need to unlock the codexes because I don't think you need any of those locked contents, which is like the special abilities and um, army traits, because you're using you don't get access to them and you're using all the stuff from this book instead. Although, do you get access to weapon profiles with that? Variable. I think so, but if there's any uh, data sheet abilities, you don't get access to those. That's true. There you go. What a wonderful system they've uh, they've created. Uh, boohoo, the app's rubbish. We say that a lot. <laughs> Let's move on with our lives. Um, yes, so we do have other abilities that we can talk about. These are the uh, kind of core cool, uh, army-wide ones. Well, some, some are actually specific. Um, shall I quickly rattle them off? Cause they're rattle them off, forward. mate. Rattle away. We've got Demon Engine, which is obviously, if you're a demonic oh, yeah. engine, uh, they get a five-plus invulnerable save, and in your command phase, they regain one lost wound. Nice and straight. What page forward. are you on for this? Uh, 144. We've skipped okay, we, we, ahead we jump forward. past literally everything um, except for data sheets. All right, I'm there. Tell me more. 
So five plus and random will save and in command phase you regain one lost wound, which is pretty cool. Malicious volleys is basically bolter discipline. So if you're firing a rapid fire bolt weapon, if you're within half range, you get to shoot twice. If you're standing still, uh, you get to shoot twice. And if you're a Terminator or a bike model, you get to shoot twice regardless of uh, whether you've moved or not. Uh, so exactly like bolter discipline. Then lastly, you've got um, oh, you've got warp strike, which is basically deep strike. You can you know come from above and drop down anywhere on the table within nine inches or outside of nine inches from your opponent. And then lastly, the big one is let the galaxy burn. Um, this is essentially uh, chapter tactics to an extent. Um, no doctrines, doctrines. That's right. Yes, um, the doctrines. So uh, you basically, if your army has the Traitorus Astartes keyword um, and every Legion unit is from the same Legion, you gain the following ability. Each time a model uh, with this unit shoots with a flame weapon, you get to add plus two to the result. So basically D6 plus two. And also you gain the following bonuses depending on which battle round it is. And this follows the same as the... Um, doctrines for space means so in the first battle round you're in wanton destruction which is like the devastator doctrine uh the second battle round you've got to be in um wanton massacre so you've got to shift and then the third battle round you can be in wanton massacre or wanton slaughter and then the fourth battle round onwards you've got to be in wanton slaughter so it follows the same format as the space mean ones but they get slightly different and dare i say better abilities um so wanton destruction which is a bit like the devastator's rock doctrine uh each time the model in this unit makes an attack with a heavy rapid fire or grenade weapon un unmodified hit roll of six scores one additional hit so you'll see instead of giving an extra bonus to ap you get extra hits instead uh and also it covers a broader gamut of weapons uh, from the space moon one so wanton massacre which is a bit like the tactical doctrine um when you're in this one, each time a model makes a rapid fire, assault or pistol weapon, an unmodified hit one of six scores one additional hit. And then lastly, uh, wanton slaughter. Uh, if you make an attack with an assault, pistol or melee weapon, an unmodified hit roll of six scores one additional hit. And then there's a bit of a special rule that says some units in the game can have special abilities which allow them to shift uh, into different doctrines or... or um, wanton uh, uh abilities uh you can potentially have multiple at the same time but if you score a, a six and you're in two and it applies twice it doesn't you still only get that one extra hit you can't say well actually i'm in massacre and slaughter and i've just used um like a an assault weapon i get two extra hits for each six it's like no it specifically says you only get one which is sensible Makes a lot of sense. Um, not a fan of uh, them stipulating multiple weapons uh, in um, or multiple weapon types. Although I suppose Marines have that to an extent because it's like Devastator. It's heavy, rapid. Yeah. Uh, in 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 tactical, it's rapid fire and assault. And then in um, I think it's rapid fire and assault. Maybe heavy includes heavy grenades includes well. grenades and assault uh, includes pistols. Yeah, pistols and and melee weapons. So this is so, similar, but has the rapid fire kind of going across more. Um, yes. So it works from earlier on, which is a bit interesting. Yeah. So it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So it starts heavy, rapid grenade, then goes rapid assault pistol, then assault pistol and melee. Um, so grenade only features. Grenade and heavy only feature in one, and then yeah. yeah, it's fine. It's cool. I mean, again, it's it's one of those things, isn't it? I suppose I've been spending too much time in the in the heresy camp at the moment. It's interesting going back and reading a rule where you're like, oh yeah, this. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like goody goody, um, extra stuff. Got you. So their flamers do stuff. They got extra stuff on top of that. They've got the ability to fire weapons as if they haven't moved. If they, well, sorry, fire weapons at full range if they don't move. It's just, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a ninth edition Godex, that, that's for sure. <laughs> um, it's not, it's not any more complicated than the Space Meme one. It's relatively no, straightforward, 100%, which I think is 100%. good. 
yeah, I think the thing is, is there's something, again, I think it's just to do with the way that 40k players consume information or play armies, right? We all have Marines is a kind of understood language just because we all kind of, uh, we all dabble with Marines, I suppose. So you never, you never struggle as much with Marines and Marine, Marine adjacent things. Yeah. But I also feel like it, that was uh, either by design or accident. It was one of the most, uh, or more simpler, um, sort of army specific special rules that they, they've done. It's not like Zinch or, um, Oh, God. So, so Fa- Thousand Suns and Dark Elder, where you have sort of weird points that you've got to track that you can like generate and stuff, is a lot more complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as you end up in that kind of cabal system realm, it, yeah. What was the other? It was, Drakari didn't have one of those. It was another one. It was, there's just yeah. There's so many weird extra layers. Oh, that was it. It's the different stances for custodies as well. Yes, yeah, that one's... I've played a lot of Custodes over the span of them being a new army. I never, ever know what's going on. They just go, I'm in my blah, blah. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? Whatever I tell you. Okay, fine, I don't care. Yeah, because there's so (laughs) many different stances that you can pick to start off with and each one has like three different ones you can shift to, it's almost it's quite difficult to remember or even know what they're gonna do whereas as you, as you know you're playing space marines they're getting an extra minus to their ap and you can pretty much tell what weapons that's affecting on what units for which turns so you can strategize around that as you're gaming with uh custodies they will just pull a finger out of a bag and be like i'm doing extra damage to um your monsters or vehicles and you're like cool and they can kind of do that in any turn of their choosing uh and you can't really plan for that to happen i think if you if you had uh, you know if you could know them all off by heart maybe you'd have a slight more advantage but i think that's quite a difficult one to do as a non-custodies player oh yeah near impossible i again it's one of those things that i say quite a lot where these kind of mechanics are things that you just kind of resign yourself to. You just go, sure, whatever. You you know, I trust you're not cheating. Um, and that's sort of uh, one of the more interesting aspects I find of this kind of layering of rules is mm. that we always find ourselves in situations where really you just accept that everyone can do whatever they want whenever they want somehow. So you just kind of, you know, just so long as they don't roll a one, it seems, is the only real variable in games of 40k now it's like they tell me something and they roll a dice and then if it's a one i go i assume that didn't happen then and then we move on with our lives <laughs> unless of course it's a lead chip test but yes um, well, exactly exactly but that's like my general rule now is i just sort of just go yeah sure whatever i'm sure it's right i yeah. played against a nid player the other day and he turned around to me and went i've done 20 something more wounds to you with one squad of zone frames or something i was like Sounds sounds legit. <laughs> Why not? Of course you'd have. <laughs> quite, like... quite likely. But let's yeah. not take away precious time from my life. Precious time, precious chaos, time. Grumble, uh, grumble, grumble. Um, Should so we talk let's... about the Black Legion? Yeah, let's do Black Legion. We've Shall got... I do Black Legion? Yes, do you want me to read the Black Legion? I'll read the Black Legion. I've been talking too much. Uh, are we yeah, just going to do... a good job. Are we just going to do the Legion trait and then maybe a Warlord trait and then we'll skip over the rest? Yeah, because the secondary objective is pointless, right? Because no one uses them. Yeah unless they're playing this fictional, fluffy match play that you're talking about. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, fine. So, Black Legion, they have Black Crusaders. Uh, each time a combat attrition test is taken for the unit with this trait, you can ignore any or all modifiers to the combat attrition test. Oh, they're Krieg. They're like Krieg. Therefore, they're onto great things. Each time model uh, with this trait makes an attack, add one to that attack's hit roll. If that attack is a ranged attack and the target was the closest eligible enemy unit, uh, to the attacking model uh, when its unit was selected to shoot. That attack is a melee attack, and the attacking model's unit made a charge move this turn. So you add one to hit rolls, which is useful. Um, I think it. Yeah, very good. I, I mean, I hear Black Legion are pretty reasonable. Pick a random uh, Warlord trait, Phil. Uh, merciless. We should get a dice for this. We should just roll a D6 oh, and okay. see what you get. So I have one You're looking around for a D6. I I'll tell you what, you just randomly pick one for this one and then one, uh, I'll read the next one and you no, can... No, uh, number three. Number three, there you go. I'm sure you rolled a dice for that. So what is it? 
Oh, no, I'm going to read it. Fine, I'll read it. He's going to find one. Uh, number three is Merciless Overseer. Uh, in your command phase, when you select one friendly Black Legion unit within six of this Warlord, until the start of your next command phase, each time a model in that unit makes an attack, if your army is engaged in either wanton destruction or wanton slaughter, um, which, as I understand it, is the first and last variable, so not the uh, middle one. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, probably. Hold on, I think so. Just, I, think it's, um, I think it's... It goes destruction, massacre, slaughter. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So destruction. Yeah, so then that is considered to be engaged in wanton massacre for that attack instead. So you go back to the middle. Yeah, so you want to shoot your rapid fire assaults and pistol weapons. Yeah, so in your command phase, you select one friendly Black Legion unit with six of the Warlord to the start of your next command phase. Each time model with making that attack is considered to be in the middle thing. So good for shooting. Especially with your plus one to hit and so on and so forth. Cool. Phil? Oh, there's stratagems and relics. We don't care. Let's talk about word bearers. Word bearers. Um, so they get the profane zeal. Uh, each time a model with this trait makes a melee attack, if the model's unit has a uh, made a charge move or charged or, uh, sorry, was charged or performed a heroic intervention, they can re-roll the attack's hit rolls. That's pretty strong. Uh, and each time a model with this trait would lose a wound as a result of a mortal wound uh, on a five plus wound is not lost yeah that's all right it's all right i mean that's, that's all right uh and then i have a dice <gasps> what are you gonna roll phil we, we we rolled a four so it's master of the union so in your command phase you can select one friendly word bearers demon kin unit within six inches of this warlord until the start of your next command phase, add one to the strength characteristic of models in that unit, and each time an attack is made in melee, improve the armor penetration characteristic by one. So Seems plus one strength, plus awful. one AP. Seems all right. Yeah. There we go. So they're a bit more resilient against mortal wounds, um, which makes sense given the way that uh, you know word bearers are portrayed. They're they're a bit you know religiously, a bit sort of zealous a bit more kind of likely to have you know a bit of uh resilience to that kind of nonsense so makes sense um next on the list we have the night lords now the light lords are known for being scary phil that's why i know about night lords um Boo. one of the few traitor legions with a dead primarch yes yeah that's true spoilers uh if anyone knew that killed by an assassin as i understand oh well, thanks for the spoilers. Is that a spoiler as well? Well, for me, it is because I didn't know. Well, you have just started reading the Horus Heresy, so you know, as in the actual rule book, as opposed to the actual books. <laughs> That's true. Oh, well, I have actually started listening to the first audio book. Shut as up. Well. Yeah. Have you? Yeah, I, I'm probably a chapter or two in. Did it really confuse you out of context when it starts and they go, "I was there the day that Horus killed the Emperor." Yes, because I always assume that was like a bit of a in joke or something. Uh, but then you find out what it actually means, and you're like, "Oh, okay, okay, there you go." See, yeah. I mean, in a way, it is an in joke. But anyway, we digress. The point is, Night Lords—they're a thing. Scary uh, units with this trait have the following ability: Terror Tactics Aura. Uh, while this enemy is within nine of this unit, subtract two from their leadership characteristics. Uh, of models in that unit and subtract one from combat attrition test taken for that unit. Big minus two and then minus one on both um, your leadership followed by combat attrition is a pretty meaningful combo. Uh, and then each time a model with this trait makes an attack with a melee weapon, if that attack targets a unit that is below our strength when the attacking unit was selected to fight, or if that attacking target uh, attack targets a unit that has leadership characteristic of five or less Add one to that attack's wound roll. Um, so getting something down to leadership five is uh, probably not feasible just based on that ability alone. Um, but obviously, once you combo it with a few other things, I imagine it's entirely feasible. Things like whatever Warlord trait Phil rolls. Oh, well, I was going to say, like, Guardsmen have base leadership seven, but obviously I think the uh, Officer is eight. So yes. Yeah, even they wouldn't be susceptible. And I've rolled a two. Are you rolling or are you pressing a space bar on some kind of random number generator? No, I I literally rolled, but it, it sort of did just clunk down. It did sound like uh, like you just smashed in the space bar. What did you roll? A two. 
I want to. Uh, one piece at a time. Ooh. Uh, each time this warlord is selected to fight after it is finished making its attacks, if any enemy models are uh, were destroyed by those attacks, uh, that their unit was not, des- but their unit was not destroyed. Select one of those enemy units uh, until the end of the next morale phase. Subtract one from the combat attrition test taken uh, for that enemy unit. Each time this warlord makes consolidation move, models in the, its unit can move in any direction and can do so even if they are already touching an enemy model, provided each model finishes its moves within three of an enemy unit. Mm-hmm. It's all right, yeah. It's okay. Interesting. Yeah, so mm. with that alone, you can get minus three on... No, minus two on a combat attrition test. So minus, minus two, two, two minus two combat attrition. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, it's all right. I mean, you know, I imagine there's probably better things, but we didn't get around to talking about them. So <laughs> let's move on to Iron Warriors. Uh, Iron Warriors have the Iron Within, Iron Without. Uh, each time a model with this trait makes an attack, the target does not receive the benefits of cover... They're basically Imperial Fists, don't tell them. Uh, and each time an attack is allocated to a model with this trait, if the attack counters it has an armor penetration characteristic of minus one or minus two, um, it's worsened by one. So minus one will become zero, minus two will become one, and then Armor of Contempt will make that uh, a big fat juicy zero anyway. Um, so that's interesting. So technically, yeah. Even minus three becomes minus one AP with Armour of Contempt. Factored him for however long that shall reign in our lives. That's pretty crazy. And then so, for the Warlord traits, oh, go on. I was just going to say, in other instances where this has been a stipulation, like Salamanders, for example, they just went, oh, you just can't reroll a wound against them to try and balance it slightly. But I'm guessing that. Has it happened in this case? No, not yet. So maybe in the um, in the next balance update, maybe they will change that. I am looking at the balance data slate right this very moment, and it says here under Chaos Space Marines. Uh, here you go. Change the second bullet point of Iron Warriors. Iron within. Iron without. Uh, each time an attack is made against unit, that attack wound roll cannot be rerolled. So right, they've already okay. done it, Phil. Yes, I think I we I remember when we talked about it, we did speculate. Well, that obviously shows you what they were getting, because that's how they've changed it. Yeah. So oddly, I actually didn't remember that, although obviously I did deep rooted down in me noggin. Mm-hmm. Um, well done. The you. point is, is yeah, same as salamanders. So not what you just said, but what I said. Exactly. And now I'm going to roll the dice. I'm going to try and get a bit more of a roll. Oh, it's spinning. It's still. Oh, it's a free. So that is unyielding m- metal, but not metal. No, In, metal. Uh, metal. Um, metal. So you add one to the toughness characteristic of the Warlord, and the Warlord, if it would lose a wound, roll a five plus, it's not lost. So five That's plus, feel no pain. That's a pretty great Warlord trait, to be fair. Plus one toughness, plus one, feel no, f- plus five, feel no pain. Yeah, pretty good. Strong. Everyone likes durability in their Warlords, especially if that's some kind of loopy demon prince with... A big old axe, and who knows what else. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty uh, pretty cool. The Alpha Legion next, Phil. I am Alpharius, uh, so on and so forth. Well known for being sneaky. Is there, uh, is there Primark alive still, or do we not know? Because they're top we don't, we don't. We don't know, Phil. We don't know. Has he ever been alive? Is there even a Primark? Who could say? Exactly. Yes. It's weird with the, when it comes to these guys, because they had... Uh, their Primarchs are unique in the sense that they're just Space Marine-sized. They're not even that big, from what I understand. Hmm. Yeah. Well, at least yeah. I think so, because they're twins, aren't they? That's the that's the thing with them. Yes, uh, but they also all pretend to be the Primarch. Um, Correct. A bit bit like that scene, and I can't quite remember what they said. Oh, in Dead Poet Society, they all get up on the chairs and say, my captain, my captain, or something like I that. I thought you were going to go with the life of Brian. I'm Brian, and so does my wife. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's, there's plenty of films where everyone's like, no, I'm that person when when the, the, the dark, evil person is like, bring me the head of this person or I will kill everyone. And they all go, we are that person. Okay, there they are. And then they're all brutally slaughtered. As it should be. As it bloody well should be, indeed. Anyway, 
The Masters of Duplicity are the Alpha Legion. Each time a ranged attack uh, targets a unit with this trait, if the attacker is more than 12 away, subtract one for the attack's hit roll. If the target unit contains any models with the wound's characteristic of 10 or more, the attacker must be more than 18 away instead for this benefit to apply. Now, that's interesting because mm-hmm. normally in those situations, up until now, they've used terrain keywords like obscuring to denote um, these things. So I can't remember what the trait was that was minus one to hit. It was dense or something. Oh, yes, dense. Yeah. yeah. So in in other instances where they've tried to implement this kind of rule, they've just said counts as being in dense terrain. Um, But in this specific instance, they've actually written the rule, uh, which could indicate that they might be changing terrain in 10th edition. Um, the or they that. just don't want it to combo with abilities um, that ignore cover. So that's true. That's you true. Know, Imperial fists and iron warriors obviously ig- ignore cover when yeah. shooting, but Alpha Legion sh- are sneaky in different ways. As should really be Raven Guard. So you know, because they're not in cover, they're doing something else to give them cover. But I thought like things like uh, Imperial fists ignore the benefit of light cover. Or stuff like that. They don't ignore the benefit of dense as far as I'm aware. Yeah, that's probably true. But um, but there are some abilities which say count as being in light cover, not just dense. Also, weirdly, dense isn't a benefit of uh, the cover. It's just what it does. It's what a trait of it. I think it's one of those weird nuances. Oh, I, yeah, I, I think we did a bit of a deep dive on it a long time ago. Yeah. So I don't yeah. want to go down that rabbit hole again. Greatly exploring the absurdity that is terrain keywords. Um, anyway, the point is that also units uh, with this trait are eligible to perform an action or declare a charge in a turn in which they fell back. If a unit with this trait declares a charge whilst it is performing an action, that action is still failed. That's big. Being able to do actions while falling back is very meaningful. Uh, roll a dice, Phil. Oh, it's a one. I am Alpharius. Uh, so... After nominating this model to be your warlord, randomly determine one additional warlord trait for them, re-rolling duplicate results from a warlord traits table of your choice that this model has access to. If this warlord is destroyed, you can immediately select one other Alpha Legion character model from your army that does not have a warlord trait and select a warlord trait for that model to gain. This uh, warlord trait has to be different. Blah, 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 blah. It cannot be I am Alpharius. Until the end of the battle, that model counts as your warlord for all rules purposes. If any mission... Sorry. Oh. Ah. Was, it, any was mission... it Big Burrito tonight, Dan? Well, it's just because I've just rushed into this. Um, anyway. If any mission objective, secondary objective, or agenda rules are triggered when your warlord is destroyed, destroyed, those rules are not triggered until this new warlord is destroyed. Oh, baby. I be Alpharius. Yes. Yeah, well, super thematic. I likes it. I likes it a lot. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Uh, The next one up is Red... I'm (laughs) Brian! The next one is uh, Red Corsairs. Probably one of my favourite. Hang on, isn't it Emperor's Children next? Oh, is it? Uh... Oh, wait. My pages were stuck together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Obviously, I someone likes fine. Emperor's Children a little too much. <laughs> Apparently. Uh, do you want to do, do Red Corsairs and we'll double back to Emperor's Children? You were about uh, yeah, to that, let's like do that, because I, I really enjoy Red Corsairs. There's lots of flavour. For- Red Corsairs are a little bit less uh, when it comes to uh, stuff. They've only got free warlord traits. Oh, I know. And- They've been a bit cheeky. Well, because we're now delving into the not so proper legions, but sort yeah, of the, different... the, the, the scummy ones. Yeah, and that they did explain at the beginning that there are other stuff like Red Corsairs, but they still count as legions in terms of keywords, even though they're not like technically a legion. But we digress. Anyway, so yeah, they've sure, got Ra- Raiders of the Maelstrom. Um, because they are from the Badab War. Um, so they've got uh, units with this trait are eligible to declare a charge in a turn in which they advanced, with a bit white scary. And also um, models with this trait count as two models when determining control of an objective marker or five models if they have a wounds characteristic of 10 or more. Mm, it's quite interesting. Um, and then I roll a dice for the old Warlord trait. It is a five, which is a Dark Raider. 
So once per turn in your shooting phase, after shooting with a friendly Red Corsair's call unit within six inches of this Warlord, that unit can make a normal move. If it does so, the unit is not eligible to declare a charge this turn. Oh, quite sneaky. Yeah, that's quite cool. I mean, yeah, sounds pretty reasonable. I quite like Red Corsairs. Uh, they definitely seem like they've got some interesting potential. I mean, ultimately, the ability to declare a charge in a turn in which you advanced is strong. Um, plus, also, they've got Huron Blackheart, don't they? Who is a cool character. He does, but a very bad model. Oh, the worst. Like, probably, yeah, one of the worst Games Workshop models still in circulation. I know. I, I, not as bad as the Squats, uh, or rather ooh, not the Squats, the, uh, leagues, the, of the, the le- leagues of Volton. But, uh, yeah, yeah. But Volton, Volton. Volton, um, Volton, whatever they're called. Um, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think there has been a couple of rumour engines which have maybe been hinting it to a new Huron model, because I think there was a couple oh, going around cow. with a glove that was a uh, Pathist claw that was very similar to his. So oh, that, yeah. would, that would be interesting, if it is indeed true. Are there rules for Huron Blackheart mm. in this book? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's in there. He's Should right we quickly d- go... Well, I'm going to read Emperor's Children, and then you're going to tell me about Huron Blackheart. Because, uh, you know, I think it's worthy to hear. Okay, Emperor's well, Children have flawless perfection, uh, which obviously, for those of us who understand what happened to the Emperor's Children, doesn't really make any sense anymore. Quite, uh, quite the ugly bunch. Uh, each time a model with this trait makes an attack, you ignore any or all hit roll. Huh? You can ignore any or all hit roll weapon skill, but the skill modifiers. There you go. You ignore modifiers. Woo, that's okay. Uh, and each time a model with this trait makes an attack on an unmodified wound roll of six, improve the armor tra- penetration, uh, arm penetration characteristic by one. Yay. Definitely not picking this one. Roll a d6. <laughs> it's a six. Ooh. Loathsome grace. Add two to the move characteristics of this warlord. Yeah, all right, fair enough. You can reroll advance and charge rolls made for this warlord. It's all right. In fact, it's good. Adding two to a move characteristic. I assume you give it to some kind of demon prince with wings. It probably moves well quick and then charges. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, potentially got some play, but nothing that exciting from the outset. Unlike Huron Blackheart. Right, Phil? So, yeah, let's... Uh, Huron Blackheart, you want me to do his whole stats and stuff, like, proper... Yeah, go on, talk me through it. I oh. want to hear about him. Cool. He's got a movement characteristic of six, a weapon skill, ballistic skill of two plus, strength four, toughness five, six whole wounds, seven okay. attacks, seven, jeez, uh, leadership Ooh. ten, and a three plus save. He's... Leadership ten? Yes. Ooh. Ooh, Abaddon, leadership eleven. Ooh. So much for That's that. It's like a custodies. Well, it is, yeah, mad. Um, so he's equipped with the Tyrant's Claw, Exalted Power Axe, Frag Grenades, Crack Grenades, and you can obviously only have one of him. So the Tyrant's Claw has a shooting mode, which is uh, range 12 inches, Assault D6, Strength 5, minus 1, 1 damage. Each time an attack is made, it automatically hits. So it's basically a flamer. Uh, it's also got a melee option, which is strength user, which is four, uh, minus two AP, one damage, and each time an attack is made with this weapon, make two hit rolls instead of one. And then he's also got the exalted power axe, which is a melee weapon, strength six, because it's plus two, minus two AP, and two damage. So that is your marine killer, basically. Uh, his abilities are Let the Galaxy Burn. He's got the Lord of Chaos Aura ability. So while a friendly Red Corsair's core unit is within six, each time a model in that unit makes an attack, reroll a hit roll of one. So the normal, you know, Chapter Master, no, not even Chapter Master, Captain ability. Um, the next one may well be the. Um, chapter master ability which is tyrants of badab so in your command phase select one friendly red corsair's core or red corsair's character unit within six until the start of your next command phase each time a model in that unit makes an attack you can re-roll the hit roll so yes that is the chapter master ability he's got sigil of corruption so he gets a four plus invulnerable save which is pretty tidy um and he's got the hammer dryer which is once per battle at the start of your psychic phase this model can use its hammer dryer which i've got no idea what that is um if it does well, so, you know it's a, a piece of apparatus used to dry hammers clearly i'm just trying to see what it is on his model because i can't well, potentially it could be something on his new model 
Maybe. Or it's like one of his potions, maybe. Anyway, um, maybe. Maybe. If, if you do this thing until the end of the phase, this model gains the Psychic keyword and can attempt to either manifest Smite or one Psychic power from the Dark Hereticus Discipline. Um, oh, so it says we recommend placing a Hammond Dryer model next to this model as a reminder, removing it once the ability has been used. A Hammond Dryer model does not count as a model for any rules purposes. So obviously it's a little character, like a little. Well, critter, he already maybe. had it. He already had his little ferret, didn't he? Do you remember his little naked mole rat? That he, no, I uh, don't. But is does it does the the current model come with it then? Yeah, it comes with a little naked mole rat. Oh right, that's well that's Kim oh, okay. Possible. Okay, um, you remember Kim Possible? I I think you've made me watch it once or twice, but no. I've never made you watch Kim Possible. No, uh, then, then yeah, well, I don't then like I it that much don't. that I would make you watch it. That would be ridiculous. Okay, then no, I've. I'd make you it. watch Chowder. That's what I'd make you watch. Well, thankfully you haven't. There you go, rider, rider. Anyway, that was him. The fact that he can gain a psychic power, and obviously you'll get to pick whichever one it is. That's kind of got some utility to it, which is kind of cool. Just looking for his miniature on the Games Workshop website right here. Hang on a second here. It's not even for sale. You can't even buy Huron Blackheart anymore. Uh, I mean, he actually, do you know what? He probably went out of circulation. You know, when they kind of legends, but not legends, the range rotation, that's it. I think yeah, it went yeah, out yeah. a while ago because it's a bit of a derpy model and they're obviously going to give us a new one. Terrible, isn't it? But yeah, if you if you look at the Huron Blackheart le- model, oh, he actually, actually comes with a separate little ferret on a separate base. Yeah. Cool. So that's why they've given it rules. There you go. That is, I mean, just the most. I'm just gonna share my uh, share my screen with you for a second, Phil, to remind you what this looks like. Oh, thanks. You remember that? There he is. It's is. yeah. It sort of looks like the thing. It's a bit like a chest burster, but with legs. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. <laughs> but, uh, by the sounds of things, an amazing character. Yeah, he seems pretty good. He's um, amazing. I love him. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't say no. Um, <laughs> well, no and, 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 I, I wouldn't mean, let you say no, Phil. You wouldn't have a choice. He's like, you You are. It's happening. He, that's it. He's got powerful fingers, mate. They would be going in you. <laughs> He'd be, <laughs> yeah, putting some of that squirty flame stuff up on me, probably. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And then, okay. and then putting the uh, the ferret up, yeah. Oh, too much, Dan. They go much. ferreting. Anyway, we've got the <laughs> Creations of Bile, which is the last Legion to talk about. Lovely, um, that's good. So they have experimental enhancements. So Creations of Bile is basically Fabius Bile's little cohort. Again, not a proper Legion. Um, so they get to add one to their move characteristic of models with this trait and add one to the strength characteristic of models with this trait. Then they also get each time a model with this trait is destroyed by a melee attack, if that model has not fought this phase, do not remove it from play. The destroyed model can fight after the attacking models has finished making attacks. It is then removed from play when making these attacks. If any of the destroyed model's characteristics change as it suffers damage for the purposes of determining what characteristics it's on for the profile, it's considered to have one wound remaining. So a, a free fight on death, which is quite cool. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. Um, and then I shall roll the dice. Oh, wait, it's gone behind something. Oh, it's a four. Um, and again, these guys only have um, three warlord traits. So it is prime test subject. So add one to the strength, toughness, and wound characteristics of this warlord. Um, bearing in mind, it already gets an extra plus one. So that's technically plus two from the base model. That's pretty strong, I would say. Yeah. I mean, again, all of these seem pretty interesting. It's got a lot of nice flavour. Uh, it is a shame to an extent that they're not offering players the opportunity to do some custom bits and pieces. But I think really that just adds so much extra complexity and it's where all of the problems come in. Because actually, for the most part, the main legions, the main craft worlds, the main chapters, the main regiments are all usually all right. Like there's obviously some standout ones that are stronger than others, but they're typically okay. But it's when 
you start adding in all these extra bits that stuff starts to get just a little bit too wibbly. Um, so I think it's probably for the best that they go move away from all of these extra layers of, um, of things and potentially just try and do a better job of, uh, coming up with fluff and, or, you know, faction related reasons why a thing is a thing and, 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 and that'll do. Tell you what, Phil, page 114's got a beautiful piece of artwork on it. You looked at that yet? I don't I'm flipping. Oh, beautiful. yes. Yeah, yeah, I saw this one. This is mad. It's a lady with a sort of on her knees praying with a weird growth coming out of her face, and she's got a magical book. Now, out of that is this mad, it's almost like a tree holding uh, a sword and an axe, and it's got eyes and mouths in multiple places it is the stuff of nightmares but also the stuff of dreams because it is just fantastic it's really good it's really yeah, good yeah. there's a few i think by the same artist throughout the book uh and i have to say is is actually packed with lots of artwork of multiple different styles there's even some john blanche artwork uh for some of the primarchs at the very nice. beginning which is very nice always nice to see it when they stick sneak some of his stuff in i totally agree Let's talk about Marks of Chaos. So, Marks of Chaos. Uh, if your army is Battleforged and you include any of the Chaos Space Marine detachments, uh, then basically you can upgrade units to have the Mark of Chaos. You can't do it to Chaos Cultists, uh, but it does say you can upgrade Chaos Undivided Core, Chaos Undivided Character Units, uh, excluding named characters, so they can get the Mark of Chaos and Every Demon Prince must be upgraded to have the Mark of Chaos. You obviously upgrade their points and power rating. They gain uh, a faction keyword. So if you're Mark of Corn, you gain the Core keyword. And same for uh, all the others. Uh, you lose the Chaos Undivided faction keyword. But you gain the Mark of Chaos keyword. Um, you can a, a priest or psyker can have a mark of chaos, uh, in which case it knows an additional prayer or psychic power, depending on which mark of chaos it gets. And a psyker cannot be upgraded to the mark of corn. Um, and you can have several marks of chaos throughout um, like the same one throughout your army. It says, with the exception of corn berserkers, rubric marines, plague marines and emperor's children because they've all got their chaos specific mark already so they can't have any more and then there's an optional rule for emperor's children specifically so when you add an emperor's children character or emperor's children core unit excluding the cultists to your army uh, you must upgrade that unit to have the mark of slanesh so interesting that they're the ones that must be i guess it's because all the others I was going to say all the others were in other books, but actually Mark of Corn. Um, I guess, is there no like corn specific units in this book? Surely there must be. So surely they would have the Mark of Corn. I get no, I, no, there's no, there's no corn specific units in this book because they've all been basically allocated to world. Oh, uh, uh, right. Yes. Cause so that's why they've got, cause they've got the temporary, uh, white dwarf fix, haven't they? Correct. Yes, that's it. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was thinking they haven't got a book yet, but they do, but it's not just not out yet. Okay. Correct. So, Correct. Okay, so we've got... I guess we're going to go through them all. Should we do, do them one at a time? Why ever not? Um, so the first one is Corn. Yeah, it costs 15 points. In fact, they all cost 15 points. So with Mark of Corn, each time a model in this unit makes a melee attack, if a model's unit made a charge move, was charged or performed a heroic intervention this turn, add one to the strength characteristic. And if a unit has the icon keyword, each time a model in the unit makes a melee attack, improve the AP characteristic by one. I mean, sounds like all the sorts of good things that you would expect a marker corn to give you. Uh, Nurgle, each time uh, an attack is made against this unit, if that strength characteristic of that attack is either equal or is at least double the toughness characteristic of this unit, subtract one from the attack's wound roll, or this unit has an icon keyword, each time a model in this unit makes a ranged attack, an unmodified hit roll of six automatically wounds the target. Crikey. So each time an attack is made against this unit, an attack either equals or is at least double the toughness characteristic of this unit. Wow. Okay, subtracting from wound rolls. So, so yeah, if you're going to be wounded basically on a two to four, it gets reduced by one, which is really good. 
um and then yeah automatically uh hits the um of six automatically wound yeah basically uh an imperial guardsman so so well done you because that's pretty good exactly well done then uh next one mark of zinch uh once per turn the first time a saving throw is failed for this unit the damage characteristic of that attack is changed to zero that could be pretty pretty tasty um and wow that's crazy that's per turn for every unit especially if you got a lot of like big boy chunky units or vehicles that uh, is going to be really helpful as well um if this unit has an icon keyword each time a model in that unit makes a ranged attack improve the ap characteristic by one so yeah that's pretty i cool. mean yeah marks of central round surely <laughs> does seem pretty good it basically means you've got to like shoot chaff at um well even then it's like you, you can shoot chaff at stuff but you've got to make sure they fail a saving throw that that's the key thing so you've got to throw stuff throw throw stuff that's gonna definitely do damage but no uh, it doesn't matter if the first one gets through so yeah things like las mm-hmm. cannons are going to be worthless against uh these guys unless you you're sort of focusing fire with a bunch of other units first to, to yeah. pop this ability off What's interesting is, is I suppose if you can put these marks onto like vehicles, I don't know if that's a, an option. It doesn't necessarily strike me that it would be, but maybe like uh, Hell Brutes, for example, can have marks. Um, so yeah, so they would be being, you'd need to hope that one of your light, you know, more um, low damage weapons gets through first before you then dedicate like the big scary gun. Yeah. yeah so it seems it seems to imply that you can only because it says you can um when mustering your army with the exception of cultists you can upgrade any chaos undivided core or undivided character units uh, okay, so hell would probably be amongst that as well um to have a mark of chaos yeah and then you've got to do it to every demon prince so a mark of zinch um demon prince would be pr- pretty good totally agreed uh, then we finally have the Mark of Slanish. If this unit starts the fight phase uh, within engagement range of an enemy unit, it fights first that phase. Again, really strong. Uh, and if the unit has an icon keyword, each time model with this uh, unit makes a melee attack, add one to the attack's hit roll. Consistently quite strong as well. Um, definitely adds some potency to some of the... Uh, higher strength and uh, damage weapons like power fists and so on, which usually have a minus one that will be neutralized by, uh, by this mark, which is, uh, which is pretty great. And then obviously if you're not armed with those weapons, it pretty much means that everything is hitting on twos, um, which is also real mm. good. Um, mate, those are some really good upgrades to be fair. They've really upped their game um, on marks. Marks used to be, you know, a bit kind of like, Oh yeah, I've got a mark. And it does nothing except give me access to a stratagem. So um, these all so yeah, seem is... pretty, pretty good. Um, I totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Are we going to do relics, or are we going to move past relics? Uh, I'm happy to do some relics. So uh, just even if we just pick like one or two each. Yeah, um, is relics over many pages uh, broken up by? sprawling pictures of crazy things uh yes so it's on three pages but these are three the pages. generic relics not the legion specific ones so i think we should know which we touch. which we chose to ignore yes. um all right well what are we gonna do one from each page yeah that sounds good it's worth noting so there's a bit about demon uh, demon weapons so a couple of the relics are demon weapons and it basically says uh, each time the bearer fights you've effectively got to make a leadership test um if you pass you can just fight if not you suffer d3 mortal wounds you can still fight but you can't use the demon weapon which is uh worth bearing in mind that's pretty cool that's pretty cool all right i'll pick one from the first page let's go with or go with uh they're all hard to pronounce (laughs) yeah so we've got guholax guholax the decayed uh, it's a Nurgle model only. Select one uh, melee weapon, excluding relics uh, the bearer is equipped with, um, which is weird because this is itself a relic, but whatever. Uh, that weapon is now a relic uh, for all rules purposes and has the demon weapon ability. Oh, right. Okay. I get what this is now. So this page 
are all demon weapons. So these are demon weapons associated with each god. So effectively, you take a weapon and turn it into a demon weapon. So this is quite a specific set of specific things. Mm. So basically, this first bit of relics, which is why it's broken up into this section, is just taking weapons and making them either Chaos Undivided, Corn, Slanesh, Zench, or Nurgle demon weapons. And they have extra abilities um, that are granted to them by that relevant... Uh, you know, yeah, chaos and, and it's basically saying you can't upgrade a relic to become a demon weapon because gotcha. it's so also this is still basically a relic. just yeah. fine. So let's skip past that. We get that if you can make weapons demony, great. Uh, in which case, moving across, I will talk about uh, the oh, blade of. Did, did you not want to actually see what it does when you upgrade? I it? don't care anymore. I'm moving along. I'm doing blade of relentless. Oh, okay. Do you want to read the flipping Nurgle sword? All right, here we go. That weapon is now a relic. Each time the attack is made with this demon weapon, if a hit is scored, the attack automatically wounds the target, and any models cannot use any rules to ignore the wounds they lose. I say that's good. That is good, to be fair. There you go. It's a good thing we read that. Uh, and I imagine all the other variants are similar but different. Uh, Slanesh does something with a D3. Uh, Korn does something with a D3. Uh, um, uh, Zench. Yeah, Slanesh, you get an extra D3 attacks, basically. Yeah, and Corn, uh, uh, you get extra D3 damage. Oh, uh, Zench. It, invulnerable saves can't be taken. That's pretty good. And then uh, Chaos Undivided. Each time attack is made with this demon weapon, uh, that attack successfully wounds the target. The target suffers one mortal wound in addition to normal damage. Again, all pretty good. Very good demon weapons there. Phil, you choose something from the next page. Um, or do you want to hear what the b- blade no, of Red Let's do it in order. You do the blade. All right. It's a melee weapon with strength plus one, minus four, and two damage. Each time a bearer fights, it can make one additional attack with this weapon. Each time it attacks, is made with this weapon. On a modified hit for all six, that target suffers two more wounds, and the attack sequence ends. Hmm. Flip a neck. It's pretty good. Very good. I'm going to pick Inferno Tome. Um, Why not, eh? It is a priest model only. The relic can be given to cultist models. Uh, the bearer knows one additional prayer from the prayers of the dark gods, and each time this bearer chants a prayer, if his herd, the closest enemy unit within 18 inches and visible, suffers D3 mortal wounds. So it's like a free smite, which is pretty good. It's pretty strong. I'm going to do the black mace, because it used to be amazing. I remember once upon a time when I played Chaos Space Marines, or even when... We didn't have hundreds of relics like we do today. People talked about black maces. They were good. So let's see what they are now. Uh, it's a black mace. Uh, it is a melee weapon with a strength plus two, minus two AP, and flat free damage. Each time an attack is made with this weapon, uh, excess damage is inflict- inflicts is not lost. Said keep allocating excess damage to another model in uh, the target unit until either all excess damage has been allocated or the target unit is destroyed. It turns the mace into basically... An Age of Sigma weapon. Over it does, yes. Yeah. Very cool. Could be big, because I suppose if you've got like a big, scary demon prince with a power maul that becomes the Black Mace, uh, not that they can have a power maul, but you know what I mean, a cursed weapon or whatever it is. The point is, is however it goes, you can find yourself in a situation where... If you're doing um, like seven plus attacks or something mad, you could be doing a lot of damage. Yeah, yeah, you could definitely churn your way through uh, a big old squad of things. Um, so that's good. Yeah, but also really good against, you know, you've got a flat free damage weapon, but against um, against guardsmen with one wound, it's like, cool, even if you get, like, say, five... No, say you get three wounds off, that's nine dead, guard, dead guardsmen instead of just three. Yeah. So that is big, big time. Um I'm going to ponder an orb and go for the Orb of Unlife. It's a Nurgle model only. Um, it's uh, a range six grenade, basically. And the bearer can only shoot with this weapon once per battle. Uh, the hit rolls made with this weapon can never generate additional hits, um, such as, uh, and if the bearer is engaged with it in, in wanton destruction, uh, when an attack is made with this weapon, um, if a hit is scored, it does the following. Um 
So if the target suffers D3 mortal wounds and the attack sequence ends, if the target contains 11 or more models, or the bearer is engaged in wanton destruction, the target suffers D3 plus 3 mortal wounds and the attack sequence ends, and until the end of the battle, subtract 1 from the toughness characteristic of models in that target unit. So basically you need to do a ton of mortal wounds. Um, it's alright. It's alright, pretty good. Could be quite cheeky, I think. But in the right time and place. Absolutely. So by the looks of things, some interesting relics in there. Again, apologies that we didn't necessarily go through all of them, although as those of us who, or rather those of you who listen to us do this often enough, you know we don't do that anyway, so that's not a great change. Um, let's talk about Dark Hereticus Discipline, um, which I assume is a psychic thing. Yes, yes uh, there's is. two. There's Dark Hereticus, which, uh, and there's the Malefic uh, Discipline, um, at the top, you've got three uh, faction-specific ones. So, Skeons of or Seons of uh, Fate is for Zinch. Uh, Putrid Miasma is for Nurgle, and Delightful Agonies is for Slanesh. And then we've got six. So, if you wanted, we could roll for. It if you don't want to read them all, uh, we've got six actual um, psychic powers that are generic. The first three can only be given to uh, cultists that are psychers. Whereas the sort of generic legionnaire space means have access to all six. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I reckon let's do two D3s worth. Let's do the one that uh, cultists can use and then follow it up with the ones that uh, Chaos Space Marines can use. So first of all, the cultists variant. You rolled a... A four. That will be... Prescience. Prescience. Uh, blessing. Has a warp charge value of seven if manifested, select one friendly legion unit within 18 of this psyker. Until the start of the next phase, each model in that unit makes an attack, add one to that attack's hit roll. So, very good. As good as it's ever been. Uh, and very interesting that the cultists uh, gain access to that because that will be very useful for them. Yeah, yeah indeed. And then my roll oh, is a two, which is prescience on a d6. No, 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 no. You, it, it's death hex because we're using the next. We're doing the D3 for four to six, as it were. Oh, right. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, You see what we're doing now? Yes. Okay. I do. Uh, then, so it's Defex, it's Malediction. It's a warp charge value of eight, so quite high. Uh, if manifested, select one enemy unit within 12 of this Psyker until the start of the next Psychic phase. Models in that unit cannot use invulnerable saves. What? That is no wonder why it's warp charge value of eight. That is... Yeah, it's strong. Bonkers, good. Uh, it's within 12 inches, not visible to. So that is that is strong. You just need something that buffs your um, buffs your actual psychic test so you can pull it off. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, yeah. the range is pretty low, so that's definitely a considerable uh, Yeah, you, you've got to sort of assume I'm going to cast this and then I'm going to probably charge into combat with a unit next to this character basically mm. but no I love it I mean pretty great so the next lot is the Malefic Discipline film yep. uh, is this the same stipulation so as the first uh, D3 yeah in terms of the cultists it is yep. um, alright so the first D3 for numbers 1 through 3 it's a 5 in which case we've got Cursed Earth Blessing uh, a warp charge value of 7 if manifested uh, until the start of your next psychic phase, while a friendly Legion Demon Kin, Legion Demon Engine, uh, within six of this psyker, Demon Kin and Demon Engine models in that unit have a four plus invulnerable save. I believe demons normally have a five yep. plus invulnerable save, so that's one better. Uh, and each time an enemy unit finishes a charge move with an engagement range of that unit, roll 1d6. On a two to four, that enemy unit suffers one mortal wound, and on a five plus, that unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. Ooh. Really good. No. That's a that's That'll a solid power. Make you think twice about charging them. No, yeah, no big time. I like that a lot. Uh, and then my one was a two, so that's uh, possession. Uh, so it's witch fire has a warp charge value of six. If manifest, select one enemy unit within nine inches of uh, and visible to the psyker. Roll one d six, adding one to the result. If the psychic test was an unmodified ten plus. If the result is greater than the unit's toughness characteristic, one model in that unit selected by your opponent is destroyed. Then, if that unit has not been destroyed, the unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. 
Mm-hmm. That could be pretty devastating against any like super elite units or even vehicles that are squadrons. Yeah. Because you just straight up kill a model. Yeah, pretty much. That's pretty rare in the game when, when that happens. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you, you've got to get a good role for it, but. No, of course. But, but saying that, even killing aggressors, right? Like, that's going to be pretty good. Or Blade Guard. Yeah, I just kill one. Great. And then they suffer D3 more wounds on top, so I'm potentially killing two of them. Like, um. Or I imagine obliterators. They're they're like big chunky models. How many wounds have they got? Oh, I can't remember with the obliterators. That's a chaos space marine. Well, exactly. If you're doing chaos on chaos, oh, but, but, chaos, they're, on chaos. but they're like a unit. They're likewise, sentinels, um, grot tanks, that sort of thing are all um, squads, but quite um, quite chunky, chunky stuff. Um, mm. no, there's definitely some interesting potential with that one for sure. I mean, it looks like they've got some really solid psychic powers by the looks of things. I mean, uh, obviously, we haven't gone for all of them just now. Yeah, but uh, even uh, obliterators have, seeing, have five wounds and are only toughness five. Um, yeah, so you've got a good chance of just outright killing one. Yeah, nice, incredible. Mm, that's pretty good. Prayers to the dark gods, Phil. That's a thing. So yet again, there's a series of extra words at the start. Um, so basically, dark zealotry, if this player is heard, sorry, if this prayer is heard, uh, then while the friendly legion core, legion cultist, legion character unit, when six of this preach, each time uh, the model in that unit makes a melee attack, you can re-roll the hit roll. Uh, so that's dark zealotry. Um, there's also uh, raffle... Uh, Eternity. Uh, no, entreaty. No, entreaty. Um, a bunch of other crazy words. Mutating in, innovation, in, invocation, in, invocation, blissful F- devotion, and, be- and beseechment, and yeah, blissful devotion. So each one is specific. These are the uh, god-specific ones, and then on yes, the right yes. hand side, you've got your generic D six, uh, and likewise cultists. Um, just get the first D three. Well. Let's just quickly read through the god specific ones. So, corn uh, is a corn character unit within six of this priest each time a model and that unit makes an attack. It is considered to be engaged in wanton destruction, wanton massacre, and wanton slaughter for that attack. So it gets all three. That's good. If only space means had that from a chaplain, that'd be cool. Um, well, they get it for two CP. Mm, yes. There's a 2CP strat where you get put them in all their doctrines at once. Anyway, yes. next one. Uh, mutating invocation. Um, so if a friendly Zinch um, prayer is done, a Zinch core or Zinch character unit within three inches of the priest, roll 1d6 uh, each time a modern that unit would lose a wound on a 6 plus, it's not lost. So 6 plus, feel no pain. It's okay. We've got a Nurgle one, which is the feculent uh, beseechment or whatever it's called. Um, stuff within six of this priest, add one to the toughest characteristics of the models in that unit. It's all right. I mean, pretty good on stuff that's already pretty tough to begin with. <laughs> yes. Maybe there's something Over- to be said maybe. first. Yeah, squads of bikes or something, I guess. Becoming toughness six would mm. be quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, blissful uh, devotion is the last one. Uh, so if it's herd selector friendly, slanish core, or slanish character within six of the priest, it's eligible to declare a charge in turn which is it's advanced, which is very good. It does exactly what slanish wants to do, and that is to get into combat quick, smart. Love it. Should... All right, let's do a D3, follow D3. So we're going to do the one, two, three. I've rolled a two. So that is one, uh, the benediction of darkness. Uh, this prayer is heard. And while the friendly thing is within six of the priest, each time range attacks is made against that unit, it is treated as having the benefits of light cover against that attack. Ooh. And the four, which is... Um, the five. The five. Assault terror portent. 
Um, if this prayer is heard, select one friendly Legion core, Legion cultist or Legion character unit within six of the priest. Each time a modern that unit makes a melee attack, add one to the attack's wound rolls, which is very good. Plus one to wound is strong. Agreed. Let's smash out these warlord traits. There's six of them, so we may as well tell everyone what each of them is. Oh, I enjoyed um, rolling the dice, but you're right. Let's do that. For warlord traits, well, I feel like we can probably do all six yeah. of them. It seems only reasonable. So... Flames of Spite. Each time this Warlord makes a melee attack, you can re-roll uh, that attack's wound roll. And each time this Warlord makes an attack on an unmodified wound roll of six, the target suffers one mortal wound in addition to any normal damage. So you're both re-rolling your wound rolls, and if you happen to roll a six, they're doing water wounds. Nice. Real good. Real, real good. Fish for those sixes. Um, oh, mate, yeah, all day. That's oof. Oof. Uh, the next, and that's assuming that you're not wielding some bonkers weapon like the black mace. <laughs> yeah, indeed. you know, all of a sudden you're going to be doing like all sorts of flipping wounds everywhere. That is true. Mortal wounds spilling over damage. Wah! It's incredible. That could be good. Uh, yeah, the next one is unholy fortitude. Uh, each time a warlord would lose a wound, roll a d6 on a five plus. It's not lost. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's all right, I guess, but we already know that there's a... Um... No, it's called as Flames of Spite. Yeah, but there was a relic, or not? was there a relic that gave it Feel, feel No Pain, or was it just... Uh, I think that was for Demon Engines. Um, that we yes, at. yes, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Anyway, still, good. Hatred Incarnate. Each time this Warlord fights, if it made a charge move or performed a heroic intervention this turn, so the, that fight is resolved at one to the strength and attacks characteristic of this Warlord. Each time this Warlord makes a melee attack, you can re-roll that attack's hit roll. <gasps> That's also very good. That's a good Warlord trait right there. Yeah. Uh, next one is Lord of Terror. It's an aura ability. Uh, while an enemy unit is within six inches, each time a morale test is taken for that unit, your opponent must roll one additional d6 and discard the lowest result. If the unit fails a morale test, until the end of that phase, it's considered to be below half strength for the purposes of combat attrition tests. Obviously, that's a good one to combo with the Night Lords. Well, I don't think so. It would have been had it offered you just a little extra minus uh, to leadership. If it gave like an additional minus one to people's leadership, I'd be on board with it. Without that, it doesn't feel nearly as awesome. True. And they might have another uh, Warlord trait that we've not we didn't see that does that. Um, but the fact that it, you're doing combat attrition tests uh, half simp means you're effectively failing on one and two. Um, although I felt like they had something like that already baked into their profile. Yeah, they add plus one to those rolls as well. So you're failing on freeze. Yeah, so that is pretty good. Not bad. Uh, you did Lords of Terror, didn't I? I'll do the yep. next one. Uh, the Eternal uh, Vendetta. It's an aura at the start of the first battle round before the first turn begins. So that one enemy unit until the end of the battle, while a friendly Legion core or Legion character unit is within six of this Warlord each time model in that Legion unit makes an attack against that enemy unit, you can re-roll that attack's wound rolls. Good. It's up. Assuming there's something big that you want to kill. It's old grudges. Not as good as Flames of Spite. Yeah. Yeah. Not as good as the three first ones we've read out, but the... better than Lord of Terror, I'd say. <clears throat> True. Uh, and then the last one is Gaze of the Gods. Uh, this warlord has a 4 plus invulnerable save. And each time this warlord makes an attack is considered to be in Wanton Slaughter, Destruction and Massacre. So it's in all three all the time. Um, which is nice. That's pretty crazy. So Abaddon has three warlord traits apparently. He's got the Internal Vendetta which is here. Then he's also got Paragon of Hatred. Uh, a merciless overseer, which was warlord traits that were visible Black in Libby, earlier. Black- uh, not Black Library, Black Legion. Should we quickly yeah. go through those ones? Just, nah. Uh, well, it's interesting <laughs> to know what he does, right? Because we're obviously going to go through his data sheet. That is true. That um, is true. Go on then. So, so the first one is Paragon of Hatred. What's that do? So that is you can re-roll the charge rolls for the warlord, and each time uh, he fights and he's within engagement range of an enemy unit, then until that's resolved, you get plus one attacks uh, to the warlord. Um, if any of the enemy units that have the Imperium keyword, you add D3 instead. Um, Eternal Vendetta was the one that we uh, just read out where you get to re-roll. Then Merciless re-rolls. Overseer. The Merciless Overseer is in your command phase, you can select one friendly Black Legion unit within six inches 
Um, until the start of your next command phase, each time a model in that unit would make an attack. Uh, if your army is engaged in uh, wanton destruction or slaughter, you're in massacre instead, which is weirdly the one we picked when we went through them. Um, which is all right. Yeah, that's interesting to know. Nice. So some interesting warlord traits in there for sure. I mean, obviously we didn't go into every single one of the warlord traits that were legion specific, so we've probably missed some potentially strong synergies and and, and options there. But I think we can already start to get a feel uh, for what is available to these guys. And that is to say, they're pretty good, I would say. I think already going through these abilities and these uh, skills, powers, whatever you want to call them, I can already feel like I can assert that there's a lot of fun, interesting synergies that we as players could explore with this uh, with this army. And that's obviously before we talked about the stratagems. Exactly. So, so we can flick. Let's do that, eh? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, um, we're going to talk about the stratagems. What were you going to uh, say? Just, let's flip back to page 108, which is where the generic uh, stratagems are. There they be. So how are we going to do this? The usual kind of thing. We're going to pick some colours and go through them. So two of each, yeah. What one one each from each for both of us, blah, 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 resulting in two from each section, as it were. Um, you said the last things on the last one, so I will do the first one on this one, and I'm going to go with... Hatred Eternal. Use this stratagem at the end of the shooting phase. It's 2CP... Um, or you can use it at the end of the fight phase. Select one Legionnaire's unit from your army. If it is the shooting phase, that unit can shoot again. <laughs> if it is the fight phase, that unit can, with an engagement with an enemy unit, it can fight again. Wow. Wow. Double shooting, double fighting, 2CP. You don't even need to be uh, Slanesh. No, they've they've made that rather awesome. Good, I like that. That is a win. Well done, then. What blue will you pick, Phil? Um, I'm going to go for the old classic uh, Death to the False Emperor for 1 CP. Beautiful. Uh, and what is that? Use this strategy in the fight phase when a traitor Astartes unit from your army is selected to fight until the end of the phase each time a heretical Astartes unit from, sorry, model from your unit makes a melee attack against an Adeptus Astartes or Santic Astartes, which I believe is Grey Knights. Um, you can re-roll the hit roll. And that's obviously nice. full re-rolls, so that's pretty good. Moving over to the Browns, the Greater Sorcerer, 1 CP. Use this stratagem at the start of your Psychic phase. Select one uh, Treacherous Astartes Zench Psyker uh, from your army. Then select one of the following rules to apply to that unit. That unit can attempt to manifest one additional Psychic power. That unit can attempt to perform one Psychic action and attempt to manifest one psychic power this Ooh, phase that's pretty good very good yeah very good there's not a lot like that to do psychic powers and psychic um actions, actions. so that is yeah. that's very good strong um i'm gonna go for blasphemous machines it's two cp or one cp uh use a stratagem in your command phase select one traitor's astartes machine spirit or traitor astartes demon engine model from your army that has a wound characteristics of 10 or more until the start of your next command phase that model is considered to have its full wounds remaining for the purposes of determining what characteristics it is on its profile. Uh, if it's Titanic, it costs two. Otherwise, it costs one CP, which is basically fight on top bracket for your vehicles, which is pretty good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's a pretty strong thing, especially when they've got toughness nine land raiders, for goodness sakes. Ooh, um, yeah. Yeah. Very, uh, very durable, and then ever so slightly more efficient as a result. Um, so, yeah, well done then. Uh, the reds are relatively standard. Usually it's give yourself another wall or trait, give yourself another relic. Uh, there is a third one, which seems to be called Trophies of the Lord. I wall. think this you... is give your sergeants um, special abilities. Um... Fine. Let's move to the greens and uh, not worry about those. Uh, contempt over caution, 1 CP or 2 CP, depending on variables, which I will explain momentarily. Use the strategy in the shooting phase. Select one Legion core unit from your army that is not within engagement range uh, until the end of the phase. Models in that Legion unit 
uh, can target that enemy unit, even if their enemy unit is within engagement range of other friendly units, provided those friendly units are Legion units. Each time a model in that Legion unit makes an attack against enemy unit that you cannot reroll the hit roll. And on an unmodified hit roll of one, that attack scores a hit against one friendly Legion unit of your choice within engagement range of that enemy unit. Instead, uh, resolve any attacks against friendly units after resolving any attacks that hit that enemy unit. If all the Legion units are within engagement range of the enemy unit you selected were cultists, this strategy will cost one, otherwise it costs two. So basically you can shoot at stuff that's in engagement range, it costs one CP if that unit happens to be a cultist unit, Brilliant. and two CP if it's space marines. Um, or like, something we don't it. care if the cultists die. Yeah, 100%. Which, again, really nice, flavoursome rule that reflects exactly how you would imagine Chaos Space Marines would function. So well done, them. I like that. That gets a yes, that is good. 100%. However, here's a thing that I feel like is where we get the weird issues with the stratagem system, because really, I just sort of feel like that would just have been a fun thing that they should have just baked into the army. Cultist units can be shot at by your own guys. Um, I think that yeah, because there uh, is like a negative downside to it as well. So. Yeah, exactly. I think like rather than make it a strat that you could do against your you know Chaos Space Marine buddies, just make it a generic thing that just cultists have, which is you can shoot at them, which I think would work absolutely brilliantly. That's true. But hey ho, there you go. Stratagems is the way. So um, yeah. What's your pick uh, of the green? Because I am favouring cultists, I'm going for another cultist uh, one. So I'm going for Tide of Traitors for one CP. Use this stratagem in your command phase. Select one cultist mob unit from your army that is either within six inches of a battlefield edge or within your deployment zone. Up to D3 plus three destroyed models can be added back to that unit. These return models cannot be set up with an engagement range of any enemy units unless they are enemy units that are already within engagement range of that cultist mob. Pretty cool. Fair enough. Yeah. The green ones seem like they've got some interesting stuff within them. Um, well, maybe we should do one more each yeah. of the greens because they sound quite fun. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go for excessive cruelty because that sounds like fun. Everyone likes a bit of excessive cruelty. Uh, use a stratagem when an enemy unit within engagement range of a treacherous Aslati's Slanish unit from your army uh, falls back. After that enemy unit has finished that move, select one traitor Astarte Slanish unit from your army that the enemy unit was within engagement range when this stratagem was used. The Slanish unit can either consolidate up to three or, if it is no longer within engagement range of any enemy units, shoot as if it were your shooting phase. Uh, if the selected Slanish unit shoots... It can only target the enemy unit that fell back uh, and only if it is eligible an, an eligible target. So use the strategy when the enemy unit, right, unit army fell back. But falling back... Oh, okay, fine, yeah. So, you know, I'm remembering how this game works now. Sorry, again, I'm getting some heresy nonsense in my head. So falling back is just when they opt to leave combat yes, with you, right? Yeah. Because obviously you're Slanesh, so because you're Marcus Slanesh, you're going to go first in the ensuing combat. So you're going to break the trend that um, normally happens, which is if you stay in combat, they punch you first. But because you're Slanesh, you'll go first unless they have an ability that either makes you fight last or allows them to fight first. Um, and then ultimately, yeah. So that's a really interesting build. So you run in, you fight, and then obviously they're incentivized to leave. But in the doing of that, you shoot them as they run away. Yeah. Yeah, which that's, is pretty strong good. for TCP, and obviously I'm loving these. Can... These are good. Yeah. These are really fun. Like they're just yeah. All right, no, well done, Games Workshop. This is yes. All right, another one. Nice. I'm going for Warp Born Foresight uh, for two CP. Use a stratagem at the end of a reinforcement step of your opponent's movement phase. Interesting. Um, select one Traitorous Astarte Zinch unit from your army that is not within engagement range of any enemy units. Then select one enemy unit that is within 12 inches of that unit that was set up as reinforcements. 
this turn. Uh, that Zinch unit can shoot as if it was your shooting phase, but if it does so, the models in the unit can only be eligible to target the enemy unit. Uh, so it's basically all spec scan. But for 2CP, is all spec scan 2CP? I feel like it's one. Yes. Oh, is it? It's a lot. It's two now, yeah, but they remo- it used to be that you had minus one to hit, right. but they removed that. Okay, so it is full um, ballistic skills. That makes sense. I, it's quite kind of fun that it's themed to Zinchoni. And, mm, so yeah. mm. We'll move on to the greys. These are relatively standard, so uh, pretty universal ones, but we'll go for them all the same. Um, so we've got demon shells is the one I'm going to go for. So this stratagem is used in your shooting phase when a traitor Astartes unit from your army is selected to shoot until the end of phase, add six to the range characteristic all bolt weapons uh, models in that unit equipped with. And each time a model in that unit makes a ranged attack with a bolt weapon, improve the armor's penetration characteristic by one. Real strong mm. from NCP. Yeah. Real strong. That's good. Being able to increase your AP and obviously the range, all very, very good. Yeah. yeah, that's that's not bad for 1CP. Nice. Uh, and then I'm going to go for Infernal Engine for 2CP or 1CP. Uh, use a stratagem in your opponent's shooting phase or the fight phase when a Traitorous Astartes Demon Engine model from your army is selected as the target of an attack. Until the end of a phase, each time an attack is allocated to that model, subtract one from the damage characteristic. Uh, if a model has the Titanic keyword, this stratagem costs 2CP. Otherwise, it costs one. So basically, you can pretend you are a Contemptor Dreadnought, um, or any Dreadnought, in fact, um, as a for CP. Yeah, that, that's, it's cool that it also works on Titanic units. Maybe the Lord of Skulls. Is that a demon engine? I'd assume it is. Yeah, well, the Lord of Skulls, I think, is both a demon engine. Oh, it is. And- it is. And it is Titanic. So maybe, I mean, that was actually going to be one of my picks when we go through the... Um, data sheets just to see if it's any good well fun story phil we're doing data sheets right now so Huzzah! talk to me about this here lord of skulls the corner lord of skulls uh, did you see that incredible conversion i sent you the uh the other day where it was a guy who did one of these but on like spider legs oh i think i did actually yeah oh incredible i, I think i i think i know that chap yeah i oh, do you um Oh, yes. Not well enough to know the name. Well, the name eludes me right now. I'm sure I he was my first ever... Kevin? No, I want to say Mark, but I don't Bert. think it is. It could be. Mark. All right, we'll go be. with Mark. Pretend it's Mark, even if it's not. And yeah, I cheers, apologise if I am completely wrong. Um, but yeah, I'm sure I, he was my first ever opponent at uh, No Retreat. Uh, at the very, very first one, which is going back uh, quite a few years. I think he's the one that did that conversion that you sent me. I think. It's incredible. Well done, Mark. You're very good, um, if that is your real name. Um, anyway, tell us about the model uh, or the unit or the thing. Yeah, so he's got a degrading stat line. So he's got a movement of 10 <sighs> that goes down to 8 and then 6. He's got a weapon skill and ballistic skill of 3+, plus, so it's a degrade to 4 and 5+, plus. strength 8, toughness 8, 30 wounds, uh, 6 attacks, which degrades to 7 and then 8, so it goes up. Um, leadership 8 and a 2 plus save he's equipped with a gore storm cannon hades gatling cannon and a great cleaver of corn um the gore cannon may be replaced with one of the following so a demon gore cannon or an ichor cannon and the hades gatling cannon can be replaced with one skull hurler so the uh, demon gore cannon is range 18 inches, heavy D6, strength 10, minus 4, D3 plus 3 damage, which is pretty tasty, and it has the blast. The Gorestorm cannon is 24 inches, heavy 3 D3, strength 9, minus 2, uh, flat 3 damage with blast as well. The Hades Gatlin cannon is 48 inches, heavy 12, strength 8, minus 3, flat 2 damage. That is a that's basically a, currently a battle cannon an imperial guard battle cannon but you do flat 12 shots that's bonkers um the ichor cannon is 48 inch range heavy d6 plus three uh strength seven minus three ap two damage and blast and then the skull hurler is 60 inches that is the length of the table uh heavy 2d6 strength 10 minus three three damage 
with Blast. And then lastly, you've got the Great Cleaver of Corn, so you get to pick one of the two profiles. You can smash. If you want to smash something, it's a melee weapon with times two strength, uh, which is, what, 14? No, 16. Uh, 16 strength, yeah. minus four AP, uh, flat six damage. Uh, it's like a chain fist, brilliant. Um, or you can slash. If you're slashing, it's a melee weapon with strength user, which is strength eight, minus three, two damage, and you make three hit rolls instead of one. Um, he's got let galaxy burn and the demon engine keywords. Um, he when he explodes on a roll of a six, anything within two d six suffers d six mortal wounds. So he is going to go go boom boom when he blows up. Um, then the titanic demon engine rules means he's eligible to clear a charge in turn in which it fell back. Each time this model makes a normal move, advances or fallbacks, it can be moved across other models, excluding monsters and vehicles, effectively like a knight. Um, and when it does so, it can be moved within engagement range, but cannot finish a move within engagement range. And then lastly, he's got Unstoppable Wrath. Uh, this model can make attacks with blast weapons against units within engagement range. Oh, that's really cool. Um, each time a model attacks uh, is made by this model against an enemy unit within engagement range, add one to the attack's hit roll. Wait, what? Um, each time a ranged attack is made by this model against an enemy. So normally you would minus uh, a, a hit, in, but actually you plus it. And I guess that's regardless of whether it's got blast or not. Seemingly so, yeah. Wow, that's really good. I sort of wish all blast weapons just had that because it makes more sense that it's much easier to hit when in combat rather than harder to hit. Um, and the fact is you can't normally do blast weapons in combat at all. So that is, I don't know, that seems like a lot of actually really cool stats. I don't know how many points it is. I imagine it's quite expensive. Uh, it's 570 odd. So it's expensive, but... It's not that expensive. It's it's uh, more wounds than a uh, Castellan, uh, which is the, the the big knight variant. So the um, Poon and uh, Castellan variants. It's got more wounds than that. Um, it's got more movement uh, than that. It's got uh, the same save as that. It's got more attacks. It's got better guns. It, it's it's. It's incredible. It's a very, yeah. very good. I mean, unit. obviously, it doesn't have all of those weapons because you, you've got to swap some out. But even so, that is pretty solid as a thing. It, and 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 it costs the same amount of points regardless of which weapon you give it. I would probably give it the Skull Hurler over the uh, Gatling Cannon. I think the Gatling Cannon having the fixed twelve is good, um, but Strength Eight minus three two damage is not as appealing to me as the strength 10 flat free damage. I uh, yeah, I know what you mean cuz flat 2 there's so much minus 1 damage, mm. but I mean if you want to just kill a marine that is going to do it. 12 shots. You're wounding on twos unless they transhuman of course. Um minus 3, I well, actually that's only minus 2 because of, you know, arm of yeah, contempt. Yeah, yeah. So save, saving yeah, on fives. Terrain, so they're getting four up saves. Oh god. Yeah. Um, but then, if you if they fail the saves, you're just killing them outright. Um, so that's true. true. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah so all, all solid. Like all those options seem just crazy good. Um, oh, I love him. Yeah, I what, I, think, I wonder I've... what they will do with the Forge World variant because that's a, a legged upgrade of this. Mm, if because mm. that one's always been historically the better um, of the choices. Looking, it, it's Michael. That's his name. It's Michael. I think you said his name was Michael. No, I, Mac. I said Mark, I think. I said it was Michael. Oh, Mark. I knew you it go. began yeah. with an M. Anyway, you were saying. Um, yeah, because that one's always been perceived as like the better version. Uh, it looks whether better, because it's of never the lips. actually been the rules. Oh, okay. Oh, well, it has, at one point, the rules were actually better as well. But I get the feeling that if you do own the Katan variant or whatever it's called, the Kaitan, Kaitan, Kutan. Kaitan, yeah, yeah. It's something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. If you own that variant, you'd probably just turn around and go, tell you what, it's just the Lord of Skulls now. <laughs> yeah, you could do it quite easily. I mean, it very much is a Lord of Skulls. It's just a Lord of Skulls with legs. It's got all the same stuff. It's just got legs. So, um, mate, no, I love that. That is a, um, that is a brutal, brutal thing. Um... On the topic of uh, demon engines, I'm going to talk about Defilers. Um, because Defilers are 
the you know red-headed stepchild of the uh, the Chaos Space Marine range, uh, a strange hangover of a kind of forgotten era when um, you know they made these really janky models. Um, I don't know now if the Defiler comes with a base or not. I don't know whether they've gotten around to thinking to themselves, you know what, well, we probably should put this thing oh, on a base. I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. I think it's still kind of weird, wobbly, massive leg span craziness. Um, yeah, so there's the Defiler. So, yeah. I mean, I remember when the Defiler was the new hotness, so it's worth um, it's worth talking about it for that reason alone. So it's got a movement of eight, which makes sense because it's like, you know, spidery crab-like movement eight. Checks out. Weapon skill, ballistical three, strength eight, which is no slouch. Toughness seven, 14 wounds, five attacks, which again is real good. Leadership eight and a three plus save. It degrades as it goes along, but you don't need to hear me talk to you about that. It's got a defiler cannon, a reaper auto cannon, twin heavy flamers and defiler claw. Uh, the defiler cannon is a demolisher cannon. No, it's heavy a D6. battle cannon. Sorry, battle cannon. My apologies. Oh yeah, because demolisher cannons are strength 10, yep. aren't they? Yeah, sorry. So it's strength eight minus two flat damage free. Very good with a range of 72 that you'll never, ever have to utilize in its yeah. entirety. So, so it's this is the one where it now matches the, I think it was when the Death Guard Codex came out, they had updated the Defiler in there. And obviously it Correct. was a battle cannon, but it went from D3 damage to flat free damage. So all the guard players got quite excited. Um, so it feels like it's just been updated to reflect probably the data sheet uh, going all the way back to when they redid the um, Death Guard. Then you've got the Defiler Claw, which is the only real kind of like Defiler-specific weapon in addition to the cannon, uh, which is Strength times 2, so Strength 16. Uh, minus 3 AP, D6 damage. It's a shame that it's D6 damage rather than D3 plus 3. If it was D3 plus 3, it'd be terrifying. Mm, yeah, I know what you mean. I get the feeling they've given it D6 to keep it in line with, I guess, what it was in the Zench Nurgle Books, variants. Yeah, I think now they things. might have tweaked it to be his uh, d3 plus three or uh, yeah. a, a, a flat free damage maybe or something but otherwise it's lets the galaxy burn demon engine and explodes and it is heretic or astartes slash legion so you can assign whatever legion keywords and things you want to it how many points is a defiler that's a question that needs answering heavy support the defiler 165 points. It's pretty good for 165 points. Yeah. Very it's good for 165 a, points. It's probably cheaper than a Lehman Russ. Does, has the same, no, has better shooting than a Lehman Russ. In fact, his shooting is almost as good as a tank commander. A tank commander can have reroll ones to hit. Um, but it also has a Lima close... Russes are insanely durable though and this guy's only tough so, at 7 with 3 up save true but it's got a few more wounds true but you've got toughness 8 2 plus and armour of contempt okay this guy's got armour of contempt as well yes but true okay. but yeah if you were going on base data sheets it's just got a better toughness and because the save was 3 plus um, but you're yeah. right but now it's a 2 plus with armour of contempt which just made him quite good yeah yeah, yeah. The point is, though, I mean, what you should compare this to is the Redemptor Dreadnought, right? And it compares quite favourably to a Redemptor Dreadnought. Um, it's less durable than a Redemptor Dreadnought because it doesn't have the minus one um, damage, mm -hmm. but it does have a five-up invun for being a demon engine. And obviously you can then combo that with the whole um, ability where you could improve its invun to a four plus. Uh, you could give it a mark of Zench, so the first damage it takes is zero. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's got some, it's, oh wait, hang on. No, it's not core. So you couldn't actually give it a mark as inch. I apologize for that statement. So you can't give it a mark, but yeah, still pretty good though. Still pretty good. I'm, uh, I'm digging it. What are you going to pick, Phil? Are we going to move away from the big engines? Or are uh, gonna stay in I'm going to move to the biggest of the engines, Abaddon the Despoiler. Um, so he has a movement of six inches, a weapon skill, ballistic skill of two plus, strength and toughness of six, wounds nine, eight attacks, leadership eleven, and two plus save. He's equipped with Drachnaia, uh, the Talon of Horus, and you can obviously include one of him. So the Talon of Horus, 
Um, I have to say, it's a bit weird when they do this, and they did it on one of the other profiles, uh, Human Black Heart. So Talon of Horus shooting is the first one listed. Second one, you'd expect it to be Talon of Horus melee, but it's not. It's Track uh, and then Talon of Horus melee. Um, it's because they do all the shooting stuff, followed by all the close combat weapons uh, in alphabetical order, which is why weapons that have both shooting and melee profiles get split up and they're in different places it's a bit confusing but it has a logic built into it which is a bit odd i just thought i'd point that out uh yeah so turns of horror shooting is a 24 inch range assault four strength five minus one two damage nothing to really you know sniff out really nothing great um it's Close combat variants is strength users, so strength six, minus four, pretty good, only one damage. Uh, but each time you make an attack with this weapon, it makes two hit rolls instead of one. So that's pretty good, because that is a bucket of attacks. And then Draknian is a melee weapon. It's plus three, uh, six, nine, strength nine. That's pretty good. Minus four AP, flat free damage. And each time an attack is made with this weapon on an unmodified wound roll of six, the target suffers D3 mortal wounds in addition to any normal damage. That could be quite a lot as well um, because you've got so many attacks. He's got let the galaxy burn. He's got warp strike, which means he can deep strike. Um, He's got mark of the ascendant. So each time this model makes a melee attack, if he made a charge move, was charged, or performed a heroic intervention, add plus one to the strength characteristic of that attack, which is pretty cool. Um, so you can go up with Dragon into strength 10. That is really good. Uh, once per turn, the first time a saving throw is failed for this model, the damage characteristic of that attack is changed to zero. So like that... Um, I, get, I get the feeling he's got all of the marks wrapped into one. Yes. So I think that's what this is doing. Yes. Uh, let, let me keep reading them just because I forgot. No, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But, but you're right. I was just about to say it's similar to that Slanish thing earlier, but it was the mark of chaos. Uh, each time an attack is made against this model, if the strength characteristic of that attack equals or is at least double the toughness characteristic, subtract one from the attack's wound roll. That's the Nurgle mark. And then if this model starts with a fight phase with engagement range, he fights first. Um, which was the uh, Slanish one. Yes, that's the Slanish yes, one. Yes, it was the Zinch one that had the um, term of damage characteristics zero. So, I mean, that that hit that ability alone makes him super durable. Uh, he's got uh, durable, Dark yeah. Destiny, so he's got a four plus in vulnerable save. In addition, the model can't lose more than three wounds in the same phase. Any wounds that would be lost after that are not lost. I mean, that is incredibly low. Just three wounds per phase. Is that the same for Gazgol? I thought uh, it was. I think even I think Gaz is four. I thought it was four. I think that's the same as a Catan. Yeah, the, the Catans are uh, free. I, 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 as are Phoenix Lords as well for the uh, for the Eldari. Yeah, so yeah, I mean you can kill him over three phases if you can do maximum damage uh, each time, but. Bearing in mind that the first bit of damage you do to him is reduced to zero. Yeah. yeah. He's toughness like six or something you uh, t- or Toughness just... six base, yeah. Um, Mad. But yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, and then uh, he's got the Warmaster rule. So if your army is Battleforged, this model must be your Warlord. Um, if more than one model from your army has a rule to this effect, then one of those models must be your Warlord. Um if this model is your warlord, it gains the agent of chaos keyword, which effectively means that he can actually go in any kind of the legion detachment that you want. Um, the despoiler aura ability. So uh, while a friendly chaos core unit is within six inches of this model, add one to the charge rolls made for that unit. Each time a model in that unit makes an attack, re-roll the wound roll of one. Um, and then he's got the Lords of the Traitor Legion. In your command phase, select one friendly heretical Astartes core or heretical Astartes character unit from within six. Um, and so the start of your next command phase, each time a model in that unit makes an attack, you can re-roll the hit roll if that unit is uh, Black Legion. You can also re-roll the wound roll. Okay, so that's an interesting one. So he's kind of got uh, a baked in sort of captain slash chapter master. Um, but the the but also as a sergeant as well. So that's, um, yeah, it's pretty good. But then you'd expect him to be. Uh, then he's just got all the keywords um, in terms of like all the, all, all the gods. 
and uh, everything else. So he's a supreme commander as well. If you were taking a supreme commander detachment, I guess that's the only way you can take him, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well is actually, it not no. Just he's a, a yeah. he's but he just has a normal HQ uh, icon. Yeah, but if he's a supreme commander, it means he can go in a separate supreme command detachment, which then can be added to other uh, armies. Um, right, so it's okay. basically how you get around that. Basically, basically, he's a he's the same as a Primarch, effectively. Although I think even Gilliman at the moment is a Lord of War. Um, but look, long story short, Abaddon's really good. Um, I know, right? Mad. Um, almost too good. But um, I don't know. He doesn't seem busted good. I mean, this is just me looking at it. I'm sorry. What? I mean, are you are you are you wrong? Right. Here's the thing. Like <laughs> his shooting. Is crap like that? Is his combat prowess? Oh, no. is, is brilliant, but that's kind of what you expect him to be. Um, here's the thing though, Phil he's an infantry character with movement, right? He's not a monster, true. He's an infantry character, which basically within the confines of Ninth Edition 40k makes him obscenely optimal. He interacts with terrain. Can't get get shot at because walls, and then turns up and will essentially delete something, and then will require the entire focus of your entire army to maybe, if you get lucky, kill him. Yeah, I, I'm because I'm a bit upset. The one thing they have changed is they've removed the effectively the demon weapon ability from Drachnian, which used to be baked into the profile. So it used to be yeah. like on a roll of a one, he'd do damage to himself and couldn't attack with with that. So it's a bit of a shame. Um, but that would make him not as good, Phil. Must be good. I know. If it was quite formatic. And didn't it? He used to do also extra attacks, but now he's just got a yeah, ton yeah, of attacks. Yeah, he used attacks. to do D6 extra attacks, but if you rolled a one, it hurt. Yeah. So it's a bit, I kind of miss that. And it's like, why not have it in there? But maybe people would be like, oh, it's not optimal to take that because it's no, exactly. too random. They want, him, they want him to be insane, which is what he is. I'm going to talk about my favorite of all the new things that they've released for Chaos. Uh, and then I guess we're going to wrap this up, buddy, which is the dark. Communion, that is a beautiful HQ choice. Uh, an incredible selection of miniatures. Oh, yeah. Love them. But are they any good? But also, actually, in addition to this, continues in uh, the vein of what we were talking about earlier, Phil, which is the idea of a cultist-themed army. These are pretty cool. 100%. Um, so this is a squad of five cultist-based leader chaps. Uh, you've got one cult, uh gugu I don't know what that actually said. Do you want to try that? Demagogue. My man. One cult demagogue, one mind witch, one icon arch, and one, oh, sorry, two blessed blades. Um, So a cult uh, demo... Demagogue. Say again. Demagogue, not a demagogan. I mean, by all means, have a demagogan if you want. Uh, he's got an auto pistol, a communion stave, a mind which is equipped with close combat weapon, uh, an icon arch is equipped with auto pistol, each blessed blade is equipped with commune blade, every model is equipped with frag and crack grenades. Uh, the commune stave is strength user, which is strength three, minus one D3 damage, and the blade is strength user, minus three, two damage. Um, shame that they didn't give him plus one strength, but I understand. But, you know, double-handed weapon would have been cool. But anyway, there you go. Uh, ability, abilities, they've got Faithful Flock. Uh, while this unit contains a cult uh, demagogue <laughs> models, each time a round says it's taken for this unit, the test is automatically passed. That's what they need. That's what they need. Uh, and the Icon Arch, while friendly cultist units are within six of this unit's Icon Arch. Models add two to the leadership characteristics of models in that unit, and each time a model in that unit makes an attack, reroll, hit rolls of one. Strong. Uh, it's a priest, so it's basically uh, got all the dark zealotry stuff that you would come to expect from a dark apostle. So all the stuff we were saying about that earlier, uh, these guys have access to that. And they're also a psyker with access to psychic powers that we talked about earlier. Um, they are chaos Traitor Astartes, um, in terms of faction, 
one of them is a character. The Demigorg is a character. Uh, and then otherwise, the rest of them are not. So they've actually thought about it as well in the sense that the only one in the unit that will uh, give away any kind of assassination points is the main the main person. Oh, yeah, um, rather than classing them all as characters. Um, it's a bit weird. Which is what they did with Chapter uh, Chaplain Grimaldus, which, yeah. uh, which made that unit so ridiculous. Because I remember at one point, and I think they, they've undid it, but basically if a, if a unit had a character in it, the whole unit would be treated as if it had the character keyword. I don't think they do that anymore. But no, no. does his other three men protect him from lookout, sir? Because... No. So you can target the unit. Um, but you just so you get can target the, it's, four wounds to tank, basically. Well, you actually get uh, so the blessed blades are one wounds each. The icon arch is two wounds. Oh, actually, yeah. Um, sorry, so you get seven wounds to before your character gets uh, hit, basically. Yeah, and there's durable. potential for there's potential for some of that stuff not to quite spill over as much. And it's quite interesting though, because I suppose once he's reduced to just being himself on his own. He still gains a number of the, uh, the, you know, he still, well, he won't get the priest or psyker abilities, but he does automatically pass his morale chest, right? So he's not going to have to worry about running away. Mm. Um, And then um, when he's on his own, he just becomes a character. So he's still treated as all the rules for a character. So you could still look out to him. You could still, you know, use him in in that capacity, Um, which is super interesting. I, I, I just think it's a gorgeous unit. I think it's, a really interesting aspect of the flavor of Chaos Space Marines that definitely needed to be explored in more detail. Um, I also really like the new kind of like crazy possessed cultists as well. Where are they? I'm trying to look for them and I can't see them unless I've got pages stuck together again. I had them you've a got moment ago. The cursed cultists, but they're not. Are they the really crazily? Yeah, like, the accursed cultists. You're thinking of spawns. N- well, there was those new models. So you had the, the, yeah, they're spawns. the slightly creepy accursed cultists, which have yep. like in the picture. But then you had the the super like which are spawns. Were they just spawns? Just yeah, they're spawns now. Just regular spawns. Is that all they were? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they're new models for spawns. Oh, I thought they were a bit more interesting than that. But also, haven't no. Um, well, I've, mm, now you're asking me to actually consider because let me just look chaos spawn they've just used the old model for oh okay um in which case yeah there's something new altogether aren't they but it's a bit weird they're not in the book uh, i saw photos of them yeah they're called the accursed cultists uh the torments uh, are the most so they monstrous so right, okay. So you get the mutant and the torment, and that they're, they're part of the same unit. There you go. Right, okay. Can we go through them? Because I want to. Yeah, do do no, okay. please. Yes, let's, let's talk about them. Uh, so your mutants, uh, you have five to ten of those. Um, so they have more human-looking ones. So they are movement six. Weapon skill, uh, ballistic skill of four plus, uh, and which is the same for the torments. Uh, strength four, toughness four. One wound, two attacks, leadership six, and a six plus save. The torments have three to six of them. Uh, movement six inches, uh, four plus four plus four weapons go ballistic skill. Strength five, so plus one strength in comparison to the regular mutants. Uh, same toughness, toughness four. Three wounds though, so a lot more durable. And two D3 attacks, and they've got the same leadership six and a six plus save. Um, the unit cannot can take more than three torment models unless it also contains ten mutant models. Um, Okay, that's interesting. Every mutant model is equipped with a a blasphemous appendage, uh, and every torment model is equipped with a hideous mutation. So the blasphemous appendage is minus one AP, one damage, and the hideous mutations is minus two, two damage. So they're just like a kind of close combat unit, but they do have some extra abilities. So they've got a cursed horde. This unit cannot perform actions and cannot embark within transports. At the start of your command phase, you can select one of the following. Return up to three destroyed mutant models into this unit, or return one destroyed torment model to this unit with its full wounds remaining. That's really cool. Really cool. Um, it's got a fearsome aura. Fear. Fear is a thing that we've not had since 
Horus Heresy or 7th edition. Uh, while an enemy unit is within six inches of this model, subtract one from the leadership characteristic of models in that unit. So actually, these would tie in really well if you were wanting to do um, Night Lords. Um, unnatural regeneration. Each time a model in this unit would lose a wound. On a six plus, the wound is not lost. Um, and a destruction of a mutant model is ignored for the purposes of morale because they've got a mutant rabble ability. Uh, quite nice. Quite nice. I quite like them. I love them. I, I, the cultist editions, I'm loving it. It's, it's, it's If I could be bothered to paint that many cultists, which I can't, but if I could, I'd love to do the cultist Chaos Space Marine army. I just think it's it's well cool. It's just that it's a part of the Chaos Space Marine ethos, mm. the lore that I just really, really love. Um, I so yeah. I had an idea, and I was originally Please. planning to do it for my Night Haunts, and I think it is perfect for both Guardsmen, uh, the cultists in general, any kind of really small infantry type unit. You should multi-base them on much larger... Uh, bases so i reckon free cultists to a base a bit like a heavy weapons mm. team uh obviously you'll have to use um uh, dice for when they when they uh, uh lose some wounds to represent it but mm. i think that would actually be a much better way of visually representing mobs as they call them here cultist mobs um on the battlefield um game, mm, games like sludge uh do it as well and uh, that's where i got the idea from and i was like oh that's really cool um, and also saves on having like to use movement trays, um, or when you're having like a hundred infantry having to faff around moving them all around. So I think mm. it's almost like that concept of the whole mini dioramas. And I'm surprised with the cultist uh, HQ that they didn't sort of make it a bit more like the um, triumvirate of Saint Catherine, yeah. Um, yeah. To just make it like a mini diorama, like that would have been yeah. quite cool. Um, but yeah, that would be my idea. And uh, if I was doing Cultist Mob, that's how I would do it, even though it completely, not breaks the game, but would give tournament players heart palpitations when they saw it in terms of, you can't do that. Potentially, potentially. But I agree with you, man. I think, you know, sort of doing them up like their swarm bases mm. would actually be would actually be really cool. And I think that's the thing. The idea that I would have is definitely Cultists, um, like the cultist command sections, the possessions, throw in like maybe inevitably you're going to have to use like the profile for a chaos lord, um, or like a chaos sorcerer or something. Maybe a chaos sorcerer would be an actually really cool thing to to kind of put in well, there. Well, the and- dark apostle would fit because he has two little acolyte uh, cultists alongside yes. with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dark apostle would be a pretty good shout. Um, maybe one unit of chosen just to kind of act as like a, a kind of supporting unit of um, of whatever. Although I think with the way that the rules work, you can't have more cultists unless it's all cultists. Or yes, whatever we yeah, yeah. So maybe we wouldn't be able to go down that rabbit hole. But the point is, is that I think it would be that and demons would just be a really fun synergy um, because um, that's what you'd want to see. I think you'd want loads of these guys summoning Neverborn, um and then have that as your overall kind of army and then yeah i think that'd be awesome i think that'd be a really fun army uh wouldn't win any games or it might do who knows but it wouldn't be potentially super competitive unless of course manny turns up to an event with hundreds of cultists sometime soon and you know, I eat my hat when it comes to that one. But, yeah. I mean, who cares if it is? That'd be so cool, what's, man, to do like a... What's, we- what's weird, though, is there's no traitor guardsman in here, right? Uh, you know, they, they did the models for Blackstone Fortress. They got... Um, I don't think you can buy them outside of Blackstone Fortress, though. Um, but I'm surprised they haven't release those and uh, you can get them in you can get them in kill team well, yes the, there's the new kill team ones coming but again that's not in here and that's weird because uh well it was the same thing they did with sisters of battle right they produced for codex that came out then the extra um novitiates i think they were called came out yeah, yeah. and they gave you a free update uh pdf to play with them uh so i guess that will happen here 
Um, that or they're uh, being added as a potential uh, regiment for Imperial Guard. Well, that would honestly that would make more sense because yeah, that's agree. where you, all the data sheets for all the you know the vehicles and stuff would be as well. But then at the I'd same time, Gene that. Steeler Colt had its kind of own thing and said, "Yeah, you can take." Actually, that actually did go. Here's how you replace the. So what they should have done is they should have included them in here in this book and then did the same rule with the Gene Stealer cult. And it says, take anything you want from the guard codex, but replace their um, uh, guard um, ability with this ability, traitor guardsman instead. And it does that. That's sort of really, it really depends what the future is for uh, guard though. Right. Cause true. There's a bunch of rumours doing the rounds in terms of how it works. I won't get into it at this moment in time because I don't really actually know, but I've heard, like, things from different people and so on and so forth. But, yeah, like, it depends on what it becomes in the future. Yeah. I um, mean, I, I, I'd, I'd hope almost that uh, Traitor Guard are good enough to get their own codex in their own right. But that would involve probably just, way more, like, separate releases. And you're right. Yeah, I Maybe I, it, yeah, would I just be, think... it would feel weird to have a chaos and imperial mixed codex because then you've got to have law for both but maybe that makes sense we've had those situations in the past though with things like knights when there was just the knight book and then it just became and here's the renegade variant it wasn't in the same book but they basically just went here's a pdf to make it yes renegade yeah. you know um because no no anyway. imperial player wants some filthy heretical data sheets Paper or... players put up with it all the time they've got dark angels in everything oh come on you know better than that as a dark angel player to make that little i am a dark angel player. i joke. love dark angels well you know i'm just well, well there, how you do know? you feel that got... cyphers in this book are not in you know the dark angel book i mean so cypher is bonkers by the way uh i i actually did read his rules um we haven't got time to get into it now but he is bonkers um but um but yeah, he yeah, like I mean it makes sense. He's a chaos space marine, right? So that's where he belongs. Um I mean maybe that's something I can do with my glorious Horus Heresy army is I can run them as fallen. Uh, well it'd be fit perfectly, right, in terms of the look of them. Just yeah. just plonk in Cypher and you you'll be good. Yeah. I do own Cypher, so yeah, chuck him in. Um but there you go, that was Chaos Space Marines. I for one really like them. I actually think this is a really good book. Well done, Games Workshop. It's got some Really fun, interesting stuff in it. Some great stratagems, some great warlord traits, some great psychic powers, some really fun new models, great looking units. It's a gorgeous army. Yeah. I mean, it definitely probably isn't, which is a series of contradicting words, but the point is, is that I imagine it's not something with immediate kind of competitive benefits, but at this point, who cares? The game is about to change in under a year. So who gives a heck? Just do whatever you want. <laughs> it's like but you you're it's saying like enjoy this. the book while it lasts because it hasn't got. Oh long. yeah, I mean if the well, it's not that it, the book hasn't got long. I imagine the book will go the distance. I imagine this will be the book for a while. It's just that, yeah, tenth edition. Who knows what's going to be good? In uh, yeah, uh, to be fair, who knows what's going to be good next month when another balanced data slate comes along? I, I think this is the thing. The emphasis on competitive now with the way the game is is just pointless because. Games Workshop have made it clear that they're going to change the game so much. There's no point even trying to overthink anything. You just got to sort of blindly play what you like and hope for the best, unless you're one of the, you know, fortunate few, if you consider them fortunate, who can um who can chase the meta and try and define it. Uh I think for the rest of us, yeah, just buy what you like and enjoy it. I think Gale Space Marines seem really fun. The range is really beautiful. It's got some cool stuff in it. And obviously we know world, eat, uh, world Eaters are coming soon. And we've seen Angry Ron and he looks amazing. And I can't wait to see what the new Berserkers look like. World Eaters could be my return to Chaos Space Marines because I was always a, a, a World Eater boy. Oh, wow. Corn Demon Kin was the, uh, was the Chaos Space Marine book I most loved. Mm. That was the one where I really went all in on, on Chaos. Um, and, and the Demons is the next Codex. I reckon. Yeah. So yeah, demons is coming around the corner, man. So, but yeah, I don't think they're going to do like corn demon kin anytime soon, but maybe world eaters will have some demon synergies. I don't know. I mean, obviously angry Ron is a demon. Hmm. 
So he probably hangs out with some demons. Um, yeah, because so what issue, was Demon know? Kin? It was a, a more mixture of cultists and um, so demons. Demon Kin, yeah. So Demon Kin were a specific kind of religious cult built around corn. So they worshipped corn by killing, and corn rewarded them for their kills. So it wasn't a world eaters army. It was a specific cult of corn, and the and they basically uh, worshipped corn and synergized with demons. Um, so the unique en- aspect of it was was that you could have demons and marines and cultists all mashed together um, and uh, had this really uh, interesting system um, called blood tithe points. So you would amass blood tithe points for kills. And then once you achieved certain amounts of blood tithe points, you could cash them in for new units, uh, even as big a unit as a blood firster. So you could get to the point where you could summon a bloodthirster for free. Oh yes, seventh edition. I remember being terrified of that happening, and it, I'm sure we played, it, didn't we? Did. We played at an event. Yeah, it, well, we played many times, but we played at an event, and you you got some beautiful photos mm. of it on Beyond the Tabletop, um, which is a really cool thing to go back and look at from time to time. And it's like the wayback machine, I guess. But <laughs> um, but yeah, like I mean, yeah, that that army was so fun. I used to just have loads of juggernauts. And I just used to slam juggernauts into people and just hope for the best. And then, um, and then, yeah, summon more, um, uh, more big demons. Weirdly, the thing you never actually wanted to summon was the, uh, the bloodthirster. Cause in seventh edition, when you summoned it, it came in swooping, uh, which meant it took, it, it took it three turns from arriving to actually it's be able fight, to charge. Yeah. Cause you had to, yes, fly for a turn, land for a turn and then, fight yeah and they're challenged mm. yeah so basically if i ever summoned a bloodthirster it was just literally like there's something for you to kill <laughs> you know um and they were never actually that terrifying i mean i remember i when um admet came along for the first time and they had all their flipping you know radioactive guns which auto wound everything on like whatever it was and my bloodthirster ran towards them and then just was like dead it was like oh, okay good 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 um, but there you go. Look, Cast Miss Marines, big fan. Love it. Really, really flavoursome, really interesting book filled with really great stuff. Uh, you know, it's great. This is a good example of a, of a, of a codex. Nothing too a, a, a abruptly complicated, nothing too over the top. Yeah, sure. We've got layers and layers of nonsense as a result of just ongoing nonsense um, because we had to give Space Marines a bunch of extra rules, but fine. It, it's good. I dig it. I'm into it. It's a fun book. What do you reckon, Phil? Um, no, I think I agree. I think it is a really sort of high standard and a good exemplar codex that all the others should try and be like. There's a lot of complexity to it, but it's not difficult to pick up. Um, sort of the base core rules for the army is pretty straightforward, um, but the depth is sort of tucked away in terms of you've got your marks of corn, which you can upgrade stuff, but it does limit what units you can actually apply that to. And then it's also every single legion has way more um, sort of depth to them in comparison to, say, like all the older stuff. Like normally you get one warlord trait and a relic per um, sub-faction, whereas here you get so much that we can even go through it all in the time that, we've given ourselves to go through this segment so i think in terms of that the artwork the amount of stuff that's in there it's all pretty good um oh, it's a beautiful book to its credit i mean i've only just really you know what you've experienced is my first interaction with it um but i was thumbing through it look at it. it's, it's oh yeah it's it's good uh, at first glance it doesn't seem too broken either which is always a good sign and as we speculated yeah. at the beginning that's probably why it hasn't had any lasting waves in the community because i think people have just played a few games and they've gone yeah it's pretty pretty good power level wise it's definitely going to make them better than what they were so if you were a diehard chaos player you're probably going to be loving this book uh, desperately lapping up every little drop of uh, an extra wound that your marines now have so um yeah i think i think you're going to like it um you know i'll make one not gripe just a point on behalf of our dear friend richie the quizmaster he points out 
that the Land Raiders are Toughness 9. But yes, they are. Space Marine Land Raiders have not been FAQ'd or changed in any way to also be Toughness 9. Um, it's because they're newer Land Raiders. These are old Land Raiders. I guess, tougher. I guess that, that can be my only, you know, chaosy wayosy. It's got to be, that is the... chaosy way Like, like timey wimey, chaosy wayosy. It's the, it's the way yeah, of explaining yeah. why it is different. But it's odd because when, so when the Demolisher Cannon went from, I think it was D3 shots to D6 shots in the Space Marine Codex, they FAQ'd it to every single reference of a Demolisher Cannon, which included Guard players and Chaos Space Marine players. And maybe that was an 8th edition kind of mindset because obviously when Chaos, when Space Marines got two wounds, they didn't give it to Chaos Space Marines. And so maybe they're like, these have got Toughness 9, Land Raiders, Chaos, sorry, regular Space Marine players either won't ever get a Toughness 9 Land Raider and that will be the discrepancy between the two to make each army stand out in a specific way or once, let's assume, the Space Marines do get another codex update down the line maybe next year who knows when um that that's when we will get our toughness line ran land raiders i mean i thought for a second you were going to grumble about the fact that you know chaos space marine terminators are based off of the uh indomitus armor type which uh which you know was in such low circulation during the heresy you, know, you would expect a unit of chaos space marine Terminators to be made up of cataphracti or Tartarus pattern armor. Well, I mean, so the Indomitus armor you can take in Horus Heresy, and really, oh, yeah, really yeah. is a troop's choice. But it was meant to be seen as inferior armor, so it's um, it was definitely not the sort of stuff that you'd see on the Chaos Space Marines, given the fact that they're all the traitor legions. Yeah, I don't know, and they were given the best gear. Yeah, in theory, maybe cataphracti would be better but i mean i think they've done that to also make it kind of generic because um death guard have yeah, cataphracte do. armor no one really has tartarus armor do they in terms of like a modern re- revisioned update date in, in the chaos. um the i forget what they're called now but the um scorpic occult terminators have it is that horus yeah, yeah. heresy specific though not 40k. I know the thousand thousand sons ones. Yeah, I'm just looking oh. for them now. I've ended up clicking on Death Guard accidentally. I need to click on Thousand E Sons. Apparently, I'm looking at heavy support choices. God bless this website. Yeah, so the uh, Scarab Occult Terminators are um, are Tartarus. Oh. I'm pretty sure. Well, if that's the case, then that explains your answer. I think they've gone. Um, we're doing specific ones for Death Guard and um, Thousand Sons, and then we make the new generic ones in Domitus, which, to be honest, are, are beautiful. And recently I did see someone de-chaosify them to do sort of make them just generic, true-scale versions of um, Imperium ones, and they look really good. Uh, no, that's so that's true. a cool option for those people that would like to do something like that. Um and let's be honest with ourselves, the main reason why they're that version of Terminator is because Tartarus and uh, Cataphracte didn't exist uh, back when they did the original designs for those Terminators um, in second yes, edition. Yes, because these are... Carried over from there. Yeah, because these are updated sculpts of um, other armour, right, that they did, yeah. Um, which, yes, explains that. I'm just thinking, what, what armour is Abaddon in? He's in... He's in a version of the... Well, he would have been wearing, like, specific, like, Artificer armor, right? Like, he wouldn't... Well, he wouldn't technically, be he, Bongo, should be in, he should be in Cataphracte based on what he wore yes, he in be, yeah. Horus Heresy. So it's almost odd that his is a bit more like the Indomitus armor, I think, but, like, beefed up. But I think that's what it is I mean, based on the shoulder pads and the crown sort of uh, halo he's got uh, in terms of the armor. On the top. Yeah, I think, again, it, you know, I assume there's a lot of artistic license going on with that one particularly. Mm. He is in a incredibly ornate, incredibly decorative Bespoke. suit of yes. armour. Um, yeah. yeah, he's pimp, in pimp, Abaddon Pimp my armour, armor. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Much like how the new Praetors in the uh, the box set oh, are wearing God. Stormcast Eternal armour. Yeah. I threw him away. Uh, I literally couldn't, I couldn't even be bothered to sell him. I was like, no one should have these. I'm, they're gone. Oh, that's quite funny. I ended up buying a couple of um, pieces because I wanted the axe. 
So, well, you could have had mine. Well, mate. I, I chucked thank, them. Thanks for for offering. I didn't want. I didn't want anyone. You, you just in a rage, and you're like, they're going in the bin. They were. It wasn't a rage. I just as soon as I opened the box, I was like, now they're going. I can't yeah, even they've got some cool bits like the backpack and the uh, one of the pistols and the axe. I think were the bits I really liked. I wouldn't know. Not but, even looked at the, the rest. Are, the, face. the rest bits are a bit. Yeah, too great. Too, too age of Sigma for my liking. Um, no, exactly. Not that I don't like Age of Sigma, but just not me Horace Harrison. Anyway, there you go. That was Chaos Space Marines. Thank you very much for listening. We're going to do whatever it is that we decide to do next. Um, so transitional noise. Thank you very much. That's supposed to be like a news bulletin. Uh, you know, like when like the news happens. Anyway, look, it's extra stuff. Or not extra stuff. It's us talking about community questions um, that we didn't think we were going to do, but here we are doing it. Well done us. Praise us, O oh Lord. Praise us. For or does going, that work? Going the extra mile to deliver yeah. some juicy content. Look, Exactly. The Lord wouldn't praise us, would they? We'd praise the Lord. Unless we are the Lord, to be Potentially. praised. Potentially. Yeah. The two-headed giant that collaboratively becomes the manifestation of the Lord. Look out, sir. Yes. Look out, sir. They are. Boosh. It's all coming clear. Steadily, we're working up to convincing our listeners to join us in a mass suicide pact. Uh, or, as, as, as we talked about earlier, we are... You know, like how we're enveloping, like the blob, other members into our fold. Maybe we're going to do that with the community as well. That's true. That's true. And then go on a mass suicide pact. I mean, I guess so. There you are. If I ever offer you any punch, you stay away. Yeah. Or not, yep. maybe. Maybe I'm double bluffing you. Anyway, um, <laughs> we're going to do community questions about Chaos Space Marines because, you know, we enjoyed Chaos Space Marines so gosh darn much that we decided that we should probably do this. Um, you know, giving a little bit back to the old community, Phil. That's what generous people we are. Exactly. We we put it out on all our socials, including our special, lovely Patreon uh, supporters. Funnily enough, none of them had anything to say. So we're no. just going to be answering the questions from the Facebooks and the Instagrams. There you go. Our patrons are the best. They give us money and ask nothing of us. Um, that or they've forgotten that they're even giving us money, such as the small amounts that we uh, that we uh, beg for over the well, internet. Yeah, exactly. It could be that we suddenly get a bunch of uh, unsubscribers because they're like, oh, yeah, I'm giving money to those people. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to do that anymore. No, no, no that's a, that's a, that is a silly idea. Um, and we understand, um, you know, you know, you know, exactly. you know, there you are. <laughs> With quality content like that, it's uh, it's no wonder people are uh, supporting the beautiful entity that is Lookout Sir. But let's do some questions, Phil. What are we going to start with? Exactly. Facebook or the Instagram? Well, we normally do Instagram, so let's prioritise Facebook this time. And we'll do right. those ones and then move on to Instagram. Um, so the, right. first, the first one is from the Crotchety Grot, which is a fantastic The name. Crotchety Grot? Uh, like, it, yes, a living manifestation of an actual grot by the looks from of a, it. From a crotch. Exactly. Um, so he says, or or they, she, I mean, like, Grotz, I don't know what gender they would have. Um, we know the big badlies of the legions, a.k.a. the obvious choices, I assume, Black Legion and so forth. Uh, but what legion do you think is the sleeper legion that isn't the obvious choice, but would surprise people on how good it is? Oh, there's a question. Um... I, I guess we can't thoroughly answer it because we didn't go through every single of the um like warlord traits and relics and stratagems that they can all have uh but we can answer it based on the general vibe of what their main um ability is yeah for sure i think um at the moment hmm i get the feeling that I mean, obviously, Red Corsairs were really good, right? Like, we, I think we we identified that the Red Corsairs build uh, seemed super interesting. Um, and there was definitely something cool about that. Iron Warriors seemed like they were really cool um, until you read their kind of um, errata-based change, which is essentially, rather than ignoring minus one, minus two APs, they, they don't, you can't re-roll to wound against them. Although that, in and of itself, is 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 pretty strong. 
Um, so maybe Iron Warriors. Iron Warriors seem like they've got some interesting options there. Um, I quite like, I quite dig the Iron Warriors. Um, but yeah, I guess Red Corsairs um, for me. I kind of like the Alpha Legion because I like the Alpha Legion, but it doesn't seem like an overly remarkable army necessarily. Although I suppose it is minus one to hit from a range, which I guess is all right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Red Corsairs keep coming back to me. Plus also Huron Blackheart, as we discussed, is is pretty monstrous. And also I like the idea that um, that you could potentially lean more into kind of cultistiness with them quite interestingly, um, which would certainly be fun. I definitely think that's been the prevailing thing that's kind of come away from my time with the book is that I like the idea of cultists. I think that sounds like fun. But anyway, what do you reckon, Phil? Uh, well, you basically said everything I was going to say. I was going to pick Red Corsairs because, as I alluded to, I actually just like them thematically. I think some of the rules are very good, and Huron seems like a bit of a beast as well. Mm. Um, not obviously Abaddon level, but he's 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 no slouch. Um, so I think there's probably going to be some nice little uh, abilities and strategies in them. Uh, it obviously, it's a, they're a bit white, white scarsy because you can um, charge in return that you advanced, and obviously you've got models. Uh, count as double for objectives or bigger things count as five so they've got um over 10 wound characteristics so i think both of those are quite cool and have some good um sort of synergy and utility because you can you can you can advance you can charge into combat onto an objective and then you're mm. outnumbering your opponent even if you don't kill them in that turn um yeah I'm, we didn't go through the stratagems but i bet they've got some half decent ones although sadly they lack the same sort of number because they've only got a couple of um stratagems rather than like a whole full page like some of the larger legions uh got so yeah i, I mean the other one that, is that they they haven't done so this is more speculation like it would be nice if there was something sort of more for a cultist specific army like the benefits just cultists but i guess cultists mm. always have to be part of a legion of sorts so maybe that's how you would have to if you were just going to do um cultist army you've still got to pick a legion right yeah, I think, well, I mean, word bearers, I guess, are supposedly supposed to be that kind of jam, I guess. But, like, again, this might have been one of those things where it probably was going to be useful for us to have actually taken some time reading the stratagems and uh, understanding the warlord traits and so on and so forth. I imagine if we'd uh, done that, we'd probably know for certain that uh, potentially set things like word bearers do, you know, good business as... Uh, as uh, mm. as cultists potentially, but um, yeah, I think the thing is though, I like I like the idea from a sort of synergies perspective, the idea that you could uh, get the uh, the cultists, the demons, and you know link all those elements together. I think there's definitely some fun things that we can mm. see there. But um, yeah, but the ones I'm least impressed with, I'd say overall, is Empress Children. I think they were a real letdown uh, for me personally. Although I kind of liked. Um, that stratagem where you could shoot people where they were leaving when they were falling back out of combat and stuff like oh that yeah that cool. was a good one and then was it word bearers where you can shoot the cultists right that one was cool no that's just general I think you, anyone can shoot into cultists I think oh maybe it was I can't remember I think it was cultists yeah. and marines but again and we discussed how we thought that it would have just been cool if they made just it as a generic, generic rule yeah, yeah, yeah you could just shoot cultists which would have made sense right heretica astartes keyword can fire at a unit engaged in combat with you know cultist astartes mm. or whatever they're called yeah, yeah, yeah which would have been pretty cool yeah but yeah there you go um but yeah emperor's children just didn't really set my world on fire based on what they were sort of showing <laughs> yeah the world on fire tee -hee. um yeah there wasn't um i, I just have to say overall it was pretty well balanced it didn't feel like there was any that was particularly bad uh, where you because sometimes you look at them and go oh well, this is just rubbish why would you ever pick that they didn't really feel like there was any that was on that level but there obviously were some that, that there were some that were just a bit better than some of the others um it's all down to play style yeah yeah exactly exactly i mean again i'd like for night lords to be cool but they, well you know. speaking of night lords there's another the next question from jonathan uh, he says, uh, what's your vibe on the Night Lord's trait? Uh, between the Warlord trait of the Lord of Terror and One Piece at a Time um, pairs the five or six units that have the Fear Aura natively, 
do you think morale might actually matter against them? So you can theoretically get minus seven leadership and force attrition on a four or a five if you kill a character and pop the strat. So that, I think, is a bit of a deep cut, uh, combo in terms of uh, some of the stuff you need to do um, to actually yeah. make it work. But is, I mean, that would be impressive. A min- minus seven on a, on a leadership and making people fail attrition on a, even on a four would be huge. I think. Yeah, I think there's two problems with it, though, right, still. There's a one in six chance that nothing happens because one always passes. Mm -hmm. Um, And there is, in addition to that, a stratagem that nullifies the entire effectiveness of it. If they'd come up with a... That's only uh, like... Is that now once per game, though? uh, Rather than every turn. You know, the generic um, uh, auto-pass morale. Yeah, you might be right. I think that is once per game. So maybe it isn't as viable as it once was, but... Even then, right, like, you know, I think that genuinely, if you are able to create a situation where that is occurring to people, it's highly probable that you're going to do a lot of damage and that's going to be pretty significant. But again, it's 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 a combination of like, what are the setups that, that get you to that? How easy are they to implement? How mobile are those things? So again, in my 8th edition Craft World competitive days, I ran an army list that really weaponized morale, massively weaponized it. Um, it was a mechanic, a phase that I felt like very few people were utilizing appropriately. And I built my army list around it. Um, so effectively, I utilized things like Mind War, which was I was debuffing leadership and then using Mind War to do significant quantities of mortal wounds to characters. Um, I was using the Hemlocks and then minus two aura, um, and then basically calculating exactly how many models I needed to kill in a unit to then leave it alone because at that point they couldn't then pass a morale test. It was just basically auto dead, uh, which was a really uh, interesting piece of uh, calculation. Um, But effectively, yeah, you could kind of build all these kind of synergies in um, 8th edition because everyone always used to say like the way that you had made good competitive lists is you're active in every phase. Very few people utilized morale a lot of people had good psychic good shooting good combat very few people utilized morale and that was what that army did did it well but that's in eighth edition in uh ninth edition it's been difficult to get to a place where that works consistently um and appropriately however night lords can probably do it but it's about implementation the one thing that was good about the elder version of it was it's the things doing all the debuffing were flies so they went everywhere i could and i had three of them so they very easily applied the debuff army wide um and then i was able then to combo that with really long range shooting back in the day where we didn't have egregious amounts of terrain so i was able to kind of be a bit more oppressive with it um than you can probably afford uh, in the current climate so what I don't understand and where I feel like the viability of that list lies is mobility and the overall kind of implementation of, you know, the output as it were, because you're going to need to be able to put the debuffs on, but then you're going to need to force the morale test because it doesn't matter if you're minus seven, if you can't maybe get line of sight to kill anything. Um, and admittedly, okay, you need to kill one thing in order to trigger the morale test, but you still need to do it. Um, and again, I don't know what the va- the var- variables are there. Unless, of course, it's yeah. just lords with jump packs coming in going, I'm well, scary. It, it might like, be yeah, that, probably. but if it's... Um, so I think John um, says that you need to kill a character to then do... I presume it's an army-wide debuff. Um, but if you need to kill a character, it's like, okay, cool. In some armies, that's really easy to do, like probably guardsmen. But against a space, I mean, or custodies army, that's actually a lot harder to do because there's so much more durable or there's not as many and or people even against guardsmen quite often they just hide them really well so they're difficult to actually reach so you need some viability in your marine army your chaos marine army to be able to kill those characters or ignore lookout sir to be e- to make it more easily uh killable so that would yeah. potentially be one of the troubles with that list um yeah it feels like it's a lot harder to do much more punishing leadership in this one even though in eighth edition you could do it more but you could also counter it more easily if it only affected one unit per phase because you could do insane bravery every single turn on one unit um whereas now it is yeah it's two cpu but it's once per battle 
So, yeah. it, but then you're failing morale a lot more, but actually the negatives of failing morale are a lot less because it's like, cool, oh, roll a bunch of dice and, you know, ones and twos isn't so bad. But whereas you said you can calculate it before where you go, cool, you failed, you've automatically lost this many people. And yeah. I pretty much wiped out your squad. So, yeah. And that was a big difference maker before. The way that you could do it in 8th edition was devastating if you, you know, weaponized it uh, appropriately. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty gnarly. But I'm not saying it can't still be now. Um, but again, even, especially that's the thing though, is again, that one in six odds of getting just the one. It's um, it's enough that you're like <laughs> frustrating. Yeah, yeah I highly mean, it, highly implausible, but you know, exactly it'll happen it, it's more enough, often than it's you realise. Yeah, it's enough that when it does happen, it it you, you feel it, and it's the same when it was the same with like Seize the Initiative, right? It was um, oh yeah, it, it it's random enough that it doesn't happen all that often, but you you remember it at the times when it actually does happen. Of course, um, it seems to happen more often than it didn't. Yes, at least that's how you remember yeah. it. No, exactly. Anyway, you're should we move for on a to the next here, one? Phil? I'm, I'm curious why you're looking for a book. Oh, I, I was just going to have a quick flick to see if I could see what the actual stratagem was for Night Lords. Uh, I mean, there are they a they couple of does. them, weren't they? I'm um, just trying to see one that talks about leadership. Uh, so there's Flay Them Alive, that was the one he mentioned. So that's an, a 1CP epic deed stratagem. Use this stratagem in the fight phase when an enemy warlord is destroyed by a melee attack made by a Night Lord's heretic Astartes model from your army. So you've got to do it in combat. It's got to be the warlord. Uh, until the end of a battle, each time a combat attrition test is taken for an enemy unit, subtract one from the combat attrition test. So to me, that is really difficult to pull off. But again, mm. that's going to be army specific against uh, what your opponent's taken because some will be easier than others yeah yeah but yeah that extra one cp and if there's a couple of other ways where you can um, knock it down a bit more because by default it was okay but yeah if you, if you can buff that even further that'd be brilliant mm, i agreed right interesting Next one, we've got um, Michael. He talks about the balance. He's like, the Tyranid book had a great internal balance, but zero external. How do you think this book compares to the other recent books on internal and external balance? Say that one more time. Right. So he says that the Tyranid book had good internal balance, as in like, you know, the balance of picking uh, units between units and stuff. And, I sense. get you, I get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and yeah, then, yeah, yeah. But zero external balance in terms of it was really busted against yes, other people's yeah, 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 I hear you. I hear so you. How, yeah, how do you think this book compares with the other books on both internal and external balance? Really very, very uh, well thought out question. Um, so, so I had to hear it twice. Hmm. Mm. <sighs> So, I feel like Chaos Space Marines have a lot of really interesting and fun internal balance that allows people to play the armies the way they want to play them and collect forces like what they want to have. I think what's going to be interesting is how they synergize with demons and what that kind of brings to the fore. Um, one of the things that Nids didn't, or, or rather really doesn't have, is a really kind of compelling argument to add in any kind of like extra stuff. Okay. They've got access like Gene to Gene Cult, you Gene mean. Cult, Yeah. Mm. But Gene Cult Cult just don't really make a compelling argument to be part of the, the mix uh, in a Nid army. So Nids, although there's lots of really fun stuff you can do within the books, it stays very Nid. Whereas, you know, it doesn't get very much of that GSC flavor to it. Uh, whereas I think the real strength of the Chaos Space Marines and the Chaos Range is going to be when you look at Demons, Chaos Knights, Chaos Space Marines collectively. Um, because already, you know, we've seen interesting kind of synergies between like Demon players throwing in uh, Chaos Knights because of Bellacore and the fact that you can do some interesting stuff with that. Um, you know, and I think that's where it potentially becomes interesting. But I think in terms of the book itself, um, I think it's a really fun, really interesting book that gives people a lot of creativity and, and, and creates some really fun kind of opportunities for you to express chaos 
the way that you know you 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 want to. Um, I I like the fact that they've incorporated the data sheets from uh, Thousand Suns, Death Guard, and seem to be uh, World Eaters. I think that's going to be super interesting in terms of what that offers. The Black Legion is obviously a very strong option from the outset. The Mark of Zinch, Zinch, Zanch, Zinch. The blue ones, um, extraordinary. Uh, the the zero damage thing is like pff, mad. Um, so yeah, there's so much good stuff in there. Um, and some of the units are really, really awesome and they've got a lot of flexibility there. Um, yeah, I didn't see anything in there I didn't massively like. Um, and it's a really pretty range. I mean, even now, like the land raider, for God's sakes, like there's an argument between armor of contempt, toughness nine, two up armor save. I mean, those things are a massive nuisance. So yeah, I think, look, I think, I think there's a lot of flexibility there. I think people will be able to do some fun stuff with it. Do I imagine the majority of people who are looking at it in a competitive mindset will be just going down the black Legion hole and doing Abaddon and building everything around that probably. Um, but I think there's some play in like red Corsairs and other things, but I think the overarching thing is, is that, I don't necessarily feel like Chaos Space Marines are as egregious or as immediately obviously strong as what Nids are, for example. I mean, Nids are just oppressive, um, as were Eldari, specifically from like a Harlequin's perspective, but also now, moreover, from a general kind of craft world's perspective. I think I think Chaos Space Marines reside in this fun kind of place where they're now good and have a lot of fun tricks. And I think players who love them will be able to sort of express themselves with them really inter interestingly. Um, but I don't necessarily imagine that they are going to consistently be like the top, 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 top tier. But I think they'll do well for themselves, which is, I think, all anyone ever really wanted. And I think in a lot of ways, what Games Workshop should always aspire for in the book creation. I, all I can say is you, you I had want, a good time reading it. Yeah, every codex should be a mediocre codex from a power level point of view. You You want everything to be good all right not broken and not awful you want that somewhere in in the happy middle area where stuff is all sort of viable to pick and it does feel like from what we've read that it they've hit that sweet spot of um everything's pretty good um and nothing's too terrible nothing's too good but obviously there'll always be the best pick possible and especially when you look at the different legions there's always probably going to be a best pick or at least a best pick on a specific play style um and and you always get that with like you know the psychic powers the warlord traits like when we looked at it, there's always like one or two warlord traits that were like well of course you would just pick those ones because those seem the best they're almost like the things that are the hardest to do internal balance for whereas actually i think from what we've seen of the units and the data sheets, like they're actually really well balanced and seem pretty good. Yeah, the defiler might be a little bit dated uh, in some of it. It's like the battle cannon stat and stuff could have been better. Um, but overall, I think that, that they did pretty well, I think. And, you know, some of it like the defiler is a bit of a hit, potentially a historical hangover from the, um, like the Death Garden when they sort of redid the data um, sheets for those ones for Ninth Edition. But, yeah, I think overall it's pretty good. Like I said at the very beginning, no one's been making any kind of uh, making waves about um, chaos in terms of they're, they're completely busted or broken. No one really seems to be talking about them now in terms of, you know, storming up the tournament scene. And I think that's good because it's people finding their feet working out lists that they want to take. Um, and as you said, how they synergize, especially with Chaos Knights because of the uh, Agents of Chaos, that would be a big big one so they're tying very well and yeah demons will be another interesting one to see uh going forwards so it could be that there is you know not good internal bounce or external bounce but you won't see that for another few months from people going to tournaments and sort of pushing the codex and finding out the interesting stuff but the fact that out the gate it seems pretty good i think is really positive and that that's what all codexes should really aspire to be to be doing yeah, I mean, due, due in part to my conversations with Joe on the topic, I genuinely feel like the book is in a good place, um, but that it's clearly not, like, ridiculously, ridiculously uh, powerful on the same level as, like, Nids. Like, I've only... I've seen the Nids during the round. I've played... They're, they're crazy. Um, but, like, um, 
but like yeah like i think uh, space marines are just pretty fun um and i think that almost certainly will be people out there winning events with them and doing well with them because they are a marked improvement over where they were before but Oh yeah, and that's what you want. You want players that are good to be able to do well with the mm. codex, um, because they're like they're good players, but also they're good chaos players that know the codex really well. You don't want them to be doing well because because they've just picked up the codex and they've just run a meta list, and it's a lot easier for them to. You're winning at the army list construction stage rather than the I have tactical skill around movement, um, how I'm shooting my sort of shooting priorities and stuff. Because that's the strategy of the game and that's where people should be winning the game, not I've just taken like a almost auto win list um, from the build stage. Obviously, some people will disagree with that statement, but that's that's fine. That's my, that's my opinion. Um Right, next one, we've got uh, Pete. Uh, he says, do you think Abaddon is underpriced and should be locked only to Black Legion? Uh, and then similar to that, another Michael. Oh, wait, no, the same Michael from before. He says, do you think they have made a broken model with Abaddon, uh, a wound per phase cap on a model uh, you can hide behind a unit or next to a rhino? Oh, actually, so, yeah, so he's got the... He can only take three wounds per phase, but he's not a monster. He is a character. How many wounds does he get? Can you remember? So Nine. I guess he can still be protected um, from Lookout Sir. So I guess that makes doing those three wounds potentially quite tricky. Really tricky. Especially when so he ignores it, the first first failed save as well. Yeah. So in answer to your questions in order, yes, no, yes. Um, so yes. He's underpriced. Um, the 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 points cost for this guy what is he three fifty something like that? Oh, let's have a quick note. In fact, I've not oh. I've not I've not synced up the code, so I don't know if I um, if I looked. Oh, he's three hundred on the nose. Look at that. Yeah, insanely cheap. Insanely cheap. Like that. The price of two Lehman Russes. Yeah. 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 Should be yeah. three fifty four hundred at least. He's, he's, yes, he's cheap. Um, what was the second part of the question? Like I said, uh, no, should two- he be locked to a uh, black lead? Oh yeah. No, no, absolutely not. He's the, uh, you know, war master. He is the head of, you know, the chaos legions and so on and all so forth. All of chaos, effectively. Because even in the law, like basically. even in the, um, no, it wasn't Vigilus, but one of the more recent Warzone books, it's, um, oh, Char- Charadon, Charadon. Um, yeah. He was, bossing around Typhus and getting Typhus to do his bidding to go attack that sector. So even in the law, he is ordering around kind of other legions uh, to not do just, stuff to his will. It's not just people coming from those legions um, being amalgamated uh, like the blob into Black Legion. He is actually having influence and control over um, uh, the other actual legions. Yeah, I mean, not just was he uh, or is he, you know, issuing orders to Typhus. You know, he issues orders to Mortarian. You know, there are Primarchs who have who are, you know, under his under his leadership now. He he is the boy. He's he's he's. There's very few things that don't like get on board with what Abaddon wants to do um, from the ranks of Chaos. So, yeah, he's he's a pretty big deal. Um, so absolutely should not be locked to just Black Legion. And what was the last bit of it, Phil, while you wrestle with your door? Uh, well, well, the door is uh, being cleverly opened up by a cat. You know, like the raptor scene in uh, Jurassic Park. It's, oh, yes, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's clever, oh, no, not like Clever that. Girl, just something else, yeah. Um, uh, it was um, uh, Michael was saying do you think they've made a broken model because of his wounds per phase cap app, and you can also be behind uh, the lookout sir, next to a unit or a vehicle I don't think they made a broken model but I do think they've made a pretty strong data sheet is uh, what I would uh, what I would say there I think um, I, I think the strongest part of Abaddon is the fact that he's, he's infantry I think that's the thing where it's like <laughs> Yeah, he's he's big enough to be a monster. I mean, what's Gilliman? Yeah. Is Gilliman a monster? Monster. Yeah, yeah, I think 
switching it around. I mean, technically, he's not a Primark. He's not quite as big, but he's pretty much as big. He's as big. I would he is say. as big. So, and the fact that he's, uh, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't have a problem if he was a monster because he's just so huge. I imagine he's he's in the same realm yeah, as uh, Gilliman and Gaz, right? So yeah, Make, making him infantry is massive because he basically exploits all of the things that um, I'm just going to go through some walls. Yeah, he exploits all the things that are good um, in the competitive game of 40k. Gilliman was always a uh, 50-50 pick between Gilliman and um, Calgar because Gilliman was a monster. And because he was a monster, you couldn't move through walls. So a lot of the time, Marnius Calgar won out because he had so much more mobility options. Even though Calgar's movement, I think, is only like five because he's in Gravis armor, whereas Gilliman's movement is eight. The difference it makes being able to phase through walls in this game in a competitive set is is unbelievable. But yeah, combine that with the damage reductions, the toughness six, the two up armor, the armor of contempt, the invuns, the, everything. He's, he's, yeah, he's probably near as darn it the best 300 points you can spend in the game, bar very little. I think, I think he massively over indexes against a great many other things. I can't think of too many things in the game that are of equivalent kind of points that, that, that he doesn't beat. I think he pretty much beats everything in that realm. Uh, and a lot of things that exceed that, you know, um, you know, I think him against various forms of night, he spanks a lot of those pretty effortlessly. Um, him against, uh, I mean, maybe some of the greater demons can hold a candle to him. Maybe Bellacor, I doubt it, but maybe. Um, so, yeah, he's, yeah, he's pretty amazing. Because Bellacor's got the Ignoring Vun Sword, and there are other units that have abilities that actually ignore the wounds cap, although they're very... Be- Bellacor has that as well, I believe. I think Bellacor ignores the... No, he doesn't, does he? He just ignores the he, He's got an Ignoring Vun Sword, but, yeah, other things have a, an ignore whatever your wound mitigation um, ability. Yes, yeah, 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 So yeah. there are some things that can counter. And normally, I think, with someone like Abaddon, it's like... You wouldn't necessarily have him out on his own, but you would have him with one or two two units that are also going to be beat sticks that are going to benefit from his aura uh, abilities. But you're not going to really, well, I say this, maybe you would, but I don't think you would have him in like the center of your army because him and another unit will do enough work on one corner of the table or to get onto one objective. Mm-hmm. You don't need to have a ton of other units around him to also do that job. Like obviously turn one and deployment you will, and then they're split off into their own different directions. Like, oh, I'm going to send a knight over here and Abaddon and his Terminator boys are going to go here, for example, or deep strike down yeah, with yeah. them. So I think in terms of him benefiting from lookout, sir, I think a lot of the time there won't be a huge amount near him to do it, but you've got to take out that unit first or whittle it down. Um, to then be able to target him. And like I've so in one of my recent games against Richie, he had Gaz and admittedly Gaz was on his own because he's as I said, he's a big boy. He can just charge up and deal with a bunch of stuff. And I I've I it took me quite a few turns, but I did manage to kill him. And it was by the end it I I, I charged into combat with like fifteen or twenty odd marines, I think. And I he only had three wounds left, but I was like, God, I've got to like chuck everything in to, to make sure he dies. And literally the first five Marines killed him uh from their attacks, which was a surprise. I think he just rolled badly. But it's like I think um yeah, because he's only got nine wounds after him. So I think he needs that wound cap uh ability because otherwise he could just get blown up by a couple of las cannons. Yeah. Look, I think this is the thing. I think there's definitely... Um, I, I, I think Gaz is an interesting one because Gaz is a monster. So he... You can control him in the sense that you can use terrain um, to potentially, you know, uh, you know, give yourself relative advantages yeah. against Gaz. You can't do the same against Abaddon. Um, so that's where the, the thing becomes interesting. But yeah, he's very good and very... Efficient for free. You could you could hide 
slightly over two inches behind a wall because his base still won't fit through if you're gonna if you're gonna gain the system (laughs) that is true that is true but then that change as well has massively benefited abaddon because it becomes even more difficult to utilize that terrain in that sort of arrangement and also here's the other thing right like i mean most of the time you just go up and then just Go, yes, go you can be like, yes, I'm gonna yeah, just spend my yeah, points yeah. to to get through or what have you. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, there we go. Right, he's all right, isn't he? Yes, yeah, yeah he's pretty good. Uh, we've got uh, we've got two left from Facebook. Uh, so we've got right. Kill. He says, uh, which unit would you most want to see destroy your respective armies? Which unit would I most likely like to see destroy my respective armies? Um. I suppose that cultist squad <laughs> that I picked out as the thing that I wanted the, to do. The command pretty... squad, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cultist command squad would uh, would definitely get yeah. my vote. I like the um, accursed cultists as well. But although saying that, I think yeah. for, for the fun of it, I would actually say the Lord of Skulls. Yeah, now, the Lord now of Skulls. Now he's good. I mean, Lord of Skulls have been good for a while, to be fair. They're, they're, they've not really not been Although, good. Although, I have to say, it's also an awful model. So I'd want it to be the Katan. Katan? I can't remember how, how it's pronounced. Yeah, the yeah, other yeah, version. The Kaitan. The Kaitan, that's it, yeah. The, uh, yeah, the yeah. Forge World version. Uh, stomping yeah. around. Because that would be a beautiful sight. Yeah, yeah that'd be all right. I think, um, yeah, if I was looking at picking really pretty stuff uh, from uh, Chaos Space Marines, I suppose... I mean, obviously, we've got new demon princes soon. They look pretty. Um, oh, yeah. Quite like oh, yeah. the look of those. That I think that would be a cool thing to see across the tabletop. Uh, obviously, Abaddon. Pure on Blackheart. Oh, pure, pure on Blackheart on with his <laughs> derpy model. That's what I want smashing his, me up. His little... Um, I want him on his 28mm wor- base. His little worm, like his t- worm friend as well, yeah. Yeah, with his little naked roll mat buddy. And, uh, yeah, I'd want him running around smacking me up um and i'd want him to be accompanied by um i don't know all the other chaos stuff that's now of the current range is all pretty up to date and nice yeah um oh yeah yeah the, the, yeah um anyone but that 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 dude with the jump pack and the spear is my oh, least harken liked. world claim uh, well, i believe <laughs> there's, a, there's a question relating to him over on instagram but we'll get to that well good we'll get to that in a, in a second and then the last one from facebook is from brian he says this is specifically not for you but you will appreciate it more than me he says now that cypher is playable why do you think they ditched the fallen and he goes not even a legacy data sheet lol yeah i'm intrigued by that um, because I feel like if you're going to put Cypher in there, it only seems logical that you have the Fallen as a faction, yeah, right? Like it, they, it seems very odd. They put the Fallen in the Chaos Heavy uh, Warzone book, and they've sort of said, you know, these get superseded when the Codex comes out, but they haven't put the Fallen supplement effectively into the codex so is it still valid from the warzone book i suspect the answer is no but there is an argument you could say that but it hasn't actually been superseded yes the codex has come out but there's nothing in that codex superseding the supplement so it should in theory still be valid um it depends on what the exact wording is on that um kind of compendium update pdf that's on the on the downloads but yeah it's a bit of a shame that Obviously, you got access to him. Great. But yeah, the Fallen should have been in there. And this, of course, that is going to come down the line in another supplement or potentially maybe they redo it as a White Dwarf Index again, which is what they did previously. Yeah. Now, I would have really liked to have seen the Fallen uh, represented in this book, but um, but we aren't. Uh, only Cypher. Um, what's, what keyword does Cypher have? Hang on, let's look. Ooh. Is he the fallen? Um, because at one point, didn't he have... Um, uh, maybe it was... Cypher is Chaos Heretical Astartes, Traitor Astartes, and Fallen. Yeah, he has got Fallen. Oh, but he's right, the... So they've actually given him Fallen as like a Legion keyword, but they're not actually giving you that as a viable legion, which is pretty amazing. Because he is an agent of zero, chaos, right? Zero yeah, he's an agent yeah. of chaos. So he can be in any. 
Uh, that's a shame. It would have been really cool if they uh, had they facilitated that, but they haven't. So, Classic. yeah. So I guess it's it's definitely got room for growth, though. That's the thing. Yes, yes. But it only took them quite a long time to get to this point. They, uh, you know, definitely uh, opportunities to do more. Exactly. Um, so we move. What's Instagram got for us? So we've got uh, Quick Sauceables right. He says, uh, "Why so little access to flamers and combi flamers? If you have a special rule giving you two extra shots, looks like hell brutes with dual fists and flamers are the only ones able to cash in on this uh, cry emoji." Yeah, it's a little bit of a, uh, a bit of a bit of a crime, isn't it? It used to be that they're veteran squads, or um, rather, they're. Uh, Chosen squads used to be able to be loaded up to the nines with flamers. But I'm looking at them here and it says here one model icon for every five models unit up to two models, plasma pistol, two. Basically, they've done the you can only take what's in the box situation, right? Uh, so they've yes. given the old classic where it's like what's on the sprue is what you get to use. Get used to it. Um, and actually, none of them. They only have access to two combi flamers, wowzers. Because yeah, it used to be that you could mix up that unit pretty spectacularly. Um, I feel like the uh, Defiler had access to some kind of flamer variant. Oh yeah, so you got twin heavy flamers on the Defiler. You could, uh, mm. you could, you could uh, rock those. Um, so this model's twin heavy flamer can be replaced with a Havoc launcher or Defiler. So, yeah, so you could have Defilers with twin heavy flamers. But again, even then, that's not extraordinarily amazing yeah it's weird isn't it it's like you know let the galaxy burn cool so they get flamer stuff yeah that'll be cool who's got a flamer uh unit occultists and um, sort, of, sort of no one yeah uh, sort of no one and, and and you can get one in every tactical squad or sorry um whatever they call their legion squads these days legionnaires? Well, actually... i'll tell you i'll tell you legionnaires yeah so legionnaires Legionnaires can have da, 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 da. I don't even know if they can have one. Oh yeah, they can. They can have one. There you go. What a treat. <laughs> but but that's why really? that's why you're getting two extra. Two extra shots. Come on. Yes. It's not too bad. Yeah. Exactly. I mean what a what a yeah. But you know, yeah, it's obviously one of those things where they went, that sounds cool, because you know, let the galaxy burn, flamers, cool. And it's like, who gets them? No one. Oh, okay, cool, good. Yeah. But if they do get them, for the damage they can, they can, uh, they can do with those things when they get hold of them. Exactly. They just got to get hold of them. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe there'll be some amazing like kill team upgrade that they get down the line, and it's like an all flamer squad. They've already had their kill team upgrade though, know, and they didn't have anything of the sort. There might be more. There might be more down the line. Who knows? Um, yeah. I mean, maybe the Hell Drake. Well, he's got a big flame flamer thing, hasn't he? He's got the bale flamer, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Assault two D three. So I guess does that benefit from let like, the galaxy burn? I assume it must do. I thought so. I would have thought so as well. Um, yeah. So there you go. Just take a load of hell drakes. How many points is a hell drake? Just to give myself an impression of what things are. Flyers, hundred sixty five points. Not bad. Seems like a lot for a hell drake. Oh. Anyway. Let's move on. Uh, so, Folkstorm, he says, uh, I'd be interested to hear what your verdict is for cultists, since as the rain has evolved quite a bit with kill teams and such, I'd love to know if they've still got more flavour or if they're still just the big blob board control unit from ages past. He says, uh, not expecting heretic, uh, heretics and renegades, which is the old Forge World um, army list, but can you make something with them? Uh, I guess the answer is yes. You you. Yeah, 100%. Cultist armies are a lot more viable. I mean, still not, like, amazing. There's there's definitely room for more growth, and um, which will be cool to see down in the future. Uh, but, yeah, there's they've got their new command squad, and then they've got their new kind of mutated um, squad as well, in addition to the regular cultist squad. And, yeah, what was interesting is that slightly uh, mutated squad has the two forms, both... Uh, as part of one unit, whereas I would have assumed that there'd be two separate units, so you'd have had had even more choice, but you kind of get less choice than you'd assumed you would have got. Um, and, and as we talked about, uh, yeah, the, obviously the traitor guard models 
kind of got to be used at some point down the line, uh, but sadly not yet, not in here either. So it'd be interesting to see what they do with that going forwards and if there's potentially some synergy between those two, like Gar- Her- Heretic, uh, Renegades and Heretics plus Cultists. There's a secret combo army. That would be very cool going forwards. Yeah. No, I really like uh, what they've added to the cultist range. I think I've made my thoughts and feelings on the notion of a uh, majoritively cultist army quite clear. I think, I think it's really the kind of flavor of chaos that that, that seems most compelling. Um, it's a shame that the new cultist kit they've done is quite one dimensional in the sense that it seems like you can only really build them in a kind of melee style build. Um, it doesn't look like you can uh, give them the uh, the auto guns and things that you used to be able to give them. Um, again, I'm. Oh, I think the I think the regular squad can get the auto guns. It's just the um, mutated ones that you can't. So... No, no. The, in terms of the actual kit they've just released, so the Chaos oh, yeah. Cultist kit doesn't have auto guns. Yeah, so it says every model is equipped with an auto pistol, a brutal assault weapon, frag and crack grenades. Um, oh, but it does say any number of models in your unit uh, can replace their auto pistol and brutal assault weapon with one cultist firearm, which I guess is, you know, generic word for auto pistol, but it could could look like something else. But you're right, if there's not many models which actually have that in there, You'd effectively have to kit bash that to to make it possible. Well, you can buy. So you've got you've got two types of cultist box now, right? You've got the chaos cultists, which, by the way, thirty quid for ten chaos cultists is pretty bonkers in terms of pounds or monies per point, right? Like that is a lot of money. Twenty seven pound fifty or thirty quid for a unit that. Um, that all told probably doesn't even cost 50 points. Hang on, here we are. Troops choice. Cottage mob. Yeah, so, um, yeah, 50 points. So that uh, 10-man block there is 50 points. Or for 20 quid, 19 quid, you can get the Coltus Warband from um, uh, from the old Blackstone Fortress range. That comes with a heavy flamer and all the auto gun type of builds. But again, what's weird about that is it's an eight man squad and the minimum mm. of uh, the minimum size of the squad is 10. Well, you take two and then you've got a very large squad. Well, not yeah. Like, size, well, yeah. Then you but... went, yeah, yeah. Not mag size. So like literally if you want to collect and do the cultisty type of thing, you've got to buy probably. I wonder, because it says here, if you take a unit of 15 or more, you can select um, each war gear option twice. And I guess that is if you buy that Blackstone Fortress box, because you'd end up with, like, you know, two stubbers or two flamers or what have you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe yeah. that's why yeah, they've done do. that weird sort of stipulation. I mean, I do really like the Coltis Warband models, though. They are so cool. Yeah. Like the uh, the troop the, uh, the the cultist leader is amazing. The flamer guy is just crazy, and the, even the little dudes with like the, the the one lobbing the grenade, the one like carrying around like grenade launchers and all this kind of stuff, just really really cool. So yeah, but it's weird. It's weird that Games Workshop have come along and gone. Here's our new cultist kit. It's thirty quid, um, but it doesn't even seem to give you like this is the other thing that's pretty bonkers about it doesn't even give you any of the special weapons right so you don't get any heavy flamers you don't get any heavy you don't get any it all comes in that cultist warband yeah it's literally one sprue which makes uh five different oh sorry it's one sprue that makes all 10 models <laughs> it's a big sprue and they yeah it's, and it's all auto pistols and chainsaws mm. and stuff so yeah, a little bit of a little bit of a hit and miss. Even the uh, the warband one, the twenty quid one's two sprues. So there you go. Hmm. Right. But anyway, I like cultists. I do's. Yeah, but but yeah, I imagine there'll be and also the repetition in the uh, the models will definitely get on your nerves. But I guess if you can get your hands on, or if you still have some of the old cultists from yesteryear as well, chuck those in. You can probably you can probably make it work. Yeah, totally. 
Um, so Kevin James McGill says, I've played against my son's Black Legion army and can say they are very strong. Harkon seems to be an auto take for the Black Legion. Do you agree? No. Shall we look at his stats so we can have a see? Go on then. Uh, so he's a 12 inch move, uh, two plus uh, weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength and toughness of four, six wounds, seven attacks, leadership 10. And a free plus save. He's armed with a Hell Spear, Herald's Talon, Frag, and Crack Grenades. Obviously, you can only have one of them. So the Hell Spear is a 12 inch Assault 1, um, Strength 7, minus 3, flat 3 damage. And each time an attack is made with this weapon, if a hit is scored, draw a straight line between the closest point of this model's base or hull and the closest that of the target unit. Make one wound roll against the target unit and each other unit this line passes over which is very interesting um and then uh he's got herald's talon um uh strength user minus three ap two damage and each time an attack is made with his weapon you can re-roll the wound roll it's all right and then he's got a yeah. bunch of abilities. So he's Lord of the Raptors. In your command phase, select one friendly Black Legion core or Black Legion character unit within six inches of this model. So the start of your next command phase, each time a model with that unit makes an attack, you can reroll the hit roll. Um, and if it's the Raptors unit, you can reroll the wound roll. Um, and yeah, Lord of Chaos. Lord of Chaos. Uh, so a core unit uh, within six inches, um, each time a model. Makes an attack, you can reroll the hit roll to one. And he's got Head Taker, so each time an enemy character unit is destroyed by an attack made by this model, until the end of the battle, add one to this model's attack characteristics and increase the range of the model's herald of the Apocalypse ability by six to a maximum of 24 inches. Um, that's interesting. And then the Herald of Apocalypse aura ability is, while an enemy unit is within six inches of this model, each time the unit fails a morale test, one additional model flees from that unit. Okay, that's sort of interesting. And then he's got Sigil of Corruption, which gives him a four plus invulnerable save. I mean, he seems all right. Nothing like, I mean, maybe for Black Legion you would because you've only got two Black Legion specific characters, right? Well, it's 150 points, um, which is uh, which is all right. What's happening, Phil? Is someone trying to hurt you? I think someone's trying to break into the sheds. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I, don't know. I don't know what they want, though. Okay, well, you know, we can always uh, pause for a moment uh, should they decide to uh, to to break your outer perimeter. Well, well let's, uh, let's do that though, very briefly. All right, okay. Wow, I don't see any geothermal energy. When's it going to start? Well, Timmy, nature has her own schedule. Oh. <laughs> well, let's see if we can't give her a little nudge. We're going to need another Timmy. So now we got that out of the way. Yeah, no, he's all right. 150 points. He's all right. Um, don't like the model. He seems like he's got some good rules, but I wouldn't take him. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing lots of Raptors, then it sort of makes sense that you would take well, him. Well, again, right? just to say, Lord of the Raptors, but now it only works on Black uh, Black Legion. For shame. Oh, well, because do you remember that's what it originally was in the last edition, and then they had to, like, FAQ it to, back to be yeah. like, oh, no, you can you do it to everyone because that's how they advertised it on the Warhammer yep. Community article. Yep. But yep. now they like, oh, enough time has passed. Yes, yeah, we but can then, just go back to him. Just, But then I suppose with the way they've kind of made the rules book, it, work now. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it, makes sense. it just is what it is. All right, then. What's the next one? Uh, two bit paints. He says, this book is great. Uh, once you start digging into it, I think all the legions are viable and balanced with loads of different ways to play. Um, the only one I've struggled writing a good thematic list for is Alpha Legion, e.g. the more legionnaire slash cultists based than demon engines. Um, although a chaos lord with headhunter and viper's bite looks like a good laugh. What would your hot picks for an Alpha Legion list be? I don't know. Um, I have no idea. Maybe it sounds like the Alpha Legions are the cultisty ones. Maybe that's uh, further reassurance. I suppose they were before, weren't they? Alpha Legion was the the culty uh, one. Are they like before. sending lots of uh, cultists in front of them to all die? 
Well, yeah, because obviously they sp- spread rumours and misinformation yeah. and all the rest of it. I I, guess. I, so I, quite... Yeah, I think just to go infantry heavy, I would say, with with lots of cultists as part of that, maybe. A uh, demon prince with a black mace, done. <laughs> oh, you like that black mace? I don't, can they actually take the black mace? Yeah, yeah, they can, yeah, because they've got uh, one of the weapons that can be replaced, uh, which is the... Um, I don't know, maybe they can't, actually. Maybe they can't take a black mace anymore. Oh, well, it would have been nice if they just, could. Just do what Dan does and pretend they can. Pretend they can until you read the rules and realise that you're wrong. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, you know, I think um, I think Alpha Legion are fun. I... Uh, I would like to collect Alpha Legion. Um, I know it's well within my power to do so, but I'm 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 not going to just yet. But um, let's say here you go. Here's a here's a suggestion: Havoc squads in um, drop claws, dread claws. Ooh, you know, yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, love a bit of that. I love a bit. Bring of down the big old claw. Yeah. Drop off some Havocs. Bring out the bullets. Love it. Nice. Done. Okay. Yeah, um, done. <laughs> the, the big shark says, uh, "How good do you think Iron Warriors are with the new codex?" Yeah, I like them. Um, I think. Uh, let me just remind myself. Let's do a proper, proper job on this one, Phil. Let's just quickly, quickly uh, do this thing. So they've got. Yeah. So they don't benefit from cover. And they, and things don't benefit from any type of cover against them, which is meaningful. Um, and uh, you can't reroll a wound against them, um, which is which is pretty meaningful in and of itself. Um, yeah, I think I think the army's got a lot of really interesting stuff that benefits from that really well. Um, I think the thing is, it becomes a case of like what what are the kind of synergies, what are the sorts of units? Because one of the things that's quite archetypal about um chaos space marines is is they become quite um melee focused i think by default um they don't necessarily have access to the sorts of weapons that you necessarily would feel like um the uh the 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 iron warriors would massively benefit from so obviously i suppose you're going to lean into things like their um you know their 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 demon engines and all that kind of stuff, um, and that's probably got some opportunities for sure. Um, but yeah, I don't know, and it, they're not one of the. I like them. Um, I think they would be good. I'm just not necessarily sure how I would approach them from a kind of build perspective, um, other than maybe just doing loads and loads of Mauler fiends and um, Forge oh, fiends. And yeah, because that's what that's what Jay used town. to do with his. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that was really cool. Yeah. Um, I, was, was really cool. I was just looking at their Siege Lord Warlord traits are pretty good. It basically, uh, one core vehicle unit within six inches of a Warlord. Basically, if you're attacking a vehicle or building, let's, for this example, say Dreadnoughts, um, with a strength, uh, with a characteristic of seven or more, you add one to the damage. So basically, against Contemptors or Redemptors, Dreadnoughts of any kind, you're ignoring their minus one damage mitigation. Admittedly, it doesn't work on all weapons. It's just seven or more. But, you know, if you think multi melters, last cannons, that sort of jam, uh, or even battle cannons on your defilers, things like that, that would be um, pretty cool. So I, I like that one as, a, as an easy pick, just to counter Dreadnoughts, which is very thematic for them, I would say. Yeah, no, totally. I think there's definitely some fun stuff you could do with them. Um, so yeah, I do like them. Um, as I say, the only ones that I'm really not into is uh, sort of Empress Children, really. I mean, they're the only ones that don't wow me. Hmm. Oh, yeah, fair enough. Uh, and yeah. then we've got everyone's favourite, Cantor Blue. Um, and he says, blue. Uh, yes, finally. Do you think Abaddon is actually the big, bad, scary meta monster everyone says he is? Um, I think he's actually perfectly fine with this codex. He's powerful, but not crazy levels. Uh, but it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. I actually think the codex is very balanced after playing a few games with it, and there's no real point and click list, unlike stuff like Tau, Elder, and Nids. Oh, throwing a bit of shade their way. Um, in the end, I'm just happy to have the codex uh, that I've been waiting for. Oh, and isn't the artwork amazing? I mean, props to Cantor yes. Blue for not mentioning two wounds once. That is impressive, because uh, that's the <laughs> only thing he ever mentions in our comments, usually. Uh, he's used up his quota. Uh, he's got no more left to give on that particular topic. <laughs> I think um, 
I think that Abaddon is really, really good. And I think that is appropriate for what Abaddon is within the law. Uh, and it yeah. is, and it is good within the confines of this book because yes, he is an obvious powerful thing, but he, um, but he kind of should be. And I think he in an army definitely skews your overall kind of performance. I think have, including Abaddon greatly inf- uh, improves the efficiency and overall kind of capabilities of this list. I think if you're taking competitive Chaos Space Marines, I think you'd be mad not to take Abaddon. I think he he, he pretty much becomes an auto-include in pretty much every air quotation marks competitive build. But yeah, is he the most horrific thing ever? I mean, maybe. I mean, he certainly reads like it. Um, you oh, know, and I've he, seen. He, I think Bella Cool was one of the ones where you go, "Oh Jesus, right? He's good." Yeah, but then Bella and, and this is the thing though. It's like the Bella effect, right? Bella is that good. He is extraordinarily good, but he's that good to offset the fact that Chaos Demons aren't. You know. Hopefully, when mm. we get the new demon book, Bellacor's power level will be reduced slightly, so as the, you know, the new stuff will kind of come up to meet him, um, so as he doesn't need to be that good. But maybe they'll just make him better, um, which would be hilarious. Well, they do like to but, do um, that sometimes, yeah. They do like to do that on thing uh, on some things, not everything, but every now and again, uh, they like to do it. Didn't do it with Imperial Knights, for example. So you never know. Um, Imperial mm. Knights mostly stayed the same or got slightly worse, um, depending on who you talk to. Um, so that's interesting. But um, I think I think I think if I was looking at building a competitive list for Chaos Space Marines, I think I would struggle not to put Abaddon in my list. Yeah, I, I, just I don't quite know how you don't do it. Uh, yeah, I sort of don't mind him being a good character in terms of agreed. He's he's a bit more optimized for his points than he should be because you kind of he's like one of the fundamental founding kind of characters of the game. You want people to play him. You don't want him to be underwhelming to the point where no one actually runs him. At the yeah. same time, do I want every single chaos list that isn't Black Legion to also be running him? Do I want to see him in a Red Corsairs list or a Fabius Bar list? Not really, because that doesn't seem thematic. I mean, technically, yes, he could probably get, he can go in any, but some lists here probably feel more. In. What I, I'm saying is, I hope he's at a, the right points level where, where appropriate, people take him. Like, if you've got Black Legion Army, yeah, you're going to take him. Of course, you will. Um, but if you're doing a more thematic list, you're not missing out by not having him, is what I'm saying. But if you do take him, great. That's the sort of level you want him to be at. And it might be that his points will get adjusted if he's just a bit too good because you you know it might be you could go up 50 points and it still be worth it right so yeah. um oh that, that's an inevitability right they do it all the time they uh they kick it off strong and then fix it three months later um exactly and i dare say that will probably come his way at some point but we'll see it depends on how chaos space marines perform overall um so yeah, because I mean, you know, outside of Abaddon and their new tricks and stratagems and stuff, when you actually break it down to just stat lines and units, they're Space Marines. They're first-born Space Marines with a few, you know, fun units that are quite interesting. But I mean, extraordinarily amazing psychic powers, really interesting stuff on that perspective. I think they've got some really good play. Mm. I think they've got some good stuff in there. Um, and I definitely think, yeah, if you're not you know, rocking the sort of psychic advantages of your army, then you're, you're probably a bit crazy. Um, I definitely can foresee myself, you know, if I was to go down the kind of cultisty route, adding in a few librarians and psychers and things just to really kind of set it off um, as it were. But um, hmm. are there yeah. any legions that shun psychers or do they all embrace it? World eaters. They're the ones that don't do it. Right. Yeah, they don't. Oh, cause, they don't oh, of course, because they're corn, aren't they? Yeah, that's it. I knew, yeah, that, yeah, I, yeah. I knew there was one. By and it's remember. not necessarily that they shun psychers. It's just that they 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 just they eat them. They just well, it's not that they even eat them. It's just that they're too uh, they're too angry. They ain't got the time to it's learn. Only, I can't cast yeah. a spell. I'm too busy being angry. Yeah. The librarius didn't go over too well uh, after they put all those nails in their heads. Yes, because <laughs> like, yeah, it's a sit here and learn about stuff. Ah! 
<laughs> All right, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe not. Because I knew there was like obviously you've got the Black Templars is like the um, good guy equivalent where they don't have a librarian. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that's funny that you call it the good guy, uh, you know, equivalent. It's uh, yeah, the Imperium equivalent. Yes, the Imperium equivalent. Yeah, yeah. because uh, you know there ain't nothing good about what they don't like about things that ain't them. <laughs> like, well, that's true. Good is just a matter of perspective. Mm. Well, indeed. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, well, let's not get down anyway. that road. Anyway, we've got one last question. Spears of the good. Angel. And this is quite a good one to end on. Uh, so which Chaos God would you pledge your allegiance to when the ninth edition Codex reviews inevitably drive you both over the edge of sanity? Corn uh, has always been my... Uh my main squeeze when it comes to uh i'm angry when it comes to chaos angry. exactly yeah the corn has always been uh my go-to um i really really enjoy the concept of corn it's a very easy thing to get your head around he's well angry and he wants to he wants to wants to kick off and that's great i love that um but again second for me is zench those are like my two uh, favorites by far i've always been either a zench player or a, it, when i've done chaos i've done corn or i've done zench those have been my two uh variables um so yeah that's that's been my uh my goes to how about you phil um i've actually never had any real strong preference for any of them and i think yeah. that's partly because i'm not really a chaos player although i would i do like the idea of black legion and i do like red corsairs i actually would say I, if anything, I would be chaos undivided. Uh, mm. But if you made me pick, if I really had to pick one, I guess it would either be Zench or Nurgle, because I mm. like the big models. Like I like the big bird with the two heads. Uh, he's very cool and they're a bit wizardy. Yeah. That's kind of like a cool concept. And there's there's done some cool artwork with them. And then Nurgle guys are always happy, right? And uh, yes, they're big boys. Yeah, I kind of kind of like them. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah, but I, mean, I do have a uh, I do have a a, a Def Guard army. So yeah, De- I think Def Guard look like a, out of all the armies, they're one of my favourites. I would say. Um, I like I do like Def Guard. I, I, and I, they've got the little Nerglins. They've got little Nerglins. Love them. They're cute. Yeah. yeah, I do look at the Def Guard collection I've amassed at some points and go, mm, should probably do something with that. Um, a future project for another time. Exactly. Well, we we played a game recently with them. That was fun. Should do it again. It was fun. It was fun. I need to get, um, yeah, I need to get some more stuff for it, which is a terrifying statement to make because I, the last thing I need is more stuff right now. <laughs> um, it's fine. They make a perfectly comparable, uh, you know, a perfectly acceptable um, two thousand point army, so that's fine. It's not the most competitive thing you ever see in the world, but it's, it's two thousand points. Exactly, and it'll be fun when you roll it out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Cool. All right. Well, there we go, everyone. Questions were wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, really happy that we got around to actually doing this because I was worried for a bit that we wouldn't, but we did. So well done us. Uh, and well done you for asking questions. Super awesome. Um, you know, again, if you've enjoyed this segment and want to be part of one similar to it in the future, follow us on social media. That's how that works. Uh, f- closing statement, Phil. Um, I was actually going to say, and it was like hinted at in that last question. Normally we kind of, moan a little bit about having to do the codex review sometimes they're a bit soulless and they're difficult for us to get to and they're still difficult for us to get around to just in terms of the sheer length of time that we spend um recording for those episodes split across multiple days on average like three evenings or or three parts of the day uh to do but actually this one's been the funnest one that we've done in a while so i've actually really enjoyed uh this codex review episode uh, and there's only a couple more left to go, so hopefully... And one of them's guard, so I'm going to really enjoy that one. Squats, even though model, some models are hit and miss, I'm still really looking forward to that one. Most. And, and, most de- models. And, and demons are demons, so I think that one will be an interesting one as well. Um, yeah, I totally agree. So yeah, maybe we're on an upward trajectory project- with our um, codex reviews. But maybe it's also to do with a change in design philosophy. Maybe Games Workshop are getting closer towards giving us stuff that's more akin to, again, it's like, are we now looking at books that are a little bit more in line with a a 10th edition design philosophy? Who knows? Are we going to be getting that reset? Is this a book that will continue on into 10th and beyond? 
Yeah, it's interesting I mean, to speculate. I, I highly suspect that the Demon Codex will have some really complicated army-wide game yeah. mechanic. Like, if any of the next codexes are going to have it, it's going to be them. So that will, will be the one that will probably test us to the most out of um, the upcoming ones. Well, there we go. All right, well, transitional noise. And I guess that's it, everyone. The end of the show, although you know better than that, or at least we assume you do. Maybe you've never made it to the end of one of these before. Let me tell you how this works. Me and Phil now have a conversation. Not that we haven't had been... Not that we haven't been having conversations up until this point. We're just now going to have a more general one because that's how we do... The outros. Sometimes we answer questions, though we haven't done that in such a long time. Why is that, Phil? Because uh, it's been a while since we've done a Codex episode, and normally we but, do Codex. But we just did one. Well, maybe we should do some questions for it then. Well, that's not going to happen now because we're recording the outro right now. I know, unless we insert it, but just before this. So maybe timey wimey, you've already done it. Magical. All right. Well, assuming that happened, I'm sure that was great. Now let's just do the general outro. Um, I love our complete lack of uh, professionalism when it comes to this these days, mate, where like essentially we've kind of foregone the idea of trying to kind of not give off the illusion that we're terrible at this or that we don't don't just sort of make it up as we go along, you know? I, know. I think we we peeled back the curtain maybe one too many times, or as you like to That's say... True show how the sausage is made i do like to say that that is my turn of phrase uh i like shop talk and uh how the sausage is made these are my these are my catchphrases alongside whatever i said way too many times today i don't know what that is but it always changes per podcast right i get like a word it just rotates around it was funny i was watching um the tabletop tactics video the other day where they were talking about how they might do a podcast, right? So they were like talking about the fact that they managed to raise a million dollars in an afternoon or whatever they've done, which congratulations to them. Uh, I'm not bitter at all. Um, (laughs) Said through gritted teeth. I know, I know, I know. Exactly. Well done them and their ability to generate large quantities of revenue from uh, talking about and or playing Warhammer. Um, It sounds awful. Um, I definitely would not want that for myself. Um, but the point is, is that I was listening to them uh, talking about it and they talked about the uh, the notion of doing a podcast. And what made me laugh was the bit where one of them said, I forget their names, but one of the ones that, you know, yells and goes, Mrah! as they do, uh, they went, yeah, but someone, we'd have to come up with ideas. We'd have to write it. I was like, guys, you, you really, you really don't understand what it is to be in this podcast game. You don't have to do nothing. You just turn up and make it up on the on the yeah, spot. Yeah, I mean, you don't r- write a podcast unless you were doing a, sort of almost like a research piece, like you you wanted to actually talk about a subject in depth. Effectively, make it a law video, but in a podcast format. I mean, yes, you have to maybe write some topics if you want something more structured, but ours is a lot more free flowing. We just sort of have a little chat earlier in the week, go, what are we talking about this week? Uh, and then that, that's it. But I mean, there has been times where we've done, we put a bit more effort in, but what happens is we pick one of those ideas, tend to forget about all the others, um, even though they're really good. And then at some point we remember to do them and do an episode about them. That's broadly how it works with us. Yeah. I mean, again, it's fairly obvious from the outside looking in, but uh, yeah, the, we're, we're, we're definitely not in the business of, uh, constructing scripts it's fair to say uh not that we probably wouldn't benefit from that but um it's just not just not how we roll um but you know i mean god if uh, the guys at uh, tabletop get into it and they uh, show us the way with uh, script writing i guess we could just bow out phil we could just be like oh well that's us done off to the off to the lumber yard with us <laughs> Is it, isn't it the, the the farm up north isn't that where Quite you possibly. What, like in EastEnders when they go to Manchester? Yes, yeah. Or, um, Is that another reference that's going to get lost on you? Yeah, I've not watched EastEnders for a while. Well, it was a well-established fact within EastEnders law that if a character moved to Manchester, they were effectively scrubbed out of EastEnders law from there on in. 
they ceased to be. For yeah, I, th- I think there was a similar thing for Neighbours, but I can't quite remember where. It was. I think it was like Perth or somewhere they would always go off to. They would always go. Perth. They would always go West Coast. I can't help but every time someone talks about Neighbours to be reminded of the storyline where Harold Bishop <laughs> turned up as a postman with amnesia. I, th- I feel like this is a recurring segment on the uh, podcast. Well, perhaps maybe I've got amnesia. Did you ever hear uh, the Harold Bishop uh, Neighbours tour story? No. So apparently uh, it was tradition on the Neighbours tour uh, that uh, there was always a plant in the Neighbours, like, you know, set tour where a guy would yell out to the actor who plays Harold Bishop, Oi, Harold, why are you so fat? And he would respond with, because every time I made love to your mum, I ate a biscuit. Oh, mucky. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, the actual version of the uh, of the account involves the F word, but for, you know, family friendliness, I chose to, you know, to, to, to PC it down. Fair enough, fair enough. But that apparently was, you know, that was that was tradition. You know, maybe like Toadfish or someone turned up and oh, yeah. said that. I remember him. Hmm. I remember Toadfish too. I don't remember any other characters other than Harold Bishop, Lou Carpenter, and Toadfish. Like the, that, that's the triumvirate, as it mm. were. There was probably one called Madge. There's a Madge in my yeah, mind, but I don't remember anything about, right. about the character. Wasn't that the one married to Harold? Could be. Could be. I don't remember. I don't remember. And there was that one who sung the thing. Like they get on the floor. Things will never change. Into something with you. Then I wake and I can see. But I think it's torn. That one. Okay, no, I don't know. Anyway. Do you not remember no. that? Was it that Natalie something or other? Oh, Natalie Brudier? Yeah. No, okay. Was that her? I, that, Do you she, not know that song? She, she's an Australian singer. I think. Yeah. yeah. And she was on Neighbours. Uh, yes. Oh, well, every person who is Australian and famous was on Neighbours. That's how it works. Is that how it works? Chris Hemsworth. What about Hugh Jackman? Yeah, probably was. Yeah. Was Hugh Jackman in Neighbours? Probably. I don't know, actually, no. Are you swearing by no. that? Is this going to be 100% you're no. going to go with that? Uh, I mean, I can't think of any I other do, famous Australians. Uh, Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie. Was she in? Yeah, uh, yeah she's in. Neighbours? Yeah. She was um, the name, isn't she? Okay. And yeah. I didn't even know she was Australian. And, and Chris Hemsworth. I think he's in it as well. Yeah. Anyway, should we go back to... What, what about famed UFC fighter Dan Hooker? I, I, I don't know. Uh, or is he a New Zealander? I, I don't know. I don't know now. It's all got very confusing. Hey, Phil, should we have not done a video about how Games Workshop is killing our channel with an algorithm that we <laughs> have no understanding of? Um. W- no. That was an interesting thing I saw on the YouTubes last week was people, or, well, one specific person and then people doing videos off the back of it complaining about how the algorithm works, but then seemingly not understanding how the algorithm worked. It's quite funny. Uh, yes, because I, I watched a couple. It was... Um... Was there a couple? I know MS Paints did one in response to it, which is kind of how I went down that rabbit hole. I like MS Paints. He's amongst my... People I like on the internet, as it were, for Warhammer 40,000 content. Yeah, he's a bit cool. I like his stuff. I enjoy him. I enjoy his videos. I like his little health and safety frog. Um, You don't see enough of him, though, to be fair. No, I think health and safety frog has actually died in in law. Oh, oh, that's a shame. Yeah, I think he got abducted by aliens or something. If I I, again, I don't the the weird puppet narratives that he has as a kind of sideline. I don't follow nearly as much as I really should. I can imagine it being confusing. Yeah. But I would, honestly, Phil, as I've said to you many times, I would like to work puppets into our show. The only problem is, is I still wouldn't record them. I just, I just, I'd have a puppet and I'd go like, you know, meow, 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 with a puppet thing. But it I would, mean, no one would get to know. see the puppet. So I feel like that's, and there's, we'd have to post images on our social media to be, when you hear this weird voice, this is X puppet or Y puppet. I mean, wouldn't that be funny, though, to create a narrative based around the idea of us having puppets, but then no one ever seeing them, thus kind of eroding the whole point? I, of I mean, puppet. we've occasionally done Cockney Orc, and I think, I think he could be a puppet. That's true. That's true. That's something that we could probably lean into. Yeah. Um, 
But no, anyway, I don't know what else has been going on drama wise in the community lately. Has there been any drama? It's been relatively chill at the moment, isn't it? Uh, Who's upset anybody? Has anyone got kicked out of Warhammer World recently? <laughs> no, not for a while. Mm, no, you okay. know, there's um, well, there's it's quieting down. It seems it's a it's a it's a quiet time in the Games Workshop community. Isn't it? it actually is, yeah. But I, it feels like there's just not a lot happening in general. Obviously, I think it's because there's only a couple of codexes left. Um, maybe people are still getting used to the new GT pack. Obviously, it's weird because it should be like peak tournament season, or maybe it's not peak tournament season because everyone's away on holiday. So maybe there aren't as many mm. tournaments this time of year than you know the cooler months because um, no one wants to go to a sweaty heat box at the height of summer so um yeah Matt. phil you know better than anyone you're not allowed to talk about them being hot otherwise people get annoyed i know i know um yeah there you go well we got the uh lgt stuff coming up at some point soon don't we that's a thing uh why well, i mean it is happening i'm not probably going to it oh me and flipping tom have to go to the doubles because we bought tickets uh. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd be tempted maybe to do the doubles uh, or possibly the narrative one if there were still tickets, but I'm not too fast. I'm kind of just enjoying building stuff at the moment, building and at some point painting, uh, but I'm just building stuff at the moment. Uh, I've been enjoying reading the Horace Heresy book, so that's been really good. Read You're actually reading the Horace Heresy well, book? Well, no, the rule book. So oh, right. I've, yes, 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 um, yes, yes, yes. I I read all the rules and then I'm going back all and the I, rules. I read all the rules. But it, I, you know, I went on a lot of holiday, so I, I took it with me. So there's a lot to read in my downtime. Um, and then I'm making my way through the law pages now, um, which is quite interesting. So, yeah. It's pretty exciting, mate. I quite like the rules. We should do a segment on the rules at some point um, where we talk about rules we like and things and why we like exactly them. that would be a grand idea well we'll do that at some point i mean it seems though from what i can see that they definitely need to fix dreadnoughts at some point soon that's the one thing that seems to be getting criticism at the moment um whether that's just an initial reaction and it will pan out and people will work out that it's either not as bad or they work out how to deal with them maybe or Maybe it is a genuine mistake uh, and um, needs to be fixed. I think the thing is with the Dreadnought is is they've given it a profile not too dissimilar from a Primark. Like, not Primark level, but pretty much, right? Like, I mean, here's the thing. They've got, um, they've got Weapon Skill Ballistic Skill 5, which is good in case anyone listening to this doesn't understand what that means. That basically means their weapon skill, ballistic skill 2+. plus. Um, They've got strength 6, I want to say, toughness 7, 6 wounds, a 2-up armor save, a 5-up invun, are immune to instant death, which is a rule where basically those 6 wounds would be snuffed out if you were hit by a weapon that was instant death. Um, So they're like as durable as a Primark, um, but they're a couple points more than a Praetor, and they've got, like, five, four, five attacks. It's like it's just basically, it's like, it, it, it doesn't feel like whoever came up with that rule understood the system that they were writing for, you know? It's like someone came along and went, oh, yeah, Dreadnoughts. Well, in 40k, they've got loads of wounds, so we'll give them one or two less in this and i'm sure that'll be yeah I, I think the issue to just explain a bit more is that so a normal vehicle every time it has a penetrating hit you can have glancing or penetrating you lose one wound most vehicles have three wounds i think some have maybe four some of the larger ones um but when you have a penetrating hit you roll on a damage table uh if your ap is one or two you get plus one or plus two to that damage uh, table dice roll. If you get seven, it explodes and is automatically destroyed. So you can one-shot any vehicle in the game with the right weapon. However, when it comes to Contemptors, or Dreadnoughts in general, uh, because they're not technically a vehicle anymore, they can't have that instant, um, can't be instantly blown up. Uh, like they used to be so that instantly makes them way more durable 
Um, plus, they, they've as I mentioned they've got like an inbound save and all sorts of stuff. Um, so yeah, they've definitely got a lot of utility to them, which is why. So, and not not to say it's drama, but we saw some photos from the Warhammer World Horus Heresy event that happened last weekend. Three thousand points you play, so you play with a lot of models, and there were a couple that were all dreadnought lists. Um, and apparently that's possible because there's a right of war, which is a sort of way that you can alter your uh, combined arms, you know, your detachment, how you how you make it. So basically, you can just take an all dreadnought list. Technically, it's thematic. Sort of doesn't ever feel thematic to me because um, there were some photos from the armies that were in the cabinets. A couple were all dreadnought lists. There were a couple that were all like, uh, you know, jet bike lists, and those were predominantly all white scars. So they all film feel thematic and correct. Uh, there were, I think there was one Iron Hands dreadnought list, which I guess for Iron Hands feels reasonably thematic, but then there were a couple that weren't Iron Hands, and then you go, <sighs> everything and everything is possible in um, uh, Horror Seriously, but it just doesn't feel quite right i guess partly because it's not playing into the stereotype of a particular legion uh but all legions were so big you could kind of do everything within them yeah i think the thing is with it is like first of all i think when you look at the quality of the painting and stuff that was on display at this horus heresy event i definitely feel less awful about that kind of army list when they look as good as that right like i think the hobby standard in heresy is just beyond uh, what the standard kind of hobby output is uh, within 40 K at least based on uh, the, the, the juxtapositions, the, 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 the side-by-side comparisons I've seen. I mean, those guys that were rocking many dreads had many beautifully painted dreads. So to an extent you can kind of be less angered by it or not angered because I wouldn't ever necessarily even get angry about it, but you could be less, you know, impacted by it because even though it might be strong, it looks really nice. So that's cool. Um, but like, yeah, I think the thing is with it is like, I just genuinely think that I just genuinely think they made a series of simple mistakes. I, 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 I think it's right. that dreadnoughts are walkers in that game. I'm oh, sorry. I think it's right. that dreadnoughts are monsters in that game. They used to be walkers and in the editions of old games workshop had to come up with so many, extra rules, extra steps to account for this anomaly of a vehicle, which is the walker. So they had to kind of account for how it, you know, navigates through terrain, how it, you know, fights in combat, what, you know, how all that stuff works. You had to have so many added little things, which were so simply resolved by just going, it's a monster. So I think, you know, ultimately we saw this in older editions of 40 K the Wraith Lord, the Riptide, other monsters like Greater Demons, these things all came along and basically were like, yeah, you know, we're 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 big things and we're monsters and they worked fine. Um, so it made sense. But like when you looked back at like even seventh edition rules and you looked at like the Wraith Lords of old for Elder, you know, they were extraordinarily durable things with Toughness 8 which is an incredibly difficult toughness to deal with in the confines of, um, of, of, of older editions of 40 K. Um, but you know, wounds wise, I think the Wraith Lord had three wounds attacks. It had two ballistic skill was four. Um, you know, it basically, it wasn't as optimal, shall we say, as what they've done with the dreadnoughts this time. They've definitely got, too many wounds they've definitely got too many attacks and they're definitely too you know efficient with those attacks it's like it's just a perfect storm they, they've i i genuinely feel like they need to they need to revisit that profile but i suspect they won't um but we'll see i mean it really depends how much of a problem it is within heresy because legitimately as i've said many times those heresy rules are fantastic when i read that rule book I genuinely really like it. I think it's a great system with a lot of flexibility and a lot of fun, but I think it's just let down a little bit by the Legion books and some of the disparities between Legion kind of abilities, but also just that particular data sheet. It's, it's, it's just really strong, but I suppose if I can say one last thing, which is 
I suppose everyone has access to it though, right? It's not like we all don't know that strong and we're all not playing the same army technically. So it's Yes, like... yeah, yeah. There was um it was quite a good video I listened today. It was um Horus he- not Horus Heresy, Horus Hersey. I think he's a YouTuber and he did a a, a video yeah. all about um our contenders broken and how to sort of play against them. Um and one of them was you can take contemptors as well, um, which is the obvious choice. Uh, but also it's like mostly it's a narrative game. If you are going to run a uh, right of war, the the March of the Ancients, so you're taking all contemptors, run it past your mate or opponent first. So they have, they are forewarned and can tailor their list. So you're both going to have an enjoyable game and not just... Uh, stomp your opponent and but plus, plus a bunch of others and you know potentially saying it's not as bad as people maybe think it is um so that was an interesting lesson i had um today uh the point that you made about um fixing it is interesting it's like do we want horace heresy to have loads of updates like 40k where we go oh this is a problem four months time oh here's a patch here's an faq or a balanced data slate to to do uh, to do those fixes so you end up with dozens of PDFs. I think potentially one thing that could be great about Horus Heresy is if it is predominantly correct and it's also set in stone, it's like if that rule book is good for four or five years until they do another edition or maybe even longer, that would be brilliant. Like if the stuff doesn't change, even if it's a bit broken, just to be like, yeah, that's what it is. People will get used to it. Either people will know not to take all contemptors unless they're doing a super competitive uh, game um hopefully maybe that maybe that will mostly be the answer and that leads on to a point i was just about to make about 40k so there has been an update today the um balance not balance state today the points updates for this quarter oh, yeah. have come out and uh, oh, i didn't notice uh, well i don't think you've actually missed anything because most people looked at it and gone great we've got three points um, to t- tie uh, coincide with uh, Nephilim. Is it Nephilim? No, it's no, it is Nephilim because Nackman was the previous one, right? So it's Nephilim GT pack. Mm-hmm. So you got three points, and it it just it just as before lists all the points out. So you're like, cool, what's changed? Because there's no they, they don't highlight anything in pink to say here's the ones that we have modified. They haven't actually given us a comparison of the points adjustment. So they could, next to every unit, go, okay, a space mean is 10 points per model. Uh, it's gone up or down, you know, one or two points. So you actually show how much the points have actually changed from the previous uh, edition. That would be super useful in terms of quality of life yeah. if they do it going forward. Because basically, you look at this and be like, right, I'll just have to wait for a Goonhammer article or some other uh, third party blog post uh to 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 do that hard work and do the comparisons it sounds like the majority of the stuff that they've done is they've just fixed some of the issues with the orcs so i think it was a uh, uh, custom custom jobs it was something like that that had a points cost that they've changed and they've also done an faq update uh with the orcs fixing the free booters as well uh, they've changed some of the how some of the free booter stuff works and it sounds like predominantly that's it. So it feels like they haven't actually changed many points at all. I had a quite a uh, look at some of the guard stuff. Uh, so we, recently uh, we were speaking to Joe, who was on last week's podcast. He was complaining that like a uh, twin auto cannon on a Lehman Russ, I think is like 15 points, but I think it's five points for a demolisher cannon. And he was like, why is this when the demolished cannon is by far the best uh, turret weapon on a Lehman Russ? And I was like, yeah, it's busted and they've not ever fixed it. And they still haven't because that was the first thing I went to to check. And it's really weird, right? So why? what's the point in putting out free points updates every four months or every, every quarter, right, if they're not actually going to do it across the board for every single army? Uh, I know you can argue that the, they haven't done guard because their codex is due soon, although due soon could still be four months away, right? It could be next month, might be ages away. We don't actually know. But the fact is, all addition, these points for guard have predominantly been the same. They're, they're not doing the, um, the internal balance for the codex. 
they're sort of relying more on the balanced data slate to to make big big changes to make armies more competitive but it's it just feels like a really weird choice like it feels like they just look at the tournament scene and go here's the big issue that needs changing like oh let's say necrons not they are but let's say necrons performing really well so we're adjust their points uh and we nerf them also in the balanced state slate but they're not doing any of the actual like hard work in the smaller adjustments and the internal balance within a codex to make all units more uh, balanced and a viable choice to play. So in summary, all I'm saying is great that we get three points, but what's the point in doing it if it doesn't actually change anything? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, quandary, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean... Obviously, I guess we'll wait and see what has changed, if anything has changed drastically. I noticed that um, I was mucking around with some craft world lists uh, the other day, and I noticed those points have actually quite dramatically changed. Not dramatically, but, you know, they've changed in places, which is fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, points changes is what they are, but I think you are right, Phil. It's almost certainly just being done in response to specific tournament metas and, and, and things that are being observed, which makes sense, I guess. I mean, you've got to try and uh, keep on, on, on top of it, I guess. But, like, I don't know. It's weird with me right now. I mean, I, I'll just say, like, I know I'm obviously getting quite into the Horus Heresy stuff, but I am genuinely, like, at that point, like, where the um, the 40K competitive scene is definitely on the on the lesser appealing end of things for me at the moment. And again, I, I worry that I've talked about this a lot, so I won't dwell on it too much, but it's interesting, right? Like wow. it's interesting where we're at with it and just how sort of, I don't know. Like, I just think, I just think 40 K is in a really weird place at the moment. And I, and I constantly struggle to be kind of enthusiastic about, um, things like points changes or anything like that it's like oh yeah cool whatever what, the, the game is it, the game is just yeah odd. It, it's odd because it's it, it's normally exciting when points changes come but it's almost like the more frequent we make it the, the less impact it actually has and the less interest people have in it and i think this is probably the first time where everyone and maybe it's just because there hasn't been much in the way of changes where everyone's gone ah okay was this needed this time um feels like an underwhelming release even though we should all be celebrating the fact that we're not having to pay uh for the chapter approved even though a lot of people are going to buy it anyway but not buying it for the points and it feels like each time they do updates to the game it's potentially alienating the more casual players because they're looking at this going oh where do i start what do i do how 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 does this affect my list um because it is like am i going to have to get my codex out or the last chapter approved just and literally go side by side and compare all the points to find out what's actually changed like that's the pertinent information like people want to know what's gone up what's gone down does it suddenly make my tanks or whatever unit more viable less viable um and you, you can't do that from the way they've presented the points uh at the moment which is Hopefully a learning curve that they'll take. I've seen lots of other people mention it as well. So I'm, I'm sure Games Workshop will get the message and hopefully uh, make the three points updates a bit more easier to understand. What was also slightly interesting is it feels like they're, they're almost making points the same as power level. So much war gear choices now are free to the point where that is doing the same job as power level because power level is a fixed number of points, effectively, regardless of what war gear you take. And so many units um, and so many armies have effectively free war gear choices now. Not all, and there is some lot of finessing, especially when it comes to uh, some vehicles and stuff like that, um, and so, some equipment. And that's, I think, where people get a lot of fun in terms of list building. But also a lot of it's also been taken out of the game, which is it's interesting that they've done it. Um, yeah, it is um it is an intriguing change to their sort of philosophy going forwards, I guess, to sort of make a lot of options free. Um yeah, I don't necessarily mind it. Um I think it potentially opens up a lot more kind of creative opportunities. But that being said, 
The frustrating thing a lot of the time with this, though, is the irregularity of it, or rather the um, the inconsistency, I suppose, in the fact that like we end up in these situations where they go like, oh, we've we've changed it, but then inevitably they'll change it back at some point, and then it, you know, like you, I don't know. It's always war gear decisions are always really interesting in the way that they um, in the way that they function because. There's always so much movement in that particular space, or at least there has been over a while. But yeah, I, I don't know. It's um, it's intriguing. I think you know power levels fine. I've had to become, I've started having to become relatively kind of aware of it because I am currently due to attend this crusade event with Richie. Um, and yourself, Phil, are you coming to that? No, this is annoyingly um, one I can't attend because I've got a family engagement. Um, so it, it, I think Joe's going, though, and there's a mystery uh, spare ticket, so you might end up with um, maybe one of our Lookout Sir listeners. Maybe we should maybe we should throw it out there for uh, someone who can join you and Richie. Yeah, uh, Tim's too busy, I think. He, he can't make it, sadly. You, yeah, I think Tom was as well, but... Um... Anyway, long story short, though, is like, um, yeah, so I've been mucking around with uh, power level stuff and it's all right. It's fine. It's like it works. I mean, it's just not necessarily as uh, nuanced as points. And I don't entirely understand why people use it, but it's fine. It's all right. Uh, but yeah, I think if you didn't have an app builder of any kind, uh, power level is a lot easier to, to work out because you Although, interestingly, the opposite is true. I actually had to go onto Games Workshop's list-building tool um, on the on the Warhammer community. Oh, the old website one that they had. Does, yeah, does that still yeah, work? Yeah. And it does, but then my thing is I'm trying to work out what the power levels are at the moment because I was like, on Battlescribe, the power levels are clearly wrong or they're right, but then you go on to the... I thought, well, surely the Warhammer app will let yeah, allow me to yeah, build lists be. with accurate power levels. No, it not? only points. Really? Only points. Yep. To further iterate how awful the Warhammer 40,000 app is. is. I know we love talking about puzzling. this. Doesn't even let you do an army list with power levels. Does it not give you like, the power level at, at any point? Like even no, as a total you, it, the, the only The only way you can get the power level is to go onto the data sheet. Right. Uh, mm, that is weird. So you, so no part of their list building tool has power level. The only thing that you can use for power level is the Games Workshop Warhammer Community Battle Tome listy thingy a bit. Yeah. But then I'm looking at it, going, "Are those right?" Because I, I don't know what power levels are anymore, and I, I, I can't work out where. I, to find oh, them. The, the latest power levels I believe are in an FAQ update because they do occasionally change them, but not all that often. Okay. I assume the points updates that they just put out don't include power level, but I think somewhere there is a like their annual points adjustments, which does include power level. So that would be okay. on the FAQs and downloads page. Um, oh, so I've got FAQs downloads. It's not there. There's a content validate uh, uh, validity update. No, that's the um, the balance data slate. No, no, it won't be there. Let me know what that is. There's an army roster it, aeronautica. It's probably quite far down because no, it'll it's be... not on there. So is it on? Is it on? I'll go FAQ specifically. Militorum Field Manual was a Nackman. Could be, could be that. Core book. <gasps> Power rating update. Here it ah, is. There you go. But then this, that was done in March. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't get updated yeah. that often. They do it like once a year. Okay. So that will be well, the then latest this one. This raises a question. So this will have happened. At the time, the right hang on. So there's Adeptus Mechanicus, Agents of the Imperium. Uh, now the question is: Is are the craft world things here? New craft world or old craft world? Let's have a look. Oh God, yeah, like that would. Uh, I presume the 
Yeah, but, but a, a newer publication of the book would overwrite the ones that are in there unless they update it, which I don't think they do. Yeah, I can't remember when the elder book came out, but if this came out in March, I feel like let's have a look. Let's let's. Uh... Well, the way to so elder the um, for example, the FAQ got updated uh, in April mid-April so you would assume that the codex came out sometime around then um yeah so the 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 Eldari codex came out in March the power ratings came out in March this is where I get confused because it's like it's weird and then basically Battlescribe have it down differently from how other places have it I'm trying to work out what's what I imagine Um, the list builder on the website it's probably the most out of date thing. If as, I as a guess, because so well. I assume that was built ages ago, and I I don't know if they actually update it because um, I don't know if anyone uses it. Like it feels like it's probably a bit of a legacy tool that they created prior to the app, and that the apps now replaced it, but they've kept it up there. But I mean, it, who, who knows? Maybe they have, and it's you know, Battlescribe is wrong, for example. Actually, no, yeah. So this, this, um, I can tell that this is out of date because it doesn't feature the new, um, the new Scout Jet Bike Squad. The um, I've just forgotten their names. Our Shroud Runners. That's not in right. There. Yeah. So, so you'd assume then that for so I have to use the codex, the codex for those guys as the reference yeah. point. Fine. I'm just gonna have to go and do it old school. And um, I mean, you you, books, you love a spreadsheet. I've seen you do many a list in in Excel, so maybe you need to. Well, that's because that. of Horus Heresy and the complete lack of flipping Battlescribe at the moment. Although they've just about gotten around to making Battlescribe work for Heresy now, which is nice. Yeah, I'm looking forward to them getting custody rules because uh, it sounds like um, if you run the old custodies using the new rules, they are too good. Uh, and it- well, I think. I think Tom, Tom specifically did a bit weird hybridy thing where he tried to use his dreadnoughts using using basically some weird hybrid thing where he gave like the dreadnoughts stats that were equivalent to like their contemptor counterparts. But that in itself, I suppose, is weird. But then I guess because the game is not designed around the notion that there's going to be walkers in it anymore because the dreadnoughts are now monsters. I don't know. It was one of those weird variables, but. Um, but yeah, like I, I, I think the thing is, is conceptually they've 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 approached army list construction in Heresy quite differently from how they would have been done historically, I suppose. So effectively, what I think is happening is, is if you're doing a kind of weird old rules custodies kind of hybrid or whatever, it just sort of doesn't really work as well as hopefully it will do when they finally get around to giving us a proper yeah because i I, i'd imagine the points and potentially some of the stats might change for custodies because um it sounds like they've removed a lot of ap1 and 2 weapons or they've toned them down so there's less stuff able to just outright kill marines but in doing so there's probably less stuff that can remove the armor say from custodies so it'd be interesting to see i mean i've got the um so i've got the zone mortalis rules from white dwarf which is probably the most interesting thing that white dwarf has put out for a while and i don't want to be mean about them but i'm actually not really enjoying white dwarf anymore i used to be a big fan of it but i'm finding the last few have just been a bit mediocre in terms of interesting content but i think maybe that's because it's a a real smorgasbord of covering every single system so if you don't like those particular systems then there's just a lot less content to find interesting so the zone mortalis like preview rules i think was really interesting and i've got the old necromunda underhive zone mortalis tiles like the cardboard ones so i'm quite keen to do a couple of games of horus heresy using uh, so more tireless rules and tiles and see how that plays just as a low point game because you can do like down to 500 points uh, for Zone more so i think that'd be interesting i think no, i totally agree with you mate no i'd love to get involved with that um i think that'd be super fun that's the thing i think heresy is just yeah it just seems super cool i like it a lot uh which is evident from what i've said quite consistently yeah um, uh, I mean, without wanting to, you know, 
I don't, I don't want to bash 40k, uh, but I played a, so I'm going to say something positive about 40k is what I mean by that. Uh, played a, oh, nice. That's I played good. a three player game, uh, with, uh, Richie from the podcast and, uh, Big Phil from, uh, Rapid Fireball Gaming, uh, at his place. Uh, can we say that anymore? I mean, Rapid Fireball Gaming feels like it's gone away now. I know. We've, we, we've, um, we are, oh, it's not like the thing, but we, we're like slowly absorbing them into us. And amalgamating them into into uh, the, the rapid fire losers or lookers or whatever we're going to turn into, maybe. So it's like it's like the blob. Yes, the blob. That's a, a better accurate than the thing. Um, yeah, we're yeah, we're yeah. going to consume them and um, digest them, and they're going to become part of us. Maybe, maybe who knows? Um, but yeah, they they haven't done much on their YouTube for a while. They've sort of put that on. Uh, indefinite hiatus i believe but you know go back and look at those old videos are uh, really good so yeah i played a three-player game uh, with those guys uh richie had his orcs um took like an all tank list um phil had his slanesh didn't take any of the uh keepers yeah, so he's uh doing like the slanesh uh head and eyes, like all the little ladies and the horses and stuff and the fiends so that was a fun list and i took my minor tours and it was like a thousand points each so we used the um crusade book uh, catastrophe which is the multiplayer rule book uh and basically we stripped out all the uh crusade rules and then we sort of homebrewed some of the rules so um, it's it's the same rule set, and one of the missions was the same that we played when we went up to Warhammer World, and we talked about that on the podcast where we did a massive. I think was it five player? It was five player, wasn't it? Um, game. Yes. Uh, so we, so we we basically did that, and we did the same sort of home brew ruling where you roll off at the start of every battle round to determine the player order. So sometimes people could get double turns and stuff, which is slightly more fun mechanic and a uh, interesting balancing mechanic rather than doing it once at the beginning of the game and just doing a set order. Cause if you go last and then get shot at by like two or three other players, it's not fun. So the fact that that happens, but then you effectively get a double turn potentially sort of feels like it, it balances it out. And then the other main change is, the rules say that you should do uh, combat because basically combat happens every single player turn regardless of whether their units are in combat. So two other people might be in combat. They still have to fight. Uh, the rule book says um, you do it in turn order, which again feels like it prioritizes people that go first. So we uh, flipped it around to be reverse order, which feels more in keeping with the normal core rules. So we did that and that sort of worked quite well. Um, and it's a fun game, but you literally you can get into combat turn one because the boards are too small. I think ideally you really need to play on a six by four. I think that would be the only other major change I would probably do. Um, but otherwise, yeah, jo- jolly good fun. And actually, the photos that we got were pretty good as well because I love seeing not just my models and like Richie's models like in the photo, but there's always like someone else's models in the background as well. So it just makes. Uh, yes, yeah, some really interesting like uh, thematic photos. So that was yeah, good, good fun. Forty k. I, I I enjoyed that. Well, glad to hear it, mate. Yeah, no, that sounds awesome. Sadly, I wasn't able to uh, to to make that one. Um, but um, but no, it definitely did have some uh, great looking pics and some good sounding uh, good sounding fun experiences, which is uh, which is what you want to hear uh, when it comes to forty k. I think that's the thing. I still love forty k with friends. Love it. It's it's still one of the most entertaining ways to spend an afternoon. Um, oh yeah, it's just uh, it's just the competitive stuff that's sort of te- I'm finding a bit tedious now. Which is why actually I it's a shame that the crusade event specifically is a crusade event because I'm sure it actually will be quite fun. It just means that I've got to play crusade, which, as I say, my ongoing frustration with crusade is not necessarily the concept of fun narrative games. It's all the weird, irritating extra steps that frustrates me. You know, it's like it's just all the extra bits that I'm a bit like. Oh, yeah, I, I, I sort of feel like a better mechanic, like a streamlined version of it would work really well where your characters can definitely always level up and they get all the cool bonuses and perks. And then units can only level up very rarely. Like they've got to do something really amazing uh, or like in-game narratively maybe to then deserve an accolade and maybe they do that and they only get one perk they can't then 
constantly level up like four or five times so they've got like tons of buffs on them uh because i think that it's that micromanagement of each unit that is the bit that probably gets a bit too complicated i do think that if you would play a lot it, you it would and you learn your army effectively like the custom army that you're running it'll be fine but i feel like it's very daunting especially for your early games or when you're first starting to get into crusade that those are the bits that are just like oh, what am i doing um because some of the interesting stuff and upgrades you can do just seem really cool or like the effectively the secondaries that you can select for your army to try and level up uh your units is interesting it's very thematic like you can have a a rogue trader searching around for archaeotech or you've got your um your orcs gathering up loot from destroyed vehicles to then customize their vehicles like sounds as a concept super cool it's just that i think maybe that uh the management of it is the, the tricky bit if and when the warhammer app ever does its promised crusade options maybe it'll be a lot easier to to, to deal with um but oh the warhammer 40,000 app and it's false promises i know be, I, I think so i just got my in the post i got my assassin and the enamel pin but we're not quite up oh, to yeah. uh 12 months i think i got it they've given it to me 10 10 months in so i think there's still two months to go and then we can do like a year in review for the warhammer app which i'd like to do as an hey, episode if, 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 if... If you think it's necessary. I mean, just well, be... I think it would be good to discuss Warhammer Plus. Has it delivered on its promises? No. Um, I'm sure I'm sure we can flesh that out into a, into a full episode. Did Warhammer Plus? Well, yeah, no, yeah, God, yeah, no, it hasn't, has it? Because they, yeah, because they didn't do event exclusives until, they did it again recently. But there was definitely an event we've been to where they basically told us they're not doing event exclusive stuff anymore, but then they seemingly changed their tune well, yeah, all right, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that sounds so, good. Yeah, but I mean, it's weird, isn't it? Because because there's there's two conversations there. There's Warhammer Forty Thousand, the app, which is just a massive bag of lies. Like nothing they said, like they would add to that thing, has been added. It 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 just it as a service, it gets worse every year because as more codexes come out, you gain access to less stuff unless you buy codexes. Mm. So, I mean, Warhammer 40,000 as an app is the worst app they could have made for this system. Like, it's terrible. Like, all we want as a community, and one of the things that I feel like if they did Warhammer Plus again or reevaluate Warhammer Plus or even the Warhammer 40,000 app is, is like, we pay a fee, right? We get all the rules. That's all we want, right? It's all we want. A convenient, easy way to access everything brilliant that'll be great you know um oh yeah, yeah completely and and the thing is this is why things like battlescribe and warpedia are so popular because it's like they do those things yeah as good if not better than the warhammer app and also for free uh yeah yeah and it's like games workshop could um capture more of that market by just doing something as good as them but unfortunately not even if it's paid people will pay for it and people already do pay for it like we pay for it we're by no means in the minority when we went to the last event pretty much everyone there was a warhammer plus subscriber um whether or not they use the app or not is a, is a different situation so yeah i think once uh, you know I'm, they've got two months to go let's see what uh you know stuff they deliver for warhammer plus in terms of animations and other shows uh, to come in that time before we can hammer the nail the last nail in the coffin to give it a, a, a thumbs up thumbs down for the year um i think it will be interesting i mean to put it in context how underwhelmed i am with warhammer plus as a subscription i still can't even be bothered to claim my my model like i'm just like i don't even want oh, it like, i'm so underwhelmed i don't even that's want that's because you chose the orc it's irrespective. I just don't want it. I don't want, I wouldn't even want it. It was the assassin. I wanted the assassin less than I wanted the no. orc, and I don't want either of them. No, fair enough. I'm sure someone, maybe someone else will want it, and you can have it delivered for them. 
Yeah, sure. There you go. But then I don't want to deal with that either. I don't want to go through the process of of uh, of claiming it. No, fair enough. I mean, it's it's pretty pain free. Um, is it? Yes, because once your time is up, you can then just go onto the website right, and go. On, let me try right now. Let me try and do it. Let, let's see how painless this is. Claiming a thing. What do you I search? Go to for? Games Workshop website. Why well, have to go to their yeah, website? Go to the website. They not just, will they not have sent me an email? Um, I mean, they might have. I think I, yeah, I think I got an email. Warhammer Plus. Uh, okay, they definitely haven't sent me an email. Uh, no, 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 yeah, you, they probably expect you to, because you can, if you log into the... Because I eagerly want to claim yeah, this. If you this log into the, the okay. My Warhammer account, it gives you a countdown okay, to the model to show you how long you've got left to claim it. And from there, I think you can click claim. Or you go to the Games Workshop website, you just literally type in Assassin or Oracle, or whatever model you want, or maybe even Warhammer Plus will work, and that will come up, and then you can add that to your basket. Uh, and then when you do that, you should also give me enamel pin, which is uh, the Death okay. Watch. I'm on. I'm on my Warhammer. Yep. Right. Where do I? Where's this countdown then? Um, it's either on the main page or um, one of the tabs on the left. Uh, are you gonna eat? My, my services, my details and settings, my subscriptions, Warhammer plus Anal might okay. be under that one. Payment history, redeem a gift voucher or promo code. No, update payment information. No, okay. My library, no, redeem a code. No, my services, okay. So I see nothing on there. There's nowhere I can go for this. Is not painless. Where, how did you do this? Um, yeah, go to. Did you scroll down on the main page and it's definitely not there? There's, there's no countdowns or nothing on here, no. Uh, Warhammer Plus exclusive, explore the vaults. Was there under Warhammer Plus and annual? Was it there? Okay, I'll click on that again. Warhammer Plus and annual. Oh, where's that going? There you go, and annual. Uh, I get build annually. I can cancel my subscription. I can update my payment information. I'm sure it was on the homepage, but mine's not there because I've already redeemed mine. Is um, well, Maybe someone's stolen mine. Go to the Games Workshop website. Okay. Then what? Um, I think I typed in, like, just Assassin to get the Assassin model. So maybe um, if you... Because you want the Auric, right? So... I mean, I don't, but... Right, yeah, type, type in Oruk. Um, O-double-R-U-C-K. And when you do that... U-C-K or U-K? Uh, U-C-K. Uh, no, actually, sorry, I've done U-C-K, but it, uh, U-K is correct. Oh, here and it is, yeah. You get the go. enamel pin badge oh, on the left. Free. And yeah, add to cart. Okay, I'll add that to cart. And then you should get the enamel pin badge added in as well. Here we go. So I'll go to my checkout. It is in there too. God, this is easy. When someone explains to you how you're supposed to do it. Check out. Okay, I've done it. They're going to charge it. No, they don't even charge me no, postage. No, no free postage. And yeah, if you go... Oh my God. Yeah. Place order and confirm payment. Do I need to... Yeah, there we go. Cool, there you go. An orc is being delivered to my house. See, nice and easy. All right, well, I will give them that. That wasn't actually that hard when you explained how it worked. Well, there you go. It would have been handy if they sent me an email. I'm just going to say. I mean, I can't remember if I got sent an email. I Yeah, I, I remembered to check after they, because they did a new promo, which was the first time Games Workshop mm. had done like sponsored Facebook posts, where they were basically saying, if you buy up front a annual subscription rather than having to wait 12 months to get your model we give you the model uh in august so basically you've got until the end of this month end of july uh you can basically subscribe and if you subscribe you effectively get the model straight away and i was a bit like man this is a bit unfair like i've had to wait a whole well i say 12 months 10 months to get my model um but other people can come in at the last minute and um get their model basically it's it's because they want people to do the subscriptions because no one is or they want people to get the free model because they've got lots of models left over 
Or, or both, plausible. probably, which is probably the real answer. I've ended up back on um, Instagram for a moment. I'm back on uh, Tonka underscore 567's uh, page where he's got his lovely Realm of Battle boards. When are you going to finish your Realm of Battle boards, Phil? Um, when am I going to start on them is the real question. Um, Can I just have them? Uh, well, I think once they are painted, that they could live at yours, potentially. Yeah. Brilliant. I like this. So you're going to actually paint them and then just drop them off at my house? Uh, you well, I, I'm going to paint them a hundred percent. Uh, and then of course you are definitely. If they are or some were going to live at yours, you would come and pick them up, and I would come with you. Oh, is that how it works? Well, I can't put them on the train, can I? You could do. You could just uh, you know put them on the train and leave them, and then buy some. Pick, magical you'll pick them up at the other end. Yeah. Okay, that could work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Did we work out if? Uh, not get into it it's fine let's not work it out we'll, we'll do it but no yeah yeah we got a we need that we need that going on mate that's a beautiful setup well especially we especially for Horus Heresy I think um, yeah because exactly. I, I, exactly. I, I can fit two of the boards on my uh, sort of dining table at home because it's that small uh, and I've done a couple of games of 40k with it it's also I guess it would also be suitable for kill team um Definitely. Yeah, I, th- I think if I'm going to do it at home and use them there, I need to build some more um, ruins that are going to fit in the spaces for the ruins because I built my uh, ruins to the dimensions and spec that the original Kill Team box suggested you build them in, and they are a little bit too big, for, at least for the tiles that I pulled out. Uh, some of them work uh, better than others. Um, so, yeah, I need to sort of have a little play around with that and work out how I can how I can do stuff fair is fair fair is fair but yeah mate I'm excited get it done but I reckon on the topic of getting things done I'll probably do I think that was a nice fun ending to the show a nice interactive segment there where we talked people through the process of acquiring um, you know their Warhammer Plus thing Um, so there you go good bit of public service there I'll try my best Hey, no, you did very well. And as a result, I've got an orc on the way to me that I will throw away. <laughs> that's how that's going to go. Anyway, goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.